Hey there, amazing viewers. Welcome back to our YouTube channel, where we bring you your favorite man war recaps. Did you know that more than 90% of our viewers have not subscribed yet? So please, if you're enjoying our videos and want to be part of our awesome community, now is the perfect time to hit that subscribe button. Joining our subscriber family means you'll never miss out on any of our exciting content. So, take a quick second to click that big red subscribe button below. And don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay notified whenever we release a new video. Enjoy watching and stay awesome. The story took place on a one fine afternoon. There is a pretty girl who felt awkward towards someone she's talking to. Because of the protagonist who has courage to express his feelings. The protagonist tried his best to express his genuine feelings towards his crush. The pretty girl's name is Dalyon. The protagonist confessed that he developed his feelings ever since they were friends. But Dalyon got the look of trying to figure out how to reject the protagonist without hurting his feelings. The protagonist immediately knew what Dalyon was going to say. He apologized to Dalyon that he might have put her in an awkward position since he's aware that Dalyon doesn't like him. But Dalyon was too afraid to hurt the protagonist's feelings. Dalyon tried to sugarcoat her words and tried so hard to make up a reason for her conversation with Siwu, the protagonist to be over. Dalyon pointed out all the Siwu's good characteristics like being kind, fun, talented, and good-looking. Dalyon was certain that she didn't hate Siwu, but it's just that the feelings weren't mutual. Afterwards, Siwu's friend was waiting for him at the school grounds. His friend noticed him finally getting out of the building, and asked what happened to his confession to Dalyon. But the friend thought it would be best to not just ask since Siwu looked bummer and felt like dying. His friend tried to cheer him up since Siwu cried so hard. Siwu told his friend that the reason why Dayon rejected him was because she wanted to focus on her study. His friend already knew that the excuse was crap since Dayon isn't the type of student who has good grades. Siwu was so depressed and blamed himself, until a soccer ball appeared and almost hit Siwu. His friend was shocked to witness Siwu having fast reflexes despite being busy to his depression. The players apologized for almost hitting Siwu with their ball, but Siwu seemed more focused on his hatred towards his body figure. His friend agreed with him since he had known Siwu for a while, and tried multiples of diet plans and exercises. Siwu was even good at sports and could jump so high despite his being overweight. And with every meal, he meticulously calculated the calories. His friend believed that people who are on a diet could follow Siwu's healthy activity. Then, no one in the world would even get fat. His friend believed that Siwu tried so hard to lose weight, and fat, that he became concerned and thought the protagonist should pay a visit to the hospital. Unfortunately, Siwu's weight has nothing to do with his lifestyle, because the way he is was 99.9%. In pure genetics, Siwu went home and was still depressed. He really wasn't that affected by the rejection. He was more depressed about his appearance. He wondered if his appearance really something had to do with genes. But as he looked at his parents' photo, his parents has a normal body figure, and especially his father who seemed to have a buffed body. Siwu finds it unfair that he didn't get his parents' ideal body figure. Siwu was lucky to have a sweet and caring mom that naturally would compliment her good-looking son to not make him feel bad about his weight. Also, Siwu never met his father, though he heard stories regarding his father. He heard that his father was a very famous wrestler, although his father's period of activity was short, and his father had records and achievements that were truly overwhelming. And according to Siwu's mother, he just has a physique where muscles would develop just by breathing. Siwu really finds it irritating that his hard work is pretty useless. Since he had a long hard day, he decided to just eat. While he prepared his meal, he thought it's pointless to be conscious with his diet since it doesn't even work. Siwu was in a rebellion phase when he decided to eat as many as he wanted since his hard work only disappointed him. He decided to eat anything he wanted including junk food. But then he just feels like it doesn't seem right to be unhealthy. It's like his body was more comfortable with his healthy lifestyle that he had doubts opening a bag of chips. In the end, Siwu decided to eat a salad and still stuck with his healthy lifestyle even though his appearance has been stressing him out. Later that evening, Siwu still didn't lose hope and decided to go for a jog. He ran for 4 kilometers. He continuously ran until it was midnight. He felt like he didn't want to stop since his current record was faster than his previous records. He kept playing the scenario of getting rejected to pump himself up until he reached his body goal. After a while, it has already been in the middle of the night. Siwu's current distance was 15.4 kilometers. Siwu finally reached his limit. His body started to cramp for running too far without even realizing it. But Siwu found an unfamiliar place with such a foggy and chilling atmosphere. Luckily, Siwu has a map to guide his way home. Until an old man who looked like it came out from Urban Legend Story appeared in front of Siwu calling him out for his appearance. This old man looked like he had a grudge against Siwu because of his bloodline. 
The old man ascended to be near with Siwu. Siwu was startled since it was his first time witnessing a person who looked like it could only be seen in fairy tales. Siwu was deeply terrified of the old man, yet he still asked the old man if he was okay for jumping off the bridge just to take a closer look of him. The old man assures that he there's no need for Siwu to be afraid since he doesn't intend to devour him. The old man introduced himself as Grandpa Mank. He is similar to Bugaman, a legend that bad children who didn't listen to their parents are put in the nettle and taken away by Grandpa Mangti. But currently, Grandpa Mangti is taking care of the Yakai in his world's peninsula, and he also took the role as a divine judge. By the looks of Siwu, Grandpa Mangti noticed that Siwu has no knowledge about the world he's in. Grandpa Mangti slowly pulled his nettle thinking about making Siwu see for himself about the Yakai world, until he covered Siwu's body with a nettle, and abducted him like he does with bad children. But the way he covered Siwu's body with a nettle was terrifyingly tight. Siwu tried his best to resist but the nettle was just magically tight. Siwu was confused since he had no idea about the bloodlines nor the yakai. Siwu was finally dropped to an unknown place. The place looked so magical that it was filled with pink light. Siwu was still trying to recover from getting strangled by the nettle. But as he looked around the place, he found himself being at the yakai world that looked like it was in Gagurieo era. Siwu was speechless like he was dragged straight up inside a fairy tale world. But Grandpa Mangti introduced it as the world of Yakai. Grandpa Mangti advises Siwu to look further to his left and right, until he finally saw himself being surrounded by mythical creatures, or Yakai in terms of culture. Siwu couldn't explain the phenomena since he was just busy with his health early, and suddenly an old man abducted him to witness the world of Yakai. Grandpa Mangti shared a brief history about the Yakai who is once feared by humans, that the human race regarded the Yakais as gods, and worshipped them. But in the modern world, the Yakais are nothing but superstitions and exist only as imaginations. And also, the Yakais celebrate the Great Festival once every 666 years to select the King of Yakai. Grandpa Mangti also included an information that Yakai clans exist in the entire world, including the Korean Peninsula, wherein they must select and send out young Yakai with outstanding talents as candidates. And 666 years ago, there's a man, a Yakai stood tall, and known as their king. But then time had passed and the Yakai world now seeks for an heir to throne the late gnome legend. Siwu panicked since he realized he had been chosen as the candidate of the Yakais. Grandpa Mangti once again explained that every Yakai clan must send at least one candidate, including the Yakai world and the human world. But to Siwu's surprise, he became pale when Grandpa Mangti revealed that he is the only one who inherited the goblin's bloodline. Though Siwu seemed to be at the fifth or fourth generation and his bloodline mixture was pretty light. Siwu began to shiver with the way he speaks since he really doesn't want to be a part of any yakai business, until he felt something malicious coming straight forward to his way. As he looked up, he saw a yakai who's about to attack him, but then the creature landed right in front of him with such an overwhelming entrance. Grandpa Mangti wishes to put Siwu to the test whether it is complete nonsense or not, but with how the duel looked, it was quite unfair especially the yakai was gigantic compared to Siwu's body. Grandpa Mangti doesn't wish to hold back. When brutally ordered the Yakai that if he defeated Siwu, he consented the Yakai to eat the defeated opponent. Siwu's opponent is known to be the big mouth Yakai named Geo Gugwe. Geo Gugwe was too bloodthirsty since it's been already 666 years the last time he ate a human race. Siwu was completely terrified since he's aware that he's no match for the Geo Gugwe. The Geo Gugwe didn't hesitate to counterattack and instantly punched Siwu in the gut. The Geo Gugwe went all in when he kicked Siwu right after he punched him to completely dominate the duel. The Yakais didn't acknowledge that Siwu is just a teenage boy, yet no one thought of holding back. Grandpa Mangti believed that even though Siwu inherited the blood of a goblin, they couldn't just give the throne to Siwu especially since he is a human being. Grandpa Mangti dared Siwu to prove his worth in order for him to live. But Siwu didn't ask for any of the phenomena to suddenly happen. He was trying to recover from all the injuries that Geo Gugwe gave him until his body was snatched and was forced to be thrown away. While holding Siwu's body covered with severe injuries and blood, Geo Gugwe doesn't wish to give his opponent a chance to breathe, until Siwu was instantly smashed on the ground. Despite his human body being beat up, it was surprising that he was still alive. Even Geo Gugwe noticed that Siwu is quite tough, but he is on his last resort to take Siwu's life. With his sharp nails and gigantic hand, he will attempt to smash Siwu's body like a splatted insect. He was so excited to think he would devour human meat again after so many decades. But as soon as his hands met Siwu's body, the ground mysteriously glowed like something just transformed. But for Grandpa Mangti, he was just waiting for that moment. Geo Gugwe's hands couldn't touch the ground due to the amount of force that Siwu unexpectedly has. 
Jiyo Gugui wondered what was stopping him from smashing Siwoo. Until it was revealed that Siwoo has a superhuman ability. Grandpa Mangti was just waiting for that moment since he is fully aware that the abilities possessed by the goblins were truly limitless. Nevertheless, the ones who inherited the goblins' blood, their most representative ability and weapon were their strength. Siwoo, who was completely insecure with his body figure, suddenly became a buffed person. It was like his body finally showed the results of his hard work for the past years. Meanwhile, Jiyo Gugui didn't expect that he would just face his match. Though, goblins aren't like any yakai, since goblins could learn without being taught, due to the talents ingrained in their body instinct. Siwoo gathered all his strength to flip his opponent's body, until he looked like he was trying to summon a technique that he hadn't learned yet. All of a sudden, Siwoo did the s move, which is a traditional form of wrestling that has been practiced in Korea for centuries. Until the yakai world had a massive explosion when Siwoo managed to smash Jiyo Gugui's body on the ground. After the weird phenomena, Jiyo Gugui was defeated in one hit by none other than Siwoo. Choi Siwoo, a 17-year-old teenage boy, whose race is human, has finally awakened his real form and revealed himself to be half-goblin. Back to reality, Siwoo was currently at a convenience store. He tried to tell his experience in the yakai world last night, but then, his body figure turned back to being overweight. Siwoo kept picturing himself slamming the Jiyo Gugui on the ground. Siwoo's best friend didn't mind how weird his dream was and just kept listening to his crazy experience. Though he finds it weird that Siwoo was getting beat up in his dream since most people do not have that kind of violent dream. And more strange thing was that Siwoo never learned wrestling in his life, yet he pulled it off in an instant. Siwoo felt so vivid about his dream, like he already knew what he was doing from the start. Siwoo felt like if he is already a pro at wrestling, like if he attempted to wrestle someone currently, he'd be able to pull it the same move he did to Jiyo Gugui. But then his best friend only laughed at him because of his dream full of mythical creatures. But then Siwoo realized that his weird dream might just be the effects from being so stressed out. He thought maybe he was just so obsessed with losing weight that he also dreamed of being muscular. Until Siwoo snapped back to the real reality. He was shocked to see himself back at the yakai world. Siwoo was deeply confused when he realized that everything that had occurred last night was real. Grandpa Mangti told Siwoo that he fell asleep while standing up. Siwoo realized that his dream being at a convenience store with his best friend was just a dream. He then looked on his side as he remembered dueling with a yakai, and saw Jiyo Gugui being totally defeated and knocked out. He was startled that a mere human like him could win against a gigantic creature. He had a lot of questions in his mind about his real nature, but importantly, he was more concerned about his home. While Siwoo was having identity crisis, Grandpa Mangti was talking to the yakai girl beside him. The yakai girl was a bit disappointed in Siwoo since she is expecting a more extravagant situation for a half-human. The yakai girl has on a arrogant behavior when she immediately insulted Siwoo by defining him stupid and pathetic. She even had a nerve to doubt Siwoo's existence for having a goblin bloodline. But Grandpa Mangti disagreed since Siwoo really pulled an impressive fighting performance. But the yakai girl was actually expecting Siwoo to use impressive magic instead of strength. It seems like the yakai girl didn't acknowledge the fact that Siwoo just found out about his existence with no knowledge about the yakai world or whatsoever. Grandpa Mangti excused the yakai girl's rude behavior. Since Siwoo's evaluation was over, he was hoping to head back home. Grandpa Mangti was done with Siwoo's judgment when he was asleep, and he was certain that Siwoo proved himself admirably. While Grandpa Mangti consulted Siwoo, he recalled his emotions when he witnessed the potential of a half-human being. Siwoo who took down Jiyo Gugui in one shot, has been hiding his real strength all this time. Based on Grandpa Mangti's judgment, Siwoo seemed to have the goblin's blood in him. It's been a while since Grandpa Mangti witnessed a goblin did a S-Sirem move. He couldn't take his eyes off Siwoo like he was just reminiscing about someone he once knew. Afterwards, Grandpa Mangti announced a promising judgment, including all the witnesses who had gathered to watch the duel and especially for Siwoo. Grandpa Mangti declared that Siwoo is now officially a yakai and not a human. He ordered all yakais to spread the news about what happened throughout Busan. Grandpa Mangti was really looking forward for the festival especially now that he had come across a goblin. Since Siwoo is now a monster, the yakai law registered his name as an official yakai, and no one will be able to capture or harm Siwoo unless they have a valid reason to do so. But Siwoo didn't care and just wanted to go home. The yakai girl was frustrated that Siwoo just wanted to go home. The yakai girl informed Siwoo that unless he gained recognition for his ability to completely conceal his identity among humans, a monster who hasn't reached 500 years of age won't be able to venture into the human realm. Siwoo was deeply confused because of his innocence. But then his reaction left Grandpa Mangti no choice. But to kill him since Siwoo kept resisting to return to his real world. 
Siwu immediately avoided Grandpa Mangti. But then he surprised himself to witness his fast reflexes. But not only could he respond quickly to a threat, he was able to ascend higher than he expected. Siwu hoped that the two yakai he faces won't react violently again just because he wanted to go back to his real world. As for Grandpa Mangti, he hoped Siwu got the gist of the situation. Though Siwu is in denial, he is now considered to be a monster even moments prior he felt like his body trembled. Grandpa Mangti explained that among the monster species, the goblin species' power is undoubtedly considered to be the best. Even if Siwu is in a state that is akin to a newly awakened, Siwu's strength will easily exceed than an ordinary human dozens of times over. Because for an ordinary human body, it would naturally be ruined if it was held the wrong way. Siwu understood Grandpa Mangti's lecture about his real nature, but Siwu was just concerned that he must wait for 500 years. Fortunately, Grandpa Mangti assured that Siwu would only need half a year. Because in the Yakai world, the only reason why there is a 500-year restriction is because the previous crown king wrote the law, but since they have finally reached the certain point, the next crown king could rewrite the law. Grandpa Mangti shared a story occurred 666 years ago. Back then, all monsters were free to enter and exit the human realm. Because of how powerful the Yakais were, all humans could do was to run away. Humans would tremble and fear the Yakais especially whenever it appeared at night. But then, not all Yakais are bad. Sometimes, there are Yakais who would protect the humans from their own kind. And those protecting Yakais includes Geogugwe, a mythical legend who's known to protect humans from bad Yakais. Some humans back then relied on the human-friendly species that lived among them. In conclusion, the humans would either fear or worship the Yakais. That was humanity's attitude towards the Yakais 666 years ago. But after the festival 666 years ago, there was a newly crowned king. On the day he ascended to the throne, the king wrote down a new law using the blood of the monsters that he had killed. And because of his restriction, the Yakais were prohibited from harming humans and even revealing ourselves nor approaching humanity. Ever since then, humans no longer feared the Yakais. Rather, people are oblivious to Yakai's existence by thinking all Yakais are just fictional creatures from folk tales. Grandpa Mangti hinted Siwu that he at least must be the new crown king to rewrite the law of the Yakai world. And on the night of the festival, once the sun sets in the human realm, it will be the moment that all monsters have been longing for to come and visit the human world. And on that monster night, all creatures of the monster realm will rush into the human realm and awaken the forgotten fears and reverence within humanity. Because of Grandpa Mangti's statement, Siwu realized that he must at least help the Yakais to prevent from committing chaos on the human realm. Grandpa Mangti lets Siwu to do what he pleases in the Yakai world, but he still advised him to learn how to harness his powers. Siwu then wondered how he could harness his own power. Grandpa Mangti didn't tell Siwu directly, but he hinted that once Siwu harnessed his power, he would be one of the strongest Yakai existed. For a brief moment, Grandpa Mangti noticed Siwu had made a determined expression. He wondered what was going on in Siwu's head. Siwu straightforwardly answered Grandpa Mangti that he wanted to prevent the monsters from touching the humanity. For a 17-year-old boy, Grandpa Mangti believed it is impossible to make precise predictions. However, Siwu is certain that the world will become more dangerous for all humanity. At the very least, Siwu must step up in order to protect those who are dear to him. Grandpa Mangti could tell that harnessing a power like Siwu wouldn't be that complicated since the goblin blood coursing in his body is extremely powerful. Though it is not comparable to a pure blood goblin. Though, Grandpa Mangti is certain that once Siwu mastered his incredible power, he'd be invincible to other yakais. But as much as possible, Grandpa Mangti wanted Siwu to win in the festival to be the king of the monsters. With that, Siwu has the power to rewrite the law. But then the yakai girl couldn't stop spouting some insulting words by telling Siwu that he has no chance in winning the festival. Since the yakai girl was being a bit of an attention seeker, Grandpa Mangti decided to introduce her. The Yakai girl's name was Siala. She is a child who's going to participate in the festival on behalf of her own people, but Siala seemed to be competitive around Siwu. Siala remembered that Grandpa Mangti made a qualification test in order for the Yakais to enter the human realm. She swore that if the test was a lie, she'd go to wrath. Grandpa Mangti just ignored Siala's rudeness and explained to Siwu that Siala just wanted to enter the human realm. Grandpa Mangti kept putting off dealing with Siala since he already has a lot on his plate but Siwu was too persistent. And since the monsters will soon enter the human realm in six months, Siwu thought it would be better to test Siwu on that day. Until Siwu became defensive by making a reason that she doesn't even need to take the test since there are monsters weaker than her that became a dormant for 500 years. Grandpa Mangti is fully aware of Siwu's potential, 
And that's his reason why it was difficult to judge Sialha's qualification since she is the type of person who has no patience and self-control. Sialha took all the criticisms and hoped it wasn't just an excuse to avoid making a deal with her. But then there's actually a reason why Sialha was summoned by Grandpa Mangti on that night. Grandpa Mangti believed it was a perfect timing to see how Sialha would blend in with the humans. And Sialha's test will include Siwu, who's a human being. Grandpa Mangti believed that his way is better to judge her qualifications. After Grandpa Mangti revealed his plan, Sialha wasn't pleased. Grandpa Mangti didn't have any second thought and would only give Sialha a period duration until the end of the month to teach Siwa the basics of being a monster, including the transformation magic. And if Grandpa Mangti saw a positive progress after a month, he will judge Sialha and Siwu if they are qualified into the human realm. Even though the test was fair and completely humane, Sialha still had a negative reaction. Sialha thought it would be unfair to teach a human all the monster basics within a month. But in Grandpa Mangti's defense, it would have been better if Sialha got a chance of waiting for a month. But since she's too much of a spoiled brat, she has no choice but to wait for six months instead. Grandpa Mangti left the two of them with two clear choices, whether Sialha should teach Siwu or just wait for six months. Grandpa Mangti believed that their right choices could lead them to a better opportunity. Until Grandpa Mangti leaves while being covered by a nettle and ascended up to the skies, the two of them were left to decide an easy path. Until Sialha decided to swallow her pride by starting to ask Siwu a question. She then asked about the monster force, which Siwu had zero knowledge of. But then Sialha easily gave up on Siwu thinking she's definitely not going to pass the test. Until something terrifying had caught Siwu's eyes. When he saw Geogugui who finally got his senses back after being defeated. It seemed that Geogugui still had a grudge against Siwu. Siwu panicked since Grandpa Mangti is nowhere to be seen to stop Geogugui. But the Geogugui's presence doesn't scare Siala. She then insulted Geogugui that because of a creature like him, other monsters were insulted by humans. Because of her offensive statement, she only provoked the Geogugui to attack her. The Geogugui was so mad, but Sialha was still calm. But the Yakai world was really different. Because unlike the human race, where there is no superiority between races. For monsters, there is a significant difference in terms of species and lineage. The difference among monsters is determined by the disparity between their average potential and specific skills and abilities that each possesses, which creates their distinct class within the monster realm. But since that pure blood goblins have disappeared, opinions differ on which bloodline deserves to be referred to as the highest class in the Yakai Korean Peninsula. But if they put aside their pride, many monsters would reluctantly give the same answer. And their answer would be monsters like Seol, known as the Wicked Beasts. Siala's race, which is infamous for foxes that hide their nine tails, are said to be the closest to the pinnacle of the monsters on the Yakai Korean Peninsula. Siwu was left alone with Siol, and Siol attacked and chained the Yakai using his magic powers that Siwu does not know or have learned about magic. Siwu stood in front of Siol and was frozen in surprise at what Siol did to the Yakai. Siol showed him the reality of what he has to accept and adapt sooner or later as he has a genes of a goblin. As Sialwa attacks the Yakai as Siwu looks at him he then tells him what magic was. Sialwa uses the Yakai to show his magic powers to Siwu and to tell Siwu what magic was. She told Siwu that magic is the ability to consume and use energy forces. Sialwa explained to Siwu that there are two types of magic that is divided into unique magic and acquired magic which Sialwa thinks that the first unique magic was already known to Siwu. The example of unique magic is Goblin S. Sire a rare specific ability that the goblin's bloodline remembers. Sialwa told Siwu that using the ability will not require him to learn anything special and will be as easy as breathing when Siwu gets comfortable using the ability. In using the acquire magic, any yakai or monster can use it as long as they learn the magic. Learning and training are essential for using the acquire magic and the quality of skill of the monster learning it as Sialwa had said. The yakai that was bind on chain because of Sialwa has neglected its training because he was complacent about his natural size and strength, and now was humiliated by a simple binding that Sialwa has done to him. The Yakai trembles and tries to escape but couldn't because of Sialwa's magic power. Sialwa told Siwu that the Yakai was the kind of monster that was grossly inferior to her. Sialwa was explaining things to Siwu and affirmed to him what she wanted to do in order to clear things up in advance as she was about to teach Siwu to use magic. She told Siwu that she does not like annoying processes when he teaches him and if the results were bad after a series of training. She threatened Siwu that he would feel his wrath and just tell her early if he is not ready and give up as soon as possible. Siwu looked at her worriedly as he heard the conditions. Sialwa added that she thinks it will be hard for Siwu to adapt for someone who was a human a few minutes earlier 
and suddenly turned his life upside down by being a half-goblin that he did not expect know about his true identity. Sialwa threatens Siwa that he might even die by Sialwa's hands if he disappoints her throughout the training process. But Siwa was determined to learn and train as he told Sialwa that if she teaches him he will do his best or die trying. Sialwa was confused why Siwa was still determined to learn after what she said. Siwu affirmed to Sialwa that he really needs to learn no matter what her condition and was not in the place to worry what will happen to him in the future. As she listens to Siwu's determination, Sialwa smirks and is still sure that Siwu is likely to fail in the process and thinks that it will be better for him not to try at all. Sialwa told and asked Siwu if they should have a meal first and Siwu was curious why Sialwa was asking him for a meal. Sialwa told Siwu that having a meal is helpful as what she said earlier that it takes consuming forces to perform magic. She showed Siwu her magic and told him that force is the power of all the inhabitants of their monster world and Siwu would not have a lot right now. Sialwa told him that Siwu could accumulate magic forces naturally just by breathing in the air of the monster world and eating food and water from their world. But Siwu had just arrived in the monster world. For Siwu, nothing could accumulate with only his normal diet of the human world and the power he had since birth is what he should have. She smirks and laughs at Siwu as he asks him if he's hungry and that he must have starved after all the work he had done early when he first entered the monster world. Siwu kindly denied Sialwa told her that he was not hungry at the moment. Suddenly, an unusual feeling was felt by Siwu. Siwu instantly trembled and struggled as his veins were popping out of his body. He was shocked by what was happening to him and looked at his hands confusedly and did not know what was happening. Sialwa looks at how Siwu struggles as she had already told her earlier that he had very little force left on him because of the yakai that he fought earlier. Sialwa told Siwu that he had little force left on him because of what he did earlier as he saved little power from the human world and suddenly used it on the monster world. Siwu must have been exhausted just coming in from the monster world, and that made a typical depletion of the force. She walks to him as he struggles and holds him in his back saying that there is a solution to Siwu's struggle. Sialwa whispers in his ear as she was saying to Siwu if he can see the state of the Yakai monster. The Yakai has been struggling to break free ever since he was bound by Sialwa's magic. Sialwa told Siwu that there are rules among monsters. She said that if a judge had declared the winner of the formal duel, the life of the loser's life is in the hands of the winner. Siwu trembles and could not believe Sialwa as she tells him that the most effective and simple way to consume force is to eat the monster and consume his force. With the monster's size, it will be a good meal for Siwu and his hunger will go right away after he consumes the monster's force. Siwu moved by himself towards the monster like he was being controlled and not in control of his mind. Siwu moves with his monster instinct. The monster trembled as Siwu was walking towards him. For the first time in Siwu's life, he felt a hunger that a normal being would not understand. A hunger to eat the monster to consume its force is what Siwu was feeling right now. Sialwa looked at Siwu walking towards the monster as he fueled Siwu's desire as she whispered in his ears telling him that the only way to solve his problem and stop the struggle was to eat the monster and consume its force. The only thing Siwu was thinking at the moment is to feed his hunger. The monster trembled as he thought that Siwu would eat him. But Sialwa seems not to think that the goblin's true nature was greedy. Sialwa looked at Siwu surprisingly as the goblin's greedy nature will try to capture a prey that is much more nutritious and delicious like Siwu thought of Sialwa. Siwu attempts to attack Sialwa as he finds her more nutritious than the monster and will gain a lot of force. Sialwa was surprised because he did not expect Siwu to attack and tried to eat him. She uses his magic powers on him like what he did to the monster and chained him up. A great amount of power was released by Sialwa. She told Siwu that no matter how hungry he is, he should not be arrogant as he thinks that he can eat Sialwa. Sialwa mocks Siwu saying that a half-goblin like him really thinks that he can eat a nine-tailed fox. Siwu looked at Sialwa as she chained him but his mind was only thinking that Sialwa was his prey. Sialwa thought that Siwu was underestimating her by his physical appearance. Before even Sialwa could finish her sentence to try to teach Siwu a lesson, he had already preyed on her. Siwu broke off the chain that was binding him with his bare hands and Sialwa could not believe that Siwu did that. Sialwa was surprised that even if one chain has broken, she was surprised that he can break it just with his arm strength. Siwu immediately attacks Sialwa as soon as he breaked free from the chain but Sialwa was able to dodge it before it even hits her. Siwu was still not in a normal state and continued to look Sialwa as his prey. Sialwa thought that even if Siwu was a half-goblin and half-human, a goblin is a goblin. She pulls out one of her nails and tells Siwu that she has acknowledged him. Siwu was persistent and continued to aggressively attack Sialwa. Sialwa drew a magic circle using his blood and summoned the blessed great king demon's one fist. A large red fist appeared and tried to attack Siwu. Siwu was immediately alarmed as the red fist of the demon came to him. 
Siahua ordered the demon to attack Siahua as it faces Siwu. She summoned the palm and a great intense magic was released into the palm of the Great King. The intense magic hits Siwu as he tries to defend himself. Even the big monster that Siwu fought earlier was caught by the intense magic Siahua has released. The intense magic that Siahua has released to the demon's palm pushed Siwu back and the monster disappeared from her sight. Siahua was mocking him as he thinks that Siwu did not make it alive. She thinks that even if he was dead, he would be already asking for death when he first attacked her. Before Siahua could even finish her thought, she saw Siwu standing. She was surprised that Siwu can even stand after the attack that it took him. Siwu had changed appearance and a thorn grew in his forehead. Even though Siwu has just awakened, only a few goblins could be chosen to be enlightened for their own magic. As Siwu showed his ability to become a symbol of the goblin race, he held his thorn and broke it. The thorn that he broke turned into a weapon. Siawa thought that even though Siwu was just a half-goblin he had shown a lot of sides even if he just awakened. Siwu held the thorn that immediately became a weapon and was ready to attack Siawa as he preys on her and wants to eat and consume his force. Siawa was shocked after seeing the appearance of Siwu. Siawa was an outstanding monster that had attained nine tails even before reaching the age of 100. A talent that she has gained from a Korean Peninsula demon fox family in a thousand of years. She could already sense the pressure after encountering Siwu in the state he was in at the moment. Siwu's ability tells the Goblins Club and Siawa how dangerous the wicked item she was about to face for the first time in her life as she lives on the monster world. Siawa thinks that she won't lose to Siwu if she thinks of the force amount Siwu had than hers. She can feel that she won't lose but was unsure of the aura that Siwu was giving off. Siwu stepped and had already charged towards Siawa. Siawa was surprised by how fast Siwu is that he was already near her. Siwu had already changed his transformation to Goblin's Club and was about to attack Siawa a thunder strike. Siawa also charged towards him and had already come up with a plan. The two had made an explosion after they clashed with each other. Siawa was unharmed and thought of a feeling she had felt. The Club of Goblins was felt by Siawa, her summoned great king who had captured Siwu's weapon. Siwu was still holding his weapon even if it was held by Siawa's magic. Siawa was already in position and smiled as she wanted to show Siwu what she had as well. The fist gripped tight to Siwu's weapon as it was not releasing it. The fist pulled Siwu over as he was still holding the weapon. The fist shaked and pulled Siwu over and over again and Siwu still hadn't released his hands to let go of the weapon. Siawa had smashed Siwu's body on the ground and created a large bang. Siawa thinks that Siwu was already finished after the last blow she had done. The fist threw Siwu on the ground and was still holding the goblin's club. Siawa thought that the endurance of Siwu was sickening because he had get his act together after having to smash him down about six or five times. Suddenly, the goblin's club moved and was likely to pull the fist of what Siawa summoned. A force was trying to pull Siawa's demon and was likely to be Siwu. Siawa was shocked by what he saw and what was happening. A force was still trying to pull the demon's fist. Siwu had stood up after getting smashed down a few times by the demon and was already trying to pull the goblin's club weapon. Siawa could not believe that even if she just summoned one arm, Siwu could not possibly fight against the prostrating demon emperor. Siwu kept trying to pull the goblin's club from the demon's grip. He gripped his tight as he was pulling and was challenging the demon to let go of the weapon. Finally, the demon's grip on the goblin's club came loose and Siwu was able to retrieve the goblin's club to Siawa. The goblin's club was a tool that freely changes forms according to its user's will and purpose. The goblin's club has changed its form as Siwu was already attempting to attack Siawa. In the past, where goblins and monsters were alive and well, monsters would call the goblin's club a weapon that can become anything that you desire. Siwu used the goblin club to attack Siawa. Siawa notices that Siwu and the shape and attack method have both changed to make it hard for her to respond. The cost effectiveness and practical ability of Siwu's magic was at a ridiculous level. Siawa had summoned two fists from the great demon emperor. Siwu was still unconscious and ready to attack Siawa. Siawa thinks that rather than giving Siwu an ample amount of firepower, she thought of the deception of the great prostrating demon emperor. A chaotic hand slap was done by Siawa and many fists were about to attack Siwu. Siwu quickly gripped tight on the goblin's club and was ready to defend himself. He attacked all the fists that Siawa released with her magic. Siawa thought that Siwu was hard to deal with and that after all the attacks she made, he was still enduring. She thought that demons that reach a hundred or two hundred years old will be no match to him. She has thought and contemplated why goblins were so good for a half-goblin like Siwu who had just awakened. Siawa observes Siwu and thinks that he might be finished and this is the end of their match. No matter how strong Siwu is and how effective his attacks were, Siawa noticed that Siwu's magic is finally reaching its limit. Siawa thought that if the fight goes on, he will keep going until. 
His body breaks apart. She thought that she would have to do something to stop the fight. Siwoo keeps attacking her with the goblin's club weapon like he was not tired from all the attacks. Siyalhu was about to summon three tails but suddenly changed to five. She summoned five tails and told Siwoo that she has every reason to be proud. Siwoo could not be stopped and was in range so he kept attacking Siyalhu. Siyalhu told Siwoo that even if it's his first time, the opponent who emits that much is an actual fight. She has released the deception of the great prostractating demon emperor that shows half of its body. Siwoo had already attempted to attack the demon aggressively. The great prostactating demon emperor was ready to strike Siwoo and defend his attack. The demon released five connections and six cut first strikes as it attacked the charging Siwoo. The attack made a great explosion that even the unconscious Siwoo was blinded by the attack. The demon and Siyalhua stood as they saw Siwoo lays on the ground. After the attack of the demon, Siwoo helplessly lays on the ground. Siwoo was panting after he took the attack from the demon. Siyalhua told Siwoo that he will die soon. The collapse caused by the magic depletion has already begun and Siwoo was experiencing it already. Siyalhua told Siwoo that he was the one to blame if he died because he did not know his place and could not even know to the point his body was breaking apart. Siyalhua thinks that Grandpa Bugaman will scold her if Siwoo dies. Siyalhua noticed that Siwoo was acting strange. Siwoo was crying and calling out for his mom. Siyalhua looked at him like she was concerned about Siwoo. She lifts up Siwoo using her magic and tries to help him as he was whining about his mom. Siyalhua pointed her fingers and let Siwoo come to her. She held Siwoo's head as she kissed him in his lips. Siyalwa had given Siwoo something in his mouth as it glows like a force that Siwoo needs. She throws Siwoo on the ground as she finishes giving him the fox bead. Siwoo's appearance had calmed and so did he and Siyalwa told him that he gave him a fox bead. Siyalwa told Siwoo to return it from investments or he will be punished by Siyalwa if he didn't. Siwoo has awakened after the battle he had with Siyalwa. He had woken up from his deep sleep and immediately got up. Siwoo woke up and was confused about where he was. Suddenly, the door opened and someone was about to enter the room. Siyalwa walked inside the room carrying a small cup that she seems to give to Siwoo. She looked at horribly and thought of the fight that happened earlier. Siwoo looked at her awkwardly because of the stare she was giving him. Siyalwa brought Siwoo a cup of drink after he woke up. Siwoo quickly apologizes to Siyalwa after he woke up. Siwoo remembered all the things he did earlier when he fought with Siyalwa. Siwoo remembers how he goes rampage and could not believe how it is possible that despite of him being aware of what's happened, he couldn't control his body. He knelt in front of Xiao and sincerely apologizes for what he did. He knew that Xiao was only trying to help him but instead, he attacked Xiao and puts her in danger. Xiao stared at Siwu as he apologizes. Xiao did not respond to what Siwu had said and ordered him to drink. Siwu raises his head as he was confused if he heard correctly what Xiao had said. Xiao pointed on the cup of drink she brought when she came in earlier and told Siwu to drink it before it gets cold. He quickly held the drink and thanks Xiaohu as he wonders what kind of drink it was and thought that if it's like oriental medicine. Siwu takes a sip of the drink that Xiaohu gave him even if he does not know what it tastes like. As he drinks it, he trembled and was about to puke because of hot bad the taste of the drink is but Xiaohu told him that she would kill him if he spits the drink. Siwu got curious and asked Xiaohu what kind of drink she gave him and Xiaohu told him that knowing what kind of ingredient the drink is made of won't help him finish the drink. He continues to drink it even if it tasted horrible for him and Siyalwa said he won't pester Siwu as he drinks and listen to her while finishing what he's drinking. Siyalwa told Siwu that he must have something important that he forgot and Siwu immediately thinks what Siyalwa was saying. Siyalwa mentioned that the giant mouth goblin monster that she chained earlier and who Siwu fought must have escaped and run away while the two of them were fighting. The ownership of the giant mouth goblin will still be Siwu's. Siyalwa told him that the monster was probably hiding somewhere and will be curling up for a hundred of years since the monster knows the ownership will work right away if he's caught. Siyalwa told Siwu that he's drinking a tonic perfect for a half-goblin like him. Siwu asks if there are no alternative method for him to learn and not kill monsters as part of his training. Siyalwa told Siwu that there is no alternative method and tells him to look at himself and thinks if he is still a human. Siyalwa said to him that if he was not prepared to hurt someone in the process of getting stronger, then he should already back out. Siwu quickly stops what Siyalhu was saying and told her that it's not that he did not want to get stronger. The thought of killing or eating monsters still hasn't sink in and it's true that he does not want to do any of that. He thinks carefully of the situation that no matter who it is or what they are, in his point of view the monster who is going to kill are dangerous monsters who hurt people and if he does not do things correctly. In a few months after the monsters can go in the human world, the people he loves and know will face a terrible fate. Siwu was determined on training with Xiao and told her that if needs to kill, he'll kill. And if he needs to eat the monsters, he'll eat them with no hesitation. 
Siwoo told Seolhwa that he will do everything to learn and do his utmost. Siwoo tells Seolhwa that he did not ask for an alternative method not because he's not willing to eat the monsters, and was just asking in case there is not another chance for it. Seolhwa repeats to Siwoo that the most effective way to increase his monster force was to eat another monster. But, it's only possible to eat the monsters if it's a duel the both have agreed upon. Seolhwa told him that there is no rule like that. Weak monsters will be caught and eaten and probably won't survive. She added that monsters who are an easy prey won't come at him anymore because of the fight he won earlier. Even if Siwu was known to be a half-goblin, countless monsters had already saw that he was a goblin that knows a bit of S. Sire because he fought with the monster publicly in the monster world and rumors about the fight must have already spread everywhere in the monster world. Siwu was carefully listening to Seol as monsters who he'll be easily eat won't want to fight him because they know his capability. She added that the monsters who will probably come at him are monster he won't be able at his level at the moment. Seolwa stood up and told Siwu that if he lost a pheasant, he should boil and eat a chicken instead. Seolwa told Siwu to come outside because she has a present for him to show. Siwu and Seolwa both go outside the room to check what Seolwa's present she had prepared for Siwu. Seolwa showed him a monster that she chained up and asked Siwu if he liked her present. Siwu looked at the monster and Seolwa told him that it's not actually a monster because it's lost its rights as a monster. She told Siwu that the causes of monsters are all different and some monsters lose their sense of reason and lose themselves to their instincts, and told Siwu that he also became like that after he becomes rampage and lost control of his self. For other cases, where the monsters aren't as lucky as Siwu and did something, they can't undo. In the monster world, monsters who lost their right to be called as monsters have been stigmatized by others and call them as beasts instead of monsters. They deprive them of their rights as monsters. A shutterwalk was what they call the beast in the Korean peninsula. Seolhwa was on the roof and asked Siwoo why he was staring at her. As Siwoo was listening to Seolhwa the beast was standing behind Siwoo and attempts to attack him. Seolhwa repeats to Siwoo that she brought him a beast that's lost its sense of reasoning. The beast attacked Siwoo without hesitating and knowing Siwoo's capabilities. Siwoo immediately moved fast and dodged the attack. He pants as soon as he dodges the beast's attack and barely dodge. Seolwa looked at Siwoo as he dodges the attack and thought Siwoo would freeze and hesitate to move leading him to get beat up but to Seolwa's surprise Siwoo was using his body better than she expected him and thinks that she might have underestimated him. The beast stared at Siwoo and Seolwa thinks that even if Siwoo had dodged the attack, Siwoo must be running away for as long as possible. The beast who was caught by Seolho was originally from the fire dog family and made a name for himself. But, because of its greed of wanting to represent his family in the upcoming festival, the beast was found guilty of forcefully kidnapping monsters and eating them. The beast surpassed its limit and could not handle all the monster force he had eaten, so he went crazy and lost control of himself. The beast kept attacking Siwoo as it thinks Siwoo would be a good prey. Siwoo dodges the attack of the beast as he was about to get hit. He looks at the monster as it keeps charging towards him. To his surprise, the monster had already gotten closer to him. Seolhwa just stared at Siwoo and the beast and was wondering if Siwoo is unable to swing the goblin's club consciously, and a fight that she was not expecting Siwoo to win. Even thought the beast from the fire dog family has lost its sense of reasoning. He is an opponent whose physical ability is one level higher than Siwoo. Seolhwa thinks that Siwoo was not compatible with grabbing and throwing aspect of S. Sire. What Siolwa did is cruel but definitive method to awaken Siwu's instinct that only comes out when Siwu was on the brink of death. Siwu was in a position like he was about to fight the monster using close combat and his physical ability. Siolwa was surprised by what Siwu is doing and actually thinks of fighting the monster. Siwu threw a punch to the beast and were able to land an attack on the beast. Back in the human world, Siwu practices boxing as a part of his physical exercise. The personal train compliments Siwu and told him that his athleticism is better than he thought it was. He only thought that Siwu's goal was only to lose weight, and did not think Siwu would be good in boxing. As Siwu was learning, the trainer has any thoughts on learning boxing properly as he thinks he have potential. Siwu told the trainer that he'll think about it when he lost weight. The trainer was eager and told that he can naturally lose weight if he was consistent in boxing. The trainer told him to try it for just six months and his employee will take care of his diet and training and said that with Siwu's skill he could definitely aim for competitions. The trainer added that his weight will naturally shed of his body when he'll be consistent in boxing. Siwu just smirked at the personal trainer and thought that it will be nice if boxing had an effect to lose weight. Siwu swiftly dodges all the attacks from the monster. Siwu thinks that unlike others who trained in the martial arts, the boy's goal was not physical strength or fighting. Siwu wanted low lose weight, unlike other who weight is their least concern, yet Siwu thinks that it is a big concern for her. 
Despite Siwoo's consistent effort on trying to lose weight, his efforts all come to vain. Siwoo was still trying to fight at the beast as it was still attacking him. The beast did not stop attacking Siwoo. Among the sports that Siwoo had done in his elementary days, seven of it were all combat sports. Siwoo continually took the beast's attack and was still holding off. Siwoo's physical strength and his effort in natural-born athleticism as a goblin made him perfectly absorb all the skills from those seven combat sports. The beast was punched by Siwoo aggressively and strong as its teeth came off. Siaho was surprised that what Siwoo was doing to the beast does not made sense to her. The beast got beat up after Siwoo landed an attack on him. Siwoo immediately came back to his normal state and asked Siaho how he was supposed to eat the beast that he had killed. The beast lay bloody on the ground as Siwoo beats him just using his own physical strength. Siwoo could not believe that he had single-handled the beast. Siaho was still confused what Siwoo did and wonders of what he did was martial arts. Siaho hopes that what Siwoo had isn't the power he had from the start because in the end, it is a technique created by humans and isn't made to match a monster's body and strength. She thought that Siwoo hasn't been long since he gained a monster's body, but was able to fight and cleanly get a sense of things and use it in an actual fight. After Siawa had observed what Siwoo can do, Siwoo suddenly asked what more does he need to do after he fights the monster. Siwoo told her that he thinks he won because the monster is down and told Siawa that he surely does not have to eat the monster to take the monster force like what exactly she had said earlier. Siawa smirked and told Siwoo that he was correct for what he said. She added that they should talk first after he had surely won. Siwoo was confused what Siawa had said. Suddenly, Siwoo thinks that he beats the beast but it has bitten him from his back while he did not even notice. Siwoo was surprised that the beast has bitten him off. The beast dragged him as he bites Siwoo along. Siwoo's blood dripped all over the place as he took a great damage from the beast. After the beast had bitten him, Siwoo lays on the floor and was struggling to get up as the beast critically damaged and bitten him from his back. The beast had gone crazy as it bit Siwoo and tasted a human blood. Siwoo groaned in pain from the bite and could not believe how badly he has been bitten by the beast. He trembled as he saw his injury and saw his flesh was devoured by the beast. The beast continued to attack him and Siwoo was thrown off by the attack and could not even dodge it. Siawa thought that Siwoo had more than enough time left after he responds to the situation and awaken the goblin's club. Siwoo trembles as he was in pain from, he attacks. Siawa thought that the biggest reason why humans are scared of getting injured is not because of the pain. Humans fear the loss of a part of their body that may be either permanently deformed or completely lost. Siawa thinks that it is a primary fear that humans are naturally born with. Siwoo looks at the monster scarily as he thinks he has no match for the monster. The reason why Siwoo had a panic attack was caused by the bite of the beast from his flesh. Suddenly, as Siwoo was thinking about his flesh, his body turned back to its original form and his injury was healed fast. The beast attacked Siwoo and attempts to scratch his body. Siwoo stood and freeze as the beast was about to attack him. Siwoo suffered a scratch to his body, but to his surprise he did not even feel the attack. The scratch from the beast were easily healed and has gone back to normal like nothing happened. Siwoo dodges the second attack from the monster. Siawa thought that humans and monster have many differences between the two species, that it's meaningless to count. Siwoo prepared to attack as Siawa contemplates that if he were to pick the difference between humans and monsters, it will be the body's durability and recuperative ability. The beast was immediately knocked off by the punch of Siwoo. He prepares the attack and continues to attack the beast with his utmost strength. As long as a monster isn't dead or fatally wounded, injuries that Siwoo may also suffer are meaningless. The moment Siwoo accepts the thought that it's common sense, the restriction from his body from his unconscious self to protect itself it lifted and the limitations of which physical abilities can be exercised are increased greatly. The beast could not handle the punch of Siwoo that he can't even dodge it. Siwoo threw a strong punch that the beast flew away far to his location. As Siwoo landed a finishing attack to the beast, he thought that his arms were going to break as he punches the beast but were glad that his attack definitely paid off. The blows and punches from Siwoo had gotten several times stronger and much more compared to what he did earlier as the rebound he get from swinging his fist felt like he was getting hit by a car. Siwoo thinks that he was not the only one that was able to regenerate and thinks about what happened when he regenerated and thought that it will be weird if it happens to him again. Finally, Siawa told Siwoo that the last attack will mark as the end because the blows he landed earlier were stuck in well in the location, as well as the force. Siawa told him that although the beast won't die from the attack, it definitely won't be able to recover fast and get back up. Siawa asks him what he thought after he felt of not losing his sense of rationality and using magic with the sound of mind in the first time of his life. Siwoo was surprised and did not know that he used magic. Siawa told Siwoo that even if it isn't a high-level magic, 
magic can be used in various ways. Siwu realizes that his body rapidly regenerated due to the fact he had used magic although he has not controlled it yet. Even the last punch that he swung earlier was the result of the magic used in addition to Siwu's physical ability. Siwu was still thinking what he did and what happened. Siwu asks if he felt anything else beside the powerful strike he did. Siwu told him that he was not sure but he felt something similar to static electricity. Siwu affirms him that what he felt was definitely magic and because he does not have much experience, he won't be able to feel it clearly. Siwu points at the monster and told Siwu that the reason she made him fight the monster is also to gain an experience because if he fights and there's blood and he'll struggle to win, Siwu must most likely to display his magic. The beast struggled as it tries to recover and get up. Siwu told Siwu that she was surprised and though he will struggle and roll around for 10 days before he gets a rough on sense of things. Siwu compliments him and thinks that he is talented. Siwu humbly smiled after Siwu complimented him. The beast had stood up in front of them and Siwu told Siwu to finish killing the beast. Siwu asked Siwu if he had killed anyone up until now because he said he was prepared to do anything. Siwu immediately answers Siwu and said he had not killed anyone. Siwu told Siwu what to do and end the fight what's best for both himself and to the beast. She added that if he just has sloppily leave fatal wounds, then his efforts up until now would be in vain. Siwu told Siwu to attack the monster above the belly button. For the majority of humanoid monsters, above the belly button is the pressure point as well as the internal cinnabar that monsters store their magic. She told Siwu to gather his magic and pierce the beast with one swing. Siwu thought that it will be hard for Siwu because she thinks everything's hard during the first try. He stepped out and immediately came to the monster. Siwu was ready to kill the monster in one punch. Siwu gathered all his magic on his fist like what Siwu told him to do. A memory of Siwu from his school and walking side by side with his friend has appeared. He also remembered a photo he took with his mom. Siwu immediately tries to punch the beast with one fist. The beast took a great damage after Siwu landed an attack on him. Siwu told him that he grabbed something in his fist and tell him to open his fist. An internal cinnabar appeared from his hands. A cinnabar is an item that is also called the magic bead, and if Siwu swallows it, the owner's magic will become his. Siwu swallowed the magic bead like what Siwu ordered him to do. He opened his eyes after swallowing the magic bead and thought what's going to happen to him. Siwu thinks that there is going to happen to him if he swallowed the magic bead. Suddenly, a black bird appeared on the shoulder of Siwu and talked saying that originally, there should be something like sounds he'll hear if he swallows it. Siwu was surprised and immediately shrugs off the bird on his shoulder. The bird flew away from him and transformed into a woman. Siwa seems to know the woman as she asks her what he was doing there out of blue and tells her that he was sure that she does not have anything to do with Siwu. The woman sarcastically said that she was disappointed and told her that is there a reason for friends to meet. Siwu looked at her as she said that she came because she had a business from Siwu. The woman asked Siwu if he was the half-goblin from the rumors she heard. The woman introduced herself as Salmai and said she was a friend of Siwa who played with her ever since they were young. Siwu immediately acknowledges her and said that it was a pleasure to meet her. Siwa asked Salmai what is business that she came to them. Salmai said that she has been going about working part-time for Grandpa Bogaman. Siwu wonders how Salmai spoke. Salmai told Siwu that since he had caught two demons, she had come to handle the settlement instead of Grandpa Bogaman and give the reward to him for catching them. Siwa told Salmai that she's fine and give the reward to Siwu because he is the one who knocked it out and was more qualified. Salmai looked straight to Siwu and told him that he was incredibly impressive since she was basically watching him from the start. Salmai told Siwa that at this rate Siwu may even become her competitor in the festival. Siwa thinks that Siwu may be taken down the second he steps foot in it. Salmai looked at Siwu and told him that she thinks he has enough potential. As she was praising Siwu, Salmai was going to give his reward but she will give him a choice. Salmai gave him a chance to go home or take a chance to take a step forward as a strong monster and immediately ask him what reward would he want to choose. Back in the human world, the best friend of Choi Siwu has been trying to reach out for him in a couple of days. After school, when Choi Siwu's best friend were about to go home, a mysterious number has called him. Choi Siwu's best friend picked up the call even though he does not know what it is. To his surprise it was his best friend, Choi Siwu. Choi Siwu's best friend asked him if something was wrong because he hasn't been showing up to the school. And his phone is also shut off so his best friend picked up the number hoping it was Choi Siwu. Choi Siwu told his best friend, Yush, that he wanted to say something to him but unfortunately, he can't because of his situation that might make his best friend shocked. 
Choi Siwu was packing his bags as he talked to Yushin. Choi Siwu continued what he was saying and asks Yushin that he has a crazy favor that he has to ask him and tells Yushin that it's okay even if he don't do it if he thinks it's too much of a favor. Yushin was willing to hear what Choi Siwu's favor was and told Choi Siwu to quickly tell him what his favor was. Choi Siwu was still hesitant what he was about to tell Yushin and told him first that he could not ask other for favors because he only has him, his best friend, Yushin. Yushin was confused and had a mixed feelings on what Choi Siwu was telling him because he had a strange feeling on a favor that Choi Siwu will tell him. Even before Choi Siwu was to tell him he has a favor to ask, Yushin was angry and shouted at Choi Siwu over the phone and tells him what kind of nonsense is he saying and ask him where he is right now. Choi Siwu tells Yushin that he has some unavoidable circumstances and also told him that his mom is going to go crazy when she finds out that he disappeared for a month without bringing anything. Choi Siwu made an excuse and tells Yushin to tell his mom that he has gone to his mom's traditional martial arts training center in Andal, and told her to carefully phrase it and make his mom believe that he went there exactly just a month for him to really lose weight. Yushin tells Choi Siwu that his excuse may be hard to believe because what he said earlier is that the martial arts center isn't a place to accept regular people. Even though Choi Siwu knew that fact, he has no other choice but to make that excuse even though he thinks it will be an inconvenience to his best friend, Yushin. Choi Siwu has no other choice that's why he persuades Yushin to help him to have an excuse for his mom. Yushin sighs as he couldn't believe what Choi Siwu was trying to do and told him that he will do what he asks, but he tells Choi Siwu what his problem may be that he said he can't talk about the reason. Even if Choi Siwu told Yushin that he could not tell him the reason, Yushin still tells Hoi Siwu that when he thinks Yushin won't believe him that's why he can't say it. He can just tell him because he was his best friend and might even be the one to help him in his problem. Choi Siwu was hesitant to tell Yushin the truth about his disappearance and problem because someone was keeping an eye on him when he was talking to Yushin on the phone. Saul Mai's been with Choi Siwu the whole time that he was asking a favor to Yushin. When Yushin asks Choi Siwu what his problem really is, Saul Mai signed to him to be quiet and not say anything. Saul Mai tells Choi Siwu that it is okay to lie about everything, but telling humans that don't know about their existence is a violation of their rules in the Yakai world. And Saul Mai that is with him in the human world will be even be punished along with him. Choi Siwu proceeds to tell Yushin that he really can't tell him the reason because of some circumstances. Yushin did not force Choi Siwu to tell him and told Choi Siwu that if anything happens to him and he can reach out to him, make sure to do so. The conversation of Choi Siwu and Yushin has ended as they agreed to help each other out. When the phone call ended, Yushin wonders that what he thinks about the problem of Choi Siwu is not what he really thinks. Choi Siwu sighs in relief when his conversation has ended and it went well based on what they agreed on each other. Choi Siwu was feeling guilty on what he had favored Yush and also lies to him because he can't tell him what is the real reason of his disappearance. When Saul Mai asked Choi Siwu that he has a choice that he can go back to the real world, he couldn't believe first what Saul Mai was telling him and confirms if he really can go back to their world and his normal life at instance. Choi Siwu told Saul Mai that he heard that it is only possible to make him go back to the human world if someone was qualified. Saul Mai laughs at Choi Siwu and tells him that what he said was true and also told him that she does not lie about what he said and does not make up things that don't exist. Sialva was quiet when Saul Mai was informing Choi Siwu about going back to the human world. Saul Mai then tells Choi Siwu that if he really wants to go back to the human world, then she can send him back to the human world at the very moment. Saul Mai proceeds to ask Choi Siwu what choice does he wants and tells him to pick between the two choices. Choi Siwu immediately made a choice and tells Saul Mai that it's alright even if he can't go back to the human world and would only leave the Yakai world after a month that he passed the test that he was supposed to take. Saul Mai was surprised by Choi Siwu's decision and asked him why is it alright for him not to go back to the human world at the moment. Choi Siwu eagerly told Saul Mai that if he leaves the Yakai world and does not learn thing properly right now, then something a lot worse than he can imagine is a lot worse than not being able to go home will happen. With the fight that Choi Siwu experienced before Saul Mai shows up, he had been convinced more on staying and training in the Yakai world with his mentor, Xiao Hua. When a series of fights that Choi Siwu recently encountered in the Yakai world, he realizes that he must have the power to respond to such situations. Choi Siwu has decided and was eager to hone his abilities further as a goblin. When Choi Siwu was talking, Saul Mai interrupted him and tells him he was impressive and what he said just now was really cooler than what she expected for Choi Siwu to say and thinks Choi Siwu is like a protagonist. Xiao Hu was pissed on Saul Mai's actions and asks Saul Mai if he was having fun joking with Choi Siwu and tells her that to give Choi Siwu what he needs to give him. Xiao Hu tells Choi Siwu that Saul Mai was just teasing him and there's no way that will be his reward. 
Siolwa tells Choi Siwu that Salmai has a bad habit on letting other on for no reason and lying to other as she led them to make them believe what she says. Sol Mai defended herself and tells Choi Siwu that she did something called a test to know others' personality, and as well as what kind of mindset that they have when they answered the choices. As Siolwa and Sol Mai were talking, Choi Siwu wonders about Sol Mai and thinks that her way of speaking and vibe is different from other monsters. Sol Mai then asks Siolwa if she had finished reading the book that he gave him last time. When Siolwa heard about the book, she made a comment that the book is full of nonsense theory and was so childish that she wasn't able to make it past a couple of pages. Sol Mai was frustrated that Siolwa did not read the book that he personally made her to see and tells her that if he wanted to turn into a human, he has to at least memorize the MBTIS. Sol Mai changed the topic and proceeds to tell Siolwa that he will take Choi Siwu out somewhere for a little while. Choi Siwu was confused when Sol Mai says that he was thinking of taking Choi Siwu out since from the very start. Siolwa immediately agreed and tells Sol Mai that he can take Choi Siwu as she pleases. In a span of a minute, Sol Mai changed her form. Choi Siwu was surprised after he sees Sol Mai has changed into bird. Surprisingly, Sol Mai changed into a big demonic crow that Choi Siwu was not expecting. Sol Mai tells Choi Siwu that what she told him was true and that she is a monster that has the right to go back and forth to the human world. Under a condition, Sol Mai is responsible for everything that happens once every six months for a single and is able to take an unqualified monster out into the human world. Siolwa looks at the big Salmai as she tells Choi Siwu that he'll probably feel nauseous going back to the human world and tells him that she thinks he could handle that much. Siolwa looks at Salmai and Choi Siwu as they flew away to come to the human world. After Choi Siwu called Yushin, he thanked Salmai for letting him borrow her phone and told her that thanks to her, he was able to alleviate his worry to an extent. Salmai takes the phone and told Choi Siwu that she was glad it was helpful and asks him if he will be alright just calling one friend and tells him that he has time left so it will better if he calls his family too. Choi Siwu tells Sol Mai that the only family that he has now is his mother, and unfortunately his mother has left town on a business trip. Choi Siwu was in fact relieved that his mother was not home because if she was, Choi Siwu thinks her mother would have made quite a fuss. Sol Mai was asking Choi Siwu if he really would buy her a dinner as payment to what she did. Sol Mai was glad that Choi Siwu had asked her because she has really something that she wanted to try since the first time she made a trip in the human world. Choi Siwu was curious what Sol Mai wanted to eat because she said it was a bit hard for her to eat so she hasn't had a single opportunity to eat the food. Choi Siwu prepared homemade food that Sol Mai was telling him. After the food is set on the table, the two of them got ready to eat. Choi Siwu told Sol Mai that he tried to set up the table with everything that he has at home and asked Sol Mai if she will really be satisfied with only what he made her. As Sol Mai was eating, he tells Choi Siwu that she was pretty satisfied with the food he had made because she always wanted to try homemade food a long time ago since the human food that she only tried or the food she had bought herself, and as well as school food. Choi Siwu was curious when Sol Mai mentioned the school food. Surprisingly, Sol Mai attends a school Ha Jung Hai. Choi Siwu was surprised that Sol Mai's school was right next to his school. As they were eating, Choi Siwu listens to Sol Mai as she told him that she had been attending school since the beginning of the year, but did not have a friend at school that he was close enough to visit their home. Choi Siwu wonders what Sol Mai says and thinks otherwise that judging from Sol Mai's personality, she seems like the type to have many friends. The two of them had finished their meal. Sol Mai tells Choi Siwu that the food was really good and has a different vibe from the food that can be bought at a restaurant. Sol Mai brings out a scroll and tells Choi Siwu that she will give him the reward that she had mentioned earlier. The scroll that Sol Mai brings out is called the Monster Storage. Sol Mai tells Choi Siwu that the scroll is like the bag and smartphone that they use in the human world. Sol Mai tells Choi Siwu how to use the scroll and demonstrate to him what the scroll can do. Sol Mai unexpectedly does something to the scroll. Inside the scroll, Sol Mai brought out something like a box. She told Choi Siwu that this is how he can store and take out items in the scroll. He can carry item without having to think about the weight or size of them. Sol Mai gave out the box to Choi Siwu that he gets from the scroll and tells him that the scroll had other uses besides storing. Sol Mai tells Choi Siwu that if he uses his scroll a few times, he'll be able to familiarize himself with the scroll pretty easily. Choi Siwu opened the box storage and sees different things inside. Sol Mai tells Choi Siwu what is in the box and told him that the one thing in the middle is the monster storage that he will be using and the pile of coins on the left is called Goblin Face Coin. Choi Siwu held the sword as Sol Mai explains that the goblin face coins have a quite high value even in the monster world, and that the 40 nyang that he received in the box is quite a big amount so he should use it carefully. And the last thing on the box is the goblin treasure that's been passed down to generations, 
and their items that can display various abilities by creating monster force. Saul Mai wonders and asks Choi Siwu if he knows the old human folk tales that occasionally pop up. When Grandpa Bogoman gave the box to Saul Mai to deliver it to Choi Siwu, she was pretty surprised that Grandpa Bogoman has told her to pack it along with her and says to Choi Siwu that it seemed like Grandpa Bogoman has some high hope for him to give him the goblin treasure. Choi Siwu thought that the high hope that Saul Mai meant is in regards to the great festival that is to pick the king of the monsters. Saul Mai tells Choi Siwu that even if they aren't to the extent of human, the monsters also felt a sense of belonging towards the human race. Saul Mai tells Choi Siwu that if a monster from the Korean peninsula becomes the monster king, it will be something to talk about, but heard that it was regrettable during the most recent great festival. Choi Siwu was surprised that someone from the Korean peninsula has almost become the king of monsters. From what Saul Mai heard, the almost king of the monsters from Korean peninsula has been in the festival till the very end and had an incredibly close match with the current monster king in the monster world. Choi Siwu thinks that not being the monster king then is quite regrettable. Saul Mai tells Choi Siwu that the most interesting part was that the monster who was almost about to be the king is a goblin like him. The goblin was so strong that no one could rival them in the entire history of the monsters living in the Korean peninsula. As Choi Siwu held the goblin treasure, he tells Saul Mai that even after hearing stories about the festival, he still did not know that he was a monster until Grandpa Bogoman kidnapped and take him to the monster world. Choi Siwu still has a part of him that has made the situation sink and wonders what all of this that is happening to him. Choi Siwu then tells Saul Mai that he wonders every time thinking that he wishes he could wake up quickly as if everything was all just a dream. Saul Mai thinks the opposite because she thinks Choi Siwu adapted quickly and quite well to the situation for someone to say something like that. Choi Siwu was curious when Saul Mai told him that even when she met him in the first time earlier and heard his resolve. He left quite an impression to her and tells him that if he had made his resolve, it might now be bad to think to set his goal a bit higher. Saul Mai told him that humans like him are being threatened by the resetting of laws with the change of the rulers and is what they are afraid of. If what Saul Mai told Choi Si were the case, then he can become the monster king and maintain the current rules for the next 666 years. Choi Siwu then asks Saul Mai if he can ask her a question. Saul Mai happily responded and tells Choi Siwu that he can ask her whatever he wants because she feels like he made a human friend and tells him that if he was curious about something, she will try to answer to the best of his knowledge. When they were busy talking about the situation, Choi Siwu noticed that something strange has appeared in the monster storage next to Saul Mai. Saul Mai also notices what Choi Siwu was pointing at the monster storage as it flashes and displays that it has an emergency. The one displayed emergency in the monster storage is an emergency call order. It reaches out to the monsters in the area whenever there's a serious emergency situation that is happening. Saul Mai explained that an emergency call order appears and sent down in the human world is the only reason that it would happen is because some monsters broke the rules or they harmed a human in the human world. Even though the emergency order has been displayed in the scroll, Saul Mai was calm and tells Choi Siwu that something like that has not happened once in the past few decades so there is no way an emergency call order would happen. Suddenly, Saul Mai realizes something was wrong and gasped the situation. Saul Mai suddenly freaked out when she realizes that an emergency called order has been displayed to the scroll. Saul Mai left Choi Siwu in the house as it still has an emergency to handle. Choi Siwu tried to snap his fingers to call out the scroll. When Choi Siwu snapped his fingers, the scroll appeared in front of him. The goblin treasure was displayed on the scroll and Choi Siwu tries to put his hand closer to the scroll to try get the goblin treasure out of the scroll. As he gets the goblin treasure out the scroll, Choi Siwu tries to put it in his arms and wonders if he puts it in the correct place or is it like an armor and thinks that he should ask Saul Mai how to use it when she gets back. Choi Siwu looks at the time as he was wondering what time Saul Mai will be back. Saul Mai hurried to leave the house as it's a little past 6 in the evening and half a day is 6 hours and since she came at 4 in the human world, they just need to go back in the Yakai world by 10 in the evening. Saul Mai tells Choi Siwu that she will be back quickly and tells him to sit tight as he waits for her to return. Choi Siwu then tells Saul Mai that he will wait for her and agreed to what she said. When Saul Mai was about to leave, Saul Mai looked back as he tells Choi Siwu that he can speak comfortable to her because they are friends now and tells him to call her Saul Mai when she got back. It's past 10 in the evening and Choi Siwu was wondering why Saul Mai hasn't got back yet and wonders something might have happened. Choi Siwu thinks that if he knew Saul Mai wouldn't get back by 10 in the evening, then he should have gotten her number at least. As Choi Siwu wonders about Saul Mai, he saw her father's picture in the cabinet and looks at it. Choi Siwu wonders that if he has goblin blood flowing through his veins, then it's probably from his father's side. 
Grandpa Bogaman also said to him that Choi Siwu was probably about a fourth or fifth generation of the goblin's bloodline although he was just only a bit mixed. As Choi Siwu looks at his father picture, he wonders if his father was aware that he himself was born of a goblin's blood. When Choi Siwu was thinking about his father, he felt something strange from the window and thought it was Sol Mai. In the dark streets back in the human world, a human scream can be heard. A demon was strangling a human in the neck and the human struggles as the demon was attacking him. The demon is a large shadow-like demon that is most likely from the monster world. To the demon's surprise, it was attacked and has blown its body off. Sol Mai came to the demon that was attacking the human and shoots it with her magical power. He tells the demon that Sol Mai has been catching the demon again and again yet there's no end on the demon trying to attack humans again. Sol Mai tells if the demon kept attacking humans, she really not going to have any feathers left. When Sol Mai attacked the demon, it noticed that it was wriggling and tells that demons like him does not even feel pain. As Sol Mai caught the demon's attention, it lets go of the human that it was strangling earlier. As the demon were trying to attack Sol Mai, Sol Mai prepares to fight the demon. The human was trembling as they were attacked by the demon as his friend is seriously injured because of the demon that inflicted the injury to his friend. Sol Mai affirmed the human to not worry about the situation and tells him that his friend will be alright because the injury is not that deep and she put on a salve to stop his friend's bleeding. Sol Mai also told the human that the ambulance will also reach them soon. The human was scared as the demon got big and returned to their location. As Sol Mai was alarmed to the sudden appearance of the demon again, the demon has charged towards her. Sol Mai stood straight and looks at the demon as it was about to attack her. Suddenly, someone came in Sol Mai's help and told her to keep her head straight because the day that rumors had spread that she had been beaten by that kind of demon will also be the day her entire family would not be able to go around with their head held high. Sol Mai tells the person that it is okay if the family isn't with a good reputation to begin with and tells him that she knew that he will be by her side when it comes to danger. A man asks her if who she is calling Appa and Sol Mai explains to him that if he was a bit older and closer to her then that makes him an Appa which was an older brother. Sol Mai tells him that if he does not like to be called like that then she will call him by his name, Goyu. Goyu asks Sol Mai if there are other options to be called in a polite and courteous manner and Sol Mai tells him that she can also call him Oraboni, but Goyu did not care and tells her to just call him whatever he wants. Goyu tried to manipulate the human and tells him to thinks that what happened to them was an unlucky day because a car that appeared in the alleyway hit him and his friend, and the driver ran away in a hurry until the ambulance comes. Sol Mai praises Goyu with his hypnosis ability, and tells that she heard learning something separately is really hard to do. Sol Mai also told him that she also tried to learn from Siolho but instead, got scolded and eventually gave up. Goyu tells Sol Mai that what she is, is a front runner and ask her how many have she caught up until now. Sol Mai tells Goyu that including the ones that he helped her, there is a total of 24 and there wasn't even a proper monster amongst them. The demon that attacked the humans are all shutterwalks, that are all on leashes evil spurts that are being controlled by someone. Sol Mai tells Goyu that based on what she saw, shutterwalks have killed 7 humans and injured 50 people and wonders who would do such thing. Sol Mai tells Goyu that she's sure the demons are aware of how heavy the crime of killings human is and what sort of amusement are they getting from such carnage. Goyu tells Sol Mai that what she thinks was wrong. The demons have been doing the crimes not for amusement but for gain. Sol Mai was confused what Goyu meant about demons killing humans for gains. Goyu tells Sol Mai that it's reasonable that she does now know what he meant because it isn't something that is well known in their generation. Goyu tells the story to Sol Mai that since the olden days, humans have been eaten up by goblins and it wasn't just to satisfy their sadism or appetite. Consuming human blood and human flesh is an incredibly potent healthy food to them monsters that's why goblins eat humans. Sol Mai couldn't believe what she heard about the olden days and Goyu tells her that it was widely known fact a long time ago and something that just wasn't passed to their generation. He then tells Sol Mai that she can easily become strong by eating human meat and tells her that if the truth is known, the human world won't be as quiet as it is now. Goyu tells Sol Mai that he probably knows the fact since she had taken the qualification test, as there aren't many instances where young kids like them who are not even 500 years old would choose to struggle to take the complicated test. In their generation's perception of the human world, it's a boring and frustrating place where there's no real need to go in and out until the law changes. Goyu tells that at the current moment, when they are near the festival, everyone in the demon world has been searching desperately to be even the littlest bit stronger and there is monster who are aware of the secret regarding humans and are willing to take the risk. He tells Sol Mai that she should know well as she's helping Grandpa Bogaman that in the recent days, there have been many monsters that destroyed themselves by going too far to get stronger. Though you tells her that not understanding isn't a motive to kill but a mindset. 
He tells her that if it was him, he would have never created that sort of mess. As the humans were still unconscious on the hypnosis, Goyu wonders that rather than attracting the attention by using evil spirits that can't even move delicately, he would have done it himself and surely capturing them one by one before eating them. Saul Mai says that the one ordering the monster must be extremely pathetic coward and thinks would a coward who is not able to attack humans who can't resist be bold enough to move themselves. Goyu tells her that even if they are evil spirits, if they have the skill to call forth hundreds of monsters, then they may think that it's safer to do that than step forward themselves. Saul Mai orders Goyu to tell the monster to stop acting cowardly. Saul Mai was surprised that Goyu did not want to call out the monsters. Saul Mai then left the place first and told Goyu to clean up the mess that the monsters made. Choi Siwu heads to the window and looked out of it and wonders that he's sure that the window was closed just a seconds ago. When Choi Siwu was looking at the window, someone was staring at him from behind and was inside his room. The man walked quietly and closely to Choi Siwu unnoticed. The man thinks that he caught Choi Siwu off guard and thinks it was so easy to target Choi Siwu because of how defenseless he is and thought he wouldn't gone out of his way to put in much effort. The man quickly attacked Choi Siwu without hesitation. When the man was about to hit Choi Siwu, Choi Siwu dodges swiftly. Choi Siwu grabbed the man's arms and tried to take him down as he released his power. As Choi Siwu held the man in his arm, Choi Siwu released the goblin's s sirum again as he threw the man outside his house. Choi Siwu sighs and relied as he thought his heart was going to leap out of his chest. When he encountered the crazy monster in the monster world, he realizes that he does not want to go so far as to call it ability. Choi Siwu wonders what is he really doing and wonders about the goblin's characteristics as he rarely get beaten twice, but with similar tactics. The fence of the window had been broken when Choi Siwu threw the man into the ground when it was about to attack him. Choi Siwu sighed in relief when he sensed the man from behind and even threw it out the window of his house. Choi Siwu remembers the time when he was caught off guard from behind and the chill he felt when they attacked him off guard, so he was pretty relieved he adapted to the situation and made something change. Choi Siwu knew that there was a suspicious man behind him. If he didn't recognize that it was the same feeling he felt in the monster world, then he would have been killed easily. When he threw the man down in his house, he checked the damage and hopes no one was caught by his toss because he tossed the man without thinking of his surroundings or any people that might be hurt in the process. When Choi Siwu looked down to where he tossed the suspicious man, he was surprised that it was already gone. Choi Siwu was shocked when he heard the man talk and told him that there is nothing to worry about. The suspicious man that attacked him seemed like he knew what Choi Siwu was worrying about so he tells Choi Siwu that he has already put all the humans to sleep in the area where they're in. The suspicious man was a monster that had a tail and grabbed Choi Siwu by the neck. The man that attacked Choi Siwu tells him that the reason he puts the people into sleep is because when the people screamed at once, he would not be comfortable enough to handle the cleaning up. The man that attacked him showed his true form and asked Choi Siwu if he really was the rumored goblin, because he expected that Choi Siwu would strike him powerfully and though his monster force is not that strong. As the monster was talking to Choi Siwu, it grabbed his body from the window down to the ground. Choi Siwu struggles to remove the tail from his neck and worries that it may throw him hard in the ground as the monster chokes him. The man threw Choi Siwu aggressively on the ground like what Choi Siwu did to him and unexpectedly higher from what he fell. Earlier, Choi Siwu trembles as he hits the ground when he was thrown by the monster. The snake monster jokes on Choi Siwu telling him that he had no intentions of dropping Choi Siwu so far. The monster continues to mock Choi Siwu as he struggles to get up and tells him sarcastically that the ground has seemed to weaken after he fell when Choi Siwu threw him. The monster told Choi Siwu that the humans in the area will probably think that the damage was caused by a poor construction or a gas pipe explosion and thought that the situation is quite an unfortunate incident for the people living in the area because the house prices may fall. Choi Siwu still struggles to get up and the monster still continues to mock him because of how weak he thinks of Choi Siwu. All Choi Siwu could think is that the monster is the type to hurt humans and Saul Mai who still hasn't returned. The problem that Choi Siwu was facing right now was all because of the monster. The monster doesn't have the patience to fight with Choi Siwu and thinks it was a nuisance to see Choi Siwu struggle to live. As Choi Siwu gets up, the monster turns into his full form, a big snake that was about to eat Choi Siwu. When Choi Siwu stood up, he had a hunch that at the moment, he would be facing a real danger. Before the monster thought of eating Choi Siwu, he tells Choi Siwu if he should give him a chance or just let Choi Siwu get eaten by the monster. Choi Siwu could not speak to the monster and froze at the moment, so the monster told him to not look at him that way since what he will do will not ever negatively impact him. The monster boasts to Choi Siwu that he and Choi Siwu is a class of different monsters and Choi Siwu will die painfully if he struggles, and advises him to just choose to die quietly if the results are going to be the same. 
Choi Siwu was shocked and surprised as the monster showed him a picture of him with his mother and used it to threaten him. The monster tells him that if he let him be eaten, the monster would let his mother off the hook and just devour others. Without hesitation, Choi Siwu quickly charges at the monster when it hears about his mother and uses it to threaten it against him. Choi Siwu punched the monster, but to his promise it was just a bait to provoke him to attack him first. As Choi Siwu's power was about to be activated, he felt something strange about his body and could not bear to move. The monster sarcastically apologizes for the rude threat he made about Choi Siwu's mother. Choi Siwu trembles as the monster speaks to him. The monster stands in comfort as Choi Siwu has been trembling all over his body. It seemed like the monster spoke up and attacked to him when Choi Siwu punched him in the face. The monster mocks him as he knew that his provocation was successful to Choi Siwu. Choi Siwu trembles as he was poisoned by the monster when it sneaked up an attack on him. When Choi Siwu attacked and touched the monster, the monster's ability was activated and poisoned Choi Siwu when he touched him. The monster tells Choi Siwu that he has an incredible ability, but can't use it on someone stronger than him and luckily it worked on Choi Siwu when he racked up his brain. The monster also tells Choi Siwu that he heard that a bloodline like him is able to pin others down with just a stare. Choi Siwu struggled and could not move his body as he mastered any strength in his body but couldn't because he was experiencing sleep paralysis. The monster tells that the rules in the monster world are unfair because weak things have no choice but to be preyed on by those that are stronger than them. Choi Siwu still struggles to move his body as the monster tells him that if he knew how to use the thing that was on his arm, the goblin treasure, then things might have been different for him. Choi Siwu looked at the photo of him with his mom as the monster had the upper hand in the fight. The monster was about to eat the weakened Choi Siwu and tells him that he will remember him fondly so he should keep it in his mind in his next life if he will ever be reborn. Choi Siwu still thinks of a plan of how to move his body and wonders that if he can just have one move on his body then everything will turn out differently. When the monster was about to eat Choi Siwu, he already figured out how to move his body. The monster was shocked that Choi Siwu has been keeping all the magic powers in his hand and suddenly the tables have turned. Choi Siwu finally moved his other arm and released a strong magic power. As he releases the power, he sighs in relief when the monster was blown off and did not eat him. The monster surprisingly dodged the attack and thought that he could have seriously died if the attack had hit him. The monster immediately recovered and attacked Choi Siwu with its long tail. When the monster attacked Choi Siwu, it flew over to the side and made an impact on the wall. Even though the poison has circulated to Choi Siwu's body properly, he could still stand despite the attacks and made the snake monster wonder if a weak goblin is still a goblin. As the snake monster observed Choi Siwu, it felt something strange to his body. A knife was pierced through the skin of the snake monster so the snake monster wonders what was pierced onto his skin. Suddenly, a strange masked man arrived and had been saying some praises. When the praise was said out loud by the masked man, the swords that pierced through the snake's skin released enormous power and electrocuted the monster. Even though Choi Siwu was weakened, he noticed the masked man that came to the fight. The masked man appeared to the scene and were most likely known to species that it was attacking up until now. The monster mocked the masked man that he was holding a useless weapon and has been deepening its voice and mocks that it was a human specialty. The monster continues to mock the masked man and thinks about how the man got to the area. As he looked at the masked man, the monster thought that he was dangerous and was on another level than any normal being. The monster was wondering if he should leave or continue to fight and also thought that if he dragged things further, he might be in a dangerous state. The monster thought that Saul Mai is hard to deal with and Sam was Goyu because he thinks he will never defeat him even if he got back from the dead. To their surprise, the monster had a plan to damage itself and the masked man wondered what he did. When the snake monster damaged himself and poured out blood, a shutterwook on chains rose to his blood. The monster tells them that he could have saved the monster up until the festival but due to the circumstances he couldn't. The masked man looked at the monster that appeared in the snake's blood. The snake monster told the masked man that what he brought out was a deity-class monster by nature, and when it was still sane, his name was far and wide from the west and told the masked man he did not know how the monster ended up in that state. The monster tells the masked man that the monster was a pretty good match for someone who was crazy about looking good. As Choi Siwu was still weak, the monster thought of finishing his business and still wanted to eat Choi Siwu. The monster charged at the masked man and continued to fight him. The masked man tried to stab the monster but it did not work. When the monster was pierced, it released a strong enormous power. The masked man dodges it and proceeds to sneak an attack on the snake monster. The snake monster was surprised, as the masked man was about to attack him from behind even though it was hiding behind the monster that he released. As the snake monster was caught off guard, the masked man pierced through him. The masked man immediately stabbed the snake monster in its head. 
Choi Siwu was surprised that the masked man had successfully eliminated the snake monster and had actually saved him. The masked man then notices Choi Siwu and tells him that he does not look like he is the same as the snake monster and tells him that if he wanted to survive, he should answer his questions directly. Choi Siwu asked the masked man what he was doing in the area and told him that he could not believe what was happening when he heard his voice. The masked man was confused about what Choi Siwu was talking about. Choi Siwu then proceeds to ask the masked man if he can recognize his voice. The man removed his mask and called out Choi Siwu's name and surprisingly, the masked man was Yushin. Choi Siwu told him what strange look that he was giving him and tells him that what happened to him is a long story. After they had finished battling the monster, a calm and quiet atmosphere settled in the surroundings. Yushin and Choi Siwu are feeling confused because they can't understand how they managed to spot one another, especially given the presence of a monstrous creature in the vicinity. Yushin couldn't help but feel really puzzled by the fact that Choi Siwu was suddenly right in front of him. He took a few steps closer, wanting to examine the changes that had taken place while Choi Siwu was away for a little while. Moving closer, Yushin gently held Jiang Yu with a touch of worry evident in his expression. He asked about what had happened and was surprised when he looked at Jiang Yu's altered appearance. However, Yushin quickly suggested to Jiang Yu that they should put that matter aside and instead shift the conversation towards how Jiang Yu managed to handle the monstrous creature. Choi Siwu requests Yushin to hold on for a moment, expressing his need to explain the situation, but his ability to breathe suddenly becomes difficult, causing him distress. Observing Choi Siwu closely, Yushin's mind raced as he considered the possibility that Choi Siwu might be affected by a unique form of poisoning rather than an ordinary one. Yushin speculated that even with his emergency medicine, he might not have the means to effectively treat Choi Siwu's condition. Upon careful observation, Yushin detected a distinct change in Choi Siwu's physical condition. Yushin was taken aback by the realization that Choi Siwu's body was actually in the process of healing itself. They both paused for a moment, allowing Choi Siwu's body to naturally counteract the effects of the poison. While they were in the midst of their momentary pause, Yushin's attention was suddenly drawn to the fact that the monstrous creature was attempting to escape from their vicinity. Yushin's gaze fell upon the trail of the serpent like monster's blood clearly visible as it marked the creature's slow retreat in its attempt to distance itself from them. Amidst Yushin's distraction due to his reunion with Choi Siwu, the tail of the monster became visible as it made a gradual effort to distance itself. Seizing the opportunity, the monster seemed to believe that retreating was a favorable course of action. Yushin and Choi Siwu both watched as the monster managed to escape, and Yushin couldn't help but feel that the situation was becoming even more chaotic and insane. After some time, they decided to step outside to take a deep breath of fresh air. Once outside, Choi Siwu turned to Yushin and asked if he was alright. Yushin felt a bit puzzled, unsure if Choi Siwu was inquiring about his own well-being or Yushin's. He responded, saying that he believed he was indeed okay. Upon seeing Yushin's perplexed expression, Choi Siwu simply smiled. It was quite a surprise for Yushin to discover that his friend of three years was, in fact, a supernatural hybrid. Even more astonishing was the revelation that Choi Siwu belonged to the category of a goblin hybrid. Yushin felt a surge of frustration welling up within him. He couldn't believe that for three whole years, Choi Siwu's true nature as a goblin had remained completely hidden from his senses. Yushin even went so far as to criticize the Minister of National Defense for aspiring to become the Moon King over a subject they didn't suspect. As Yushin contemplated the situation, he couldn't help but imagine how his father would react if he found out that Yushin had been oblivious to Choi Siwu's goblin identity. He felt entirely clueless and anticipated that his father might even find humor in the situation. After hearing Yushin's frustrations, Choi Siwu tells Yushin about his house and how he never mentioned what kind of training center it was. Yushin decided to come clean about the training center's purpose. He confided in Choi Siwu that his family had a duty to eliminate supernatural creatures, and if he chose not to undergo training, he would likely be regarded as an outcast or even considered somewhat deranged within their family circles. Being part of that family, Choi Siwu began to reflect on the idea that Yushin might have been aware of the upcoming ancestral ceremony scheduled to take place in six months. Curious about the matter, Choi Siwu inquired if such ancestral ceremonies were a regular thing. Yushin admitted that he couldn't exactly label the ancestral ceremony as common, indicating that it was actually quite rare. He went on to explain his perspective, mentioning that while he might not be overly concerned if supernatural monsters were battling each other, the situation took a more serious turn when those same creatures started posing a threat to humans. Yushin proceeded to explain that there had been a shift in the events and circumstances surrounding the story. Evidently intrigued by Yushin's words, Choi Siwu's curiosity appeared to intensify, 
indicating a growing eagerness on his part to know further into the details of these recent changes. Yushin proceeded to share with Choi Siwu a crucial piece of information. Among the yakais, humans were considered the ultimate source of power. Yushin highlighted that some yakai, those aspiring to achieve a higher status like becoming a king, had overstepped a boundary. These particular yakai had shifted from merely consuming virtues to a more sinister act. They were now not only consuming the virtues of humans, but also actively preying upon and devouring humans themselves. Yushin continued his explanation to Choi Siwu by sharing alarming news. Over the past month, there had been a noticeable rise in the cases of missing individuals, particularly in densely populated cities. While there wasn't concrete evidence directly associating these incidents with the yakai, what stood out was the aftermath at the homes of the disappeared individuals. In most instances, there were indications of violence and chaos, with signs of bloodshed and widespread destruction left in the wake of the disappearance. As Yushin spoke to Choi Siwu about the unusual behavior of the yakai, noting that this was the first time they had made themselves so openly apparent, he suddenly became aware that someone was about to approach them. Yushin swiftly rose to his feet, his actions driven by a sense of urgency to protect both himself and Choi Siwu. All of a sudden, without any warning, a dazzling and radiant light emerged right before their very eyes, illuminating the space directly in front of Yushin and Choi Siwu. Choi Siwu found himself taken aback by the sudden appearance of Sol Mai. Upon reaching Choi Siwu's location, Sol Mai showed genuine concern. She promptly inquired about Choi Siwu's well-being, asking if he was all right. Furthermore, she expressed regret, offering an apology for being absent for an extended period of time. Yushin swiftly reacted by directing his sword towards Sol Mai and firmly voiced his discontent, instructing her to cease her nonsense, or confusing talk. Seeing Sol Mai's confusion and emotional state, which seemed to be a result of her concern for Choi Siwu, Yushin's own worry translated into a defensive action. He raised his sword, aiming it in Sol Mai's direction, and sternly warned her not to approach any closer. Yushin positioned the sword pointedly towards Sol Mai, eagerly warning her. He expressed his strong warning stating that if she were to disregard his caution and venture even a single step closer, he would view it as a direct ignorance of the warning, leading him to take swift and decisive action to eliminate her without hesitation. Just as Choi Siwu was on the verge of revealing information about Sol Mai, Yushin's heightened defensive stance took precedence. His thoughts were consumed by his protective instincts, leading him to entertain the idea that Sol Mai might not actually be a human, but potentially a yakai. Yushin conveyed to Choi Siwu his belief that Sol Mai likely possessed an understanding of the principle of the rules and regulations. He explained that his decision to issue a warning rather than resorting to immediate elimination was influenced by the notion that Sol Mai might comprehend the significance of abiding by the law. Yushin shared with Choi Siwu his perspective that when dealing with Yakai, providing a warning might not be necessary if they were already inclined to attack them regardless. Observing Yushin's intense defensive stance and his determination to safeguard them, Choi Siwu cast a worried glance at Sol Mai. In that moment, Yushin couldn't help but entertain the notion that Sol Mai might indeed be a dangerous and formidable monster. Sol Mai locked eyes with Yushin while he explained that she was, in fact, a monster. Yushin's words resonated with her as he says that despite any human-like appearance, the fundamental nature of monsters remained unchanged. This nature led them to be consumed by their own power, leading to violence against humans. Yushin added that this violence even extended to their own leaders, showing that monsters could turn against their own king. While keeping his sword aimed at Sol Mai, Yushin spoke to Choi Siwu. He emphasized that despite having goblin lineage in his blood, Choi Siwu was fundamentally a human. He asserted that the human world was his rightful home, and he didn't require the approval of monsters to exist within it. Struggling to come to terms with Choi Siwu's situation, Yushin expressed his disbelief. He made it clear that regardless of the circumstances, he couldn't fathom letting Choi Siwu go away. While Yushin shared his thoughts, Sol Mai started to think. She thought that Choi Siwu might be seeing the situation as a strange and senseless disaster. Sol Mai contemplated the situation and arrived at a similar conclusion. She realized that despite the current circumstances, Choi Siwu's status was already established within the supernatural records. His perspective or position aside, he unmistakably belonged to the realm of supernatural beings. Sol Mai considered the situation from a broader perspective. She believed that overlooking the concepts of right and wrong, such a breach of established rules could lead to severe consequences, not only for Choi Siwu but also for his friend Yushin. Sol Mai's thoughts turned towards finding a solution to the dilemma. She pondered a plan for escaping with Siwu, realizing the urgency of resolving the situation before it had a chance to escalate any further. As she prepared herself for a potential fight, Sol Mai couldn't help but assess the situation. 
She believed that Yushin was a formidable individual but doubted his ability to handle a conflict with Choi Siwu. Sol Mai's determination to escape with Choi Siwu overrode her concerns. She recognized that she had no alternative but to confront Yushin. With resolve, she conveyed to Yushin that, in her capacity as Choi Siwu's guardian, she was obliged to take him along with her. Yushin responded firmly, indicating to Sol Mai that if she persisted in disregarding his warning, he would be left with no choice but to eliminate her. Convinced that Sol Mai had chosen to overlook his warning, Yushin made up his mind to proceed with his plan to eliminate her. As Yushin was preparing to take action, Choi Siwu unexpectedly stepped forward to confront him. Out of nowhere, Choi Siwu abruptly seized the sword from Yushin's grasp. Yushin found himself taken aback by Choi Siwu's unexpected and swift action. With Yushin's sword in his possession, Choi Siwu examined it closely. He couldn't help but find the sword's design intriguing and started to contemplate the meaning behind the engraved symbols on it. Yushin contemplated the notion that Choi Siwu might be under the influence of some form of magic or manipulation. However, he also noticed a distinct change in Choi Siwu's demeanor, sensing a different energy or vibe surrounding him. Choi Siwu proceeded to share his thoughts with Yushin. He acknowledged that the concept of the killings might be difficult for him to comprehend. However, he suggested that the notion of a yakai consuming its own king due to madness seemed to resemble Yushin. Yushin was taken aback by Choi Siwu's revelation that he had actually consumed another being. Choi Siwu stated an explanation, defending his actions by stating that he had taken another's life in order to safeguard himself and those in his vicinity. Saul Mai attentively listened as Choi Siwu outlined his intentions to continue as a goblin. He assured Yushin that his intention was not to harm humans or cause damage. However, he acknowledged his readiness to consume non-essential yakai if it served the purpose of strengthening himself or avoiding death. Yushin then convinced Choi Siwu that he doesn't need to go that far as to make himself a resident of the supernatural realm and devour monsters. Yushin reassured Choi Siwu by explaining that, whether within his own family or independently, he possessed the strength to shield Choi Siwu and his mother. Yushin believed that they would be well protected and secure in the human world. With Yushin's sword now lowered, Choi Siwu conveyed that he had an additional point to address, building on the earlier conversation. To Yushin's surprise, and with a smile, Choi Siwu declared his intention that he was going to become the Yakai King. Yushin was taken aback by Choi Siwu's unexpected proclamation, causing him to pause momentarily, processing this surprising declaration. Even Saul Mai was caught off guard by Choi Siwu's abrupt announcement of his desire to become the Yakai King. Yushin expressed his frustrations, questioning whether Choi Siwu might be considered somewhat irrational for aspiring to be a Yakai King. He asked Choi Siwu if he truly comprehends the implications of his statement. Choi Siwu responded, admitting that he might not have an extensive explanation at the moment, but he remained steady in his determination. Choi Siwu explained to Yushin that he felt compelled to give it a try. He believed that if he were to become the Yakai King, it wouldn't necessarily result in the world turning upside down. Yushin was left speechless and found himself at a loss for words. He stared at Choi Siwu with a mixture of astonishment and disbelief. Choi Siwu conveyed to Yushin that he felt helpless in the current situation. He believed that taking some sort of action was better than remaining inactive. He mused that this course of action seemed to be a good fit for him. Yushin was rendered speechless and took a moment to gather his thoughts. While contemplating Choi Siwu's words, Yushin came to a decision. Yushin conveyed his understanding to Choi Siwu. He explained that regardless of whether Choi Siwu was human or a supernatural being, clear intentions were what mattered. Yushin believed that there was no need to impose anything forcefully on Choi Siwu if his intentions were sincere. Yushin added a statement, stating that if Choi Siwu were to overstep certain boundaries as a supernatural being, he would not hesitate to eliminate him immediately. Choi Siwu concurred with Yushin's words, acknowledging that he was correct in his assessment. As a mutual understanding settled between them, Yushin retrieved his mask. Yushin, taking a step forward, inquired about Sol Mai's name. She introduced herself and revealed that she held the significant role of a promising messenger within the half Yakai court. Yushin extended an apology to Sol Mai for intervening in Yakai affairs. Yushin acknowledged the presence of laws within the Yakai world and their right to enforce them. He emphasized to Sol Mai that if she couldn't ensure fairness and an absence of unjust harm, he would step in to intervene should anyone be unfairly killed or injured. Yushin further elaborated that in his capacity, as the chief shaman of the Star Hall, he held a position of authority. He stated that if any incidents occurred involving them, he would take decisive action and eliminate those responsible without showing any mercy. Yushin said his farewell to Choi Siwu, reassuring him not to be concerned about his mother's well-being. 
Shoi Siwu watched Yushin as he walked away from them, his gaze fixed on his departing figure. Feeling a wave of relief, Sal Mai's emotions nearly overwhelmed her. She felt on the verge of tears, realizing that she had been genuinely frightened. This encounter with a shaman was her first, and the experience had been both intimidating and overwhelming for her. Abruptly, a man's voice broke the silence, intervening in their conversation. The man stated that Yushin was indeed an extraordinary exception. Sal Mai shifted her gaze towards the source of the voice and saw Goyu, who had followed her. Goyu explained that he had chosen to follow Sal Mai's lead. He expressed that he had considered her actions, noting that despite her lack of knowledge about the opponent's strength and numbers, she had charged into the situation without hesitation. As Goyu's words sank in, Sal Mai's expression turned somber. She seemed to feel a sense of sadness as he pointed out that even if the opponent had been slightly stronger, she might have been overpowered and devoured without having a chance to defend herself. Shifting his focus, Goyu directed his attention towards Choi Siwu. He inquired if Choi Siwu was the goblin known for his recklessness. In response, Choi Siwu greeted him. Goyu's thoughts seemed to drift as he contemplated the situation. He remarked that creatures with a foundation in animals were referred to as beast demons. In many instances, these creatures were constrained by their physical form and primal instincts, resembling ancestral beings. As these beings evolved into yakai, their status underwent a transformation. Not only did their human facade change, but their true forms also diverged from their original nature. Yakai or groups of yakai with such characteristics are commonly known as phantom beasts. While Goyu was in the process of introducing himself, Choi Siwu appeared to be taken aback by the revelation. Suddenly, the presence of a large yakai monster's aura materialized before Choi Siwu, positioning itself directly in front of him. Goyu introduced himself to Choi Siwu, sharing his name, and extended a greeting, expressing that it was a pleasure to meet him. Goyu held the role of a representative within the Goyu Black Turquoise clan. As a symbol of greeting and challenge, Goyu extended his hand towards Choi Siwu. He explained that in order to become a yakai king, Choi Siwu would need to overcome him in combat. With a friendly demeanor, Goyu stretched out his hand towards Choi Siwu and offered his greetings, accompanied by a warm smile. Choi Siwu responded by extending his hand to meet Goyu's gesture, but he couldn't help but notice a change in Goyu's demeanor. He sensed that Goyu's vibe had shifted from what it was just a moment ago. In the midst of Choi Siwu's intention to reciprocate Goyu's hand gesture with a handshake, Sol Mai's voice erupted with urgency. She swiftly raised her voice, offering a cautionary shout to Choi Siwu, advising him against proceeding to clasp Goyu's hand. Surprised by the sudden warning, Choi Siwu turned his gaze towards Sol Mai, seeking an explanation for her unexpected outburst. Sol Mai's anger flared as she directed her frustration towards Goyu. She raised her voice, demanding to know the reason for his sudden appearance and expressing her displeasure. She pointed out that Choi Siwu had already faced a challenging day, questioning why Goyu chose this moment to show up. Goyu responded defiantly, asking Sol Mai what the problem was. He asserted that there were no rules dictating that he had to remain asleep all the time. Without warning, Goyu forcibly seized Choi Siwu's hand. He commented to Choi Siwu that he found it amusing to witness a half-goblin boasting about the ambition to become the Yakai king. Goyu unleashed his power, showcasing his ability by biting his nails and unleashing his master art's mastery. A violet and dark circle formed, enveloping both Goyu and Choi Siwu. Goyu maintained his grip on his hands, while the mysterious circle encircled them. Unexpectedly, Goyu swiftly employed a teleportation technique, resulting in an immediate shift that rendered them vanished from their prior position. The abrupt vanishing act left Sol Mai in a state of surprise and uncertainty, as she grappled with the sudden turn of events and found herself unsure of the appropriate course of action to take next. As Choi Siwu and Goyu completed their teleportation, the surroundings underwent a dramatic transformation. They now found themselves in a new setting, marked by the presence of a full moon casting its radiant glow upon a serene lake. Choi Siwu and Goyu successfully arrived at their intended destination, and they were on the brink of making their landing. Upon their teleportation to a different location, Choi Siwu found himself grappling with the experience. As they touched down, he struggled to maintain his balance, his body reacting to the unfamiliar sensation of teleportation, which had been both sudden and devoid of any prior warning. Goyu acknowledged that the process had been more challenging than anticipated, particularly for Choi Siwu on his first attempt at teleportation. He expressed his admiration for Choi Siwu's ability to remain on his feet, noting that not many individuals could manage to stand on two legs after their initial experience with teleportation. As Goyu observed Choi Siwu, he discerned that Choi Siwu didn't display the level of surprise one might expect from a sudden teleportation. Instead, Choi Siwu regarded him with an aura of alarm and suspicion. In response, Choi Siwu posed a question, 
asking if Goyu had intentionally planned to seize him from the outset. Goyu responded by acknowledging that the scenario Choi Siwu proposed was indeed the most probable outcome. However, before proceeding, he expressed his desire to ask Choi Siwu something. Choi Siwu was caught off guard by the abruptness of Goyu's query, which revolved around his engagement with computer games. The question seemed to arrive out of nowhere, surprising Choi Siwu and prompting him to momentarily process the unexpected topic of conversation. Choi Siwu responded to Goyu's question, explaining that during his middle school years, he had experimented with a variety of activities, including computer games. However, as he transitioned to high school, his engagement with gaming diminished significantly. In response, Goyu inquired further, asking Choi Siwu about the specific genres of games he used to play. Given the choice, Choi Siwu indicated that he would opt for action games. Despite not actively playing games, he shared his perspective that in contemporary times, investing time takes precedence over honing skills, making the act of spending time on a particular activity more important. Goyu's smile took on a somewhat mischievous smile as he responded to Choi Siwu's perspective. He remarked that Choi Siwu's point was indeed valid, implying an agreement with his sentiment. Choi Siwu's state of alarm increased as he realized that Goyu had initiated a sudden movement, seemingly with the intention of launching an attack from behind him. Initiating an assault from his current position, Goyu launched an attack against Choi Siwu. Reacting to the sudden assault with a mix of alarm and instinct, Choi Siwu swiftly sidestepped and maneuvered his body adeptly, managing to dodge the incoming attack launched by Goyu. His quick reflexes and agile movement allowed him to evade the danger effectively, ensuring that he emerged from the situation unharmed and without sustaining any injuries. Abruptly, Choi Siwu's attention was drawn to a sudden occurrence that is an ice crystal materialized on the surface of the lake. Caught off guard by the unexpected ice formation, Choi Siwu found himself in a state of surprise and uncertainty. Faced with the situation, he grappled with determining his next course of action considering strategies to effectively evade the oncoming barrage of crystals. Numerous crystals materialized seemingly out of thin air, a phenomenon that was likely orchestrated by Goyu. These crystals emerged with the intent to attack Choi Siwu. Goyu observed with keen attention as Choi Siwu adeptly evaded each of the incoming crystals, his movements demonstrating impressive agility and swiftness. As Choi Siwu prepared to launch a charge towards him, Goyu shifted his gaze upwards. He recognized Choi Siwu's impressive speed and agility, acknowledging that Choi Siwu had managed to target him before he could react with evasive maneuvers. Goyu's gaze remained fixed on Choi Siwu. He pondered the possibility that Choi Siwu might have been the one to initiate the attack, leading to Choi Siwu independently arriving at the decision to direct his assault towards him. Goyu's abilities were subtly on display as he continued to contemplate the situation. He marveled at Choi Siwu's remarkable performance, acknowledging that despite being relatively new to these circumstances, Choi Siwu had managed to showcase a level of skill that was undeniably impressive. Observing the ongoing combat, Goyu noted that Choi Siwu's senses and innate combat abilities were exceptionally strong. However, what stood out even more prominently in this instance was Choi Siwu's remarkable capacity for learning. It was this ability to quickly adapt and absorb new information that shone brightest in the current situation. Recalling a scenario where an adversary had guided the approach Choi Siwu had encountered that day, Goyu found himself reminiscing about a similar situation. As Goyu observes Choi Siwu he thought he was remaining vigilant against the potential dangers that the adversary might possess. Choi Siwu maintained a cautious stance, prepared to counter any potential threats. Choi Siwu concentrated his power, channeling it into his fist as he prepared himself for an impending attack against Goyu. Harnessing his inner strength and focusing it into his fist, Choi Siwu released a formidable burst of power aimed directly at Goyu. Employing the power of the goblin's treasure armor, Choi Siwu utilized an ear cuff that harnessed the wearer's energy and strength. This enabled him to unleash a surge of formidable power, resulting in a potent burst of energy. After landing, Choi Siwu's attack caused the surroundings to be enveloped in an increasing veil of smoke. He focused his unleashed power towards Goyu, directing it with intention and determination. Despite launching an attack against Goyu, Choi Siwu maintained a defensive stance, remaining vigilant and ready to react to any potential counterattacks or incoming threats. While it might appear that Choi Siwu's attack had struck its target, he remained cautious and vigilant, never lowering his guard and maintaining his readiness to respond to any potential developments. Amidst the enveloping smoke, an unusual light began to show, capturing Choi Siwu's attention. He continued to maintain a defensive posture, his gaze fixed on the source of the strange light with unwavering caution. In the midst of his attack against Goyu, Choi Siwu experienced a realization concerning the concept of life force. 
This understanding led him to believe that he had gained a deeper insight into the situation. Choi Siwoo sensed a vivid surge of electrical energy coursing through his body, with the sensation originating from his lower extremity. Choi Siwoo recognized that the attack he had unleashed represented only a fraction of his true power, approximately 10%. However, as Choi Siwu continued to release multiple smaller attacks, he perceived that each of these attacks seemed to deplete his energy at a rate of approximately 3% per strike. Contemplating the implications of his energy levels potentially dropping to 0%, Choi Siwu couldn't help but consider the possibility of entering a state of depletion, similar to what had occurred previously. This realization led him to acknowledge that he couldn't continuously employ his powers without limitation. As the full moon continued its ascent, Goyu directed a compliment towards Choi Siwu, acknowledging his efforts and actions in the ongoing situation. Wearing a smile, Goyu addressed Choi Siwu and admitted that he hadn't anticipated the swift return of the icicle to his possession. Inquiring of Choi Siwu, Goyu questioned whether he had underestimated him too quickly and whether they had already progressed beyond the initial phase of their encounter right from the beginning. Choi Siwu directed a question at Goyu, seeking clarity beyond mere words. He inquired whether Goyu's intentions truly were an attempt to consume or devour him. Expressing his observations, Choi Siwu conveyed to Goyu that he didn't detect any imminent threat or malevolent intent emanating from him. Goyu responded by sharing his perspective with Choi Siwu. He explained that attempting to forcefully create a persona that doesn't truly exist felt awkward to him. He further clarified that he didn't harbor grudges or specific appetites, and emphasized that Choi Siwu's previous statements had managed to irritate him. Goyu inquired if Choi Siwu truly comprehended the essence of being a yakai. Choi Siwu affirmed that he indeed had an understanding of it. Goyu prompted Choi Siwu to engage in careful consideration and reflection. He encouraged Choi Siwu to contemplate whether it seemed somewhat unusual to select a ruler who would hold dominion for centuries based solely on a single specific ritual. Despite Goyu's explanation about the tradition of the yakai world, Choi Siwu remained cautious and maintained a defensive posture, unwilling to let his guard down. Goyu explained to Choi Siwu that the beings within their world were inherently loyal to their desires and instincts. He clarified that even though the powerful might establish laws and rules, it didn't necessarily mean that these creatures would abide to them and normally slaughter and predation wouldn't cease. As a preventative measure, the creation of the Yakai King was attributed to ancient Yakai, serving as a safeguard against potential chaos and violence. Recognizing the inherent nature of Yakai and the potential for inevitable catastrophe, there was a unanimous vote among them to safeguard against such events. This agreement was encapsulated in the shared sentiment of let's protect this to ensure the preservation of their realm. The figure that holds authority over the obedience of all yakai within their realm, maintaining harmony for their survival, is known as the yakai king. Continuing the conversation, Goyu conveyed to Choi Siwu that, fortunately, the succession of yakai kings had effectively managed the yakai of their respective eras for more than a millennium. While there might have been occasional differences, and disagreements, the core principle governing the survival and well-being of the yakai remain constant. Expanding on his point, Goyu added that there was an exception among the line of yakai kings, the current yakai king of their generation. Goyu tells Choi Siwu to imagine if your human leaders suddenly introduced a law as drastic as this one day, no one in the world should ever eat meat, no matter what happens. What chaos would occur? Choi Siwu contemplated the scenario, and expressed his belief that such a law would likely provoke widespread protests and the situation might escalate beyond mere protests. In response, Goyu informed him that the Yakai King had already upheld a similar law for an impressive span of 666 years. Goyu conveyed to Choi Siwu that contemplating the situation could provide them with a rough understanding of just how crucial the Yakai King was to their realm. He emphasized the significance of the tradition and the considerable efforts that had been endured to maintain it over time. Goyu further explained that it appeared that even the Yakai's patience had reached its limit and he inquired whether Choi Siwu understood the implication behind his words. Choi Siwu pondered the situation, considering that if the next Yakai king were to enact the same law, not everyone would obediently adhere to it as they had in the past. Though you commended Choi Siwu for grasping the concept swiftly and acknowledged that even if it were a command from the king, the Yakai wouldn't necessarily obey it at all times. If many Yakai decide not to follow the Yakai king's rules, even though the king is very strong, they can still cause a lot of trouble and not listen to what the king says. Goyu explained that the consequences wouldn't only affect the new Yakai king, the entire system that has been maintained for a long time, including the authority and significance of the Yakai king, would collapse. Goyu carefully considered and grasped the meaning behind Choi Siwu's words, coming to an understanding of the perspective he had presented. 
Though you conveyed to Choi Siwu that while some yakai might brush off his bold statements, the younger ones perhaps even making fun of him and moving on. The older yakai could react more aggressively, potentially trying to confront him and challenge his claims. Having pieced together the puzzle of Choi Siwu's behavior, Goyu came to the realization that Choi Siwu didn't conform to the traditional image of a yakai, and his issue was more about his lack of understanding of the world's ways. He recognized that Choi Siwu's tendency to openly display his affection without considering the consequences might be the root of his problem. Choi Siwu then asked Goyu if he was asking him to take back the words he had said earlier. Openly sharing his observations, Goyu admitted that he initially perceived Choi Siwu as someone he could easily defeat, but upon closer examination, he acknowledged that Choi Siwu had shown significant growth and potential for further development. Expressing a proposition, Goyu suggested to Choi Siwu that if he joined his side and allowed him to become the Yakai king, he would grant Choi Siwu the authority to rule over the Korean peninsula. Goyu thinks that Choi Siwu acknowledged that the proposal was indeed alluring. Acknowledging that even if Goyu were to rule, eradicating humans completely wouldn't be feasible. However, he mentioned that he could potentially spare a select few humans who were close to him. Goyu was caught off guard by Choi Siwu's sudden question about whether he believed his chances of becoming the Yakai king were high. Choi Siwu hesitated for a moment, while Goyu confidently responded that there was no one in the Yakai world stronger than him. In the midst of their conversation about whether Choi Siwu would join him, Choi Siwu had reached a decision. Choi Siwu's sudden action of reaching out his hand seemed to indicate his decision to join Goyu's side. Taken aback by Choi Siwu's rapid decision, Goyu was caught off guard yet pleased as he acknowledged that Choi Siwu would indeed accept his proposal, particularly if it translated to safeguarding the people around him. Grasping Choi Siwu's hand with a sense of satisfaction, Goyu expressed his approval of the choice Choi Siwu had made. However, Choi Siwu emulated a powerful aura and confidently conveyed to Goyu that he considered it a smart decision to join hands, emphasizing that he wouldn't feel any guilt about what he was about to do. As Choi Siwu held onto Goyu's hand with a strong grip, an unexpected and intense surge of electric power surged through his own hand, creating a sensation that he had never experienced before and making him aware of the unique energy that flowed between them. Goyu found himself taken aback by the sudden and potent surge of power that Choi Siwu seemed to be emanating through their handshake. The intensity of the energy flowing between them was unexpected and left Goyu surprised. Choi Siwu copied what Goyu did before by shaking his hand, making it seem innocent. But deep down, he had a sneaky plan all along. The current situation marked a significant departure from the wrestling tactics Siwu had employed earlier. He was employing just 60% of his available energy, deliberately reserving a small portion and then exerting himself to fully utilize what he had conserved, effectively squeezing out every possible bit of his stored power. The energy surge within Choi Siwu intensified, radiating a powerful aura. In a pivotal moment, driven by his unyielding determination, Choi Siwu harnessed a technique he had never used before, channeling his energy into a powerful surge that radiated from within him. With an unprecedented surge of energy, Choi Siwu seized the opportunity, swiftly bringing Gohu to the ground in a wrestle. Fueled by a surge of anger, Choi Siwu's actions were characterized by determination and unwavering readiness, leaving no room for hesitation. Choi Siwu's anger ignited a formidable burst of power as he engaged in a fierce confrontation against Goyu. The air in their immediate vicinity became thick with billowing smoke, obscuring their surroundings. As a result of the immense and potent energy that Choi Siwu had harnessed and released upon Goyu, causing a dramatic transformation of the atmosphere. In that crucial moment, Choi Siwu knelt down his body finding a firm seat upon the ground, as he channeled the entirety of his formidable power into the impending attack. The sheer magnitude of the force he was summoning caused every fiber of his being to quiver and shake. Choi Siwu's entire body trembling with the effort he was expending in that formidable attack, causing tiny electrical sparks to flicker all across his body. Choi Siwu gently, almost imperceptibly, opened his eyes just a tiny bit, pausing for a brief moment in complete silence, as if time itself had momentarily come to a standstill. Choi Siwu's entire body quivered with tremors, and all he could perceive were his arms and hands shaking intensely, following the release of an astonishing and overwhelming surge of power. He had poured every ounce of his power into that tremendous effort, leaving only a scant trace of yakai energy within him. As a consequence, the two advantages normally associated with this energy would remain inaccessible for a considerable period. Choi Siwu's eyes reflect a mixture of bewilderment and unease, clearly indicating that he's struggling to muster the energy required to rise to his feet, a challenge exacerbated by his overwhelming exhaustion. Certainly, here's a longer sentence. As the intense moment unfolded, Choi Siwu found himself kneeling on the ground, 
his prospects of success seemingly dwindling to absolute zero should he opt to persevere in the battle. While his formidable foe, Goyu, remained steadfastly upright on both feet, unyielding and unwavering in his stance, positioned squarely before him. As Goyu stood before Choi Siwu, he conveyed to him that he had ventured to the very edge of risking his life, utilizing every last drop of his remaining energy to deliver a single, decisive strike. This, he emphasized, was the epitome of genuine combat, a sensation that transcended mortal comprehension and could only be likened to a gift from the heavens themselves. As Choi Siwu directed his gaze upward, his eyes fixed upon Goyu, who stood resolute before him. In that intense moment, Goyu candidly conveyed the pivotal truth that had shaped the course of their confrontation. He earnestly articulated that the subtle but critical disparity in their fundamental energies had played a pivotal role in determining the outcome of their battle. Goyu emphasized that he could have been utterly overwhelmed and consumed by Choi Siwu without question. While Goyu uttered these weighty words to Choi Siwu, his gaze remained fixed upon the kneeling figure before him. The air was thick with tension, and the gravity of the situation hung heavily in the atmosphere. With a commanding presence, Goyu looked down upon Choi Siwu, who knelt before him, acknowledging the undeniable reality of their confrontation. As Goyu posed the question to Choi Siwu about what he would say for his last words, Choi Siwu responded with a confident smile, reassuring Goyu that there was no need for any final words from him. He explained that right from the very start of their intense battle, he had mentally and emotionally prepared himself for the possibility of facing the same fate that he had boldly and unhesitatingly meted out to others. A sense of surprise washed over Goyu as Choi Siwu, against all expectations, rose to his feet and declared with unwavering determination that he was far from finished in this fierce contest of combat and defense. Goyu, who had assumed that the battle was reaching its climax, found himself taken aback by this unexpected twist in the narrative. As Choi Siwu rose from his kneeling position, he swiftly assumed a combat-ready stance, his determination to continue the fight burning brightly in his eyes. Without a hint of surrender, he addressed Goyu with a resolute tone, making it abundantly clear that if Goyu had entertained any hopes of witnessing him beg or plead for mercy, the timing for such a scenario was far from appropriate. The unwavering gleam in Choi Siwu's eyes, a gleam that steadfastly refused to fade, appeared to be a reflection of his unyielding determination. It was a determination fueled by his acute awareness of the need to exploit his opponent's weaknesses and seize every available opportunity that presented itself in the heat of battle. This persistent gleam spoke volumes about Choi Siwu's strategic mindset, highlighting his ability to remain vigilant and focused even amidst the most intense and challenging combat situations. A warm smile crept across Goyu's face, and a light-hearted chuckle escaped his lips as he gazed at Choi Siwu. With a hint of admiration in his voice, Goyu commended Choi Siwu for his surprising eloquence, especially considering the current circumstances where all Choi Siwu could manage was to stand. In response to Choi Siwu's resolute declaration and unwavering determination, Goyu's demeanor took an unexpected turn. With a sudden, spontaneous motion, he extended his hands and pointed them directly at Choi Siwu. In this pivotal moment, the onlookers and perhaps even Choi Siwu himself were left in suspense, as Goyu's intentions remained shrouded in mystery. The air was charged with anticipation, as no one knew what move Goyu would execute next, creating a moment of heightened tension and curiosity in their intense confrontation. In a surprising turn of events, Goyu's earlier enigmatic gesture evolved into a warm and genuine smile. With a sense of friendship, he reached out and tapped Choi Siwu's shoulders in a gesture of acknowledgement. This unexpected display of sportsmanship left Choi Siwu visibly surprised, his expression registering a mix of astonishment and relief. Choi Siwu turned his gaze towards Goyu, his earlier surprise giving way to a sense of confusion as Goyu showered him with unexpected praise. Goyu commended Choi Siwu for not disappointing, even in the final moments of their encounter, and expressed admiration for the natural and overflowing enthusiasm with which Choi Siwu had conducted himself. Goyu's smile widened as Choi Siwu inquisitive and eager to understand, posed a question about the meaning of approved. With patience and clarity, Goyu proceeded to explain that it essentially referred to whether someone was worth cheering for or not. He delved deeper into the concept, emphasizing that cheering for an individual who had no real chance of ascending to the esteemed position of the Yakai King would ultimately be a futile and meaningless endeavor. Choi Siwu, still grappling with the unexpected twists in their exchange, remained in a state of bewilderment. Goyu, however, continued to break the mold of their previous intense confrontation. In a surprising and heartening move, Goyu expressed his support and cheered Choi Siwu on in his quest to become a Yakai king.
Goyu, in a moment of frankness, admitted to Choi Siwu that while he genuinely cheered for his fellow warrior's aspirations to become the Yakai King, he couldn't help but harbor a certain apprehension and reluctance when it came to the impending night of the Yakai. As the conversation between Goyu and Choi Siwu continued, Goyu opened up about his personal experiences and reflections. He shared a glimpse into his past, revealing that even in his youth, he had never been fond of the chaotic and energetic nature of the Yakai realm. To him, the rampant destruction and the casual disregard for the significance of actions, often taken for granted as obvious and necessary, had always been something he struggled to comprehend. As Goyu reminisced about his experiences in the human world, he couldn't help but draw a stark comparison between that realm and the chaotic Yakai realm. In his eyes, the human world appeared peaceful and tranquil in comparison to the chaotic and unpredictable nature of the place they called home. Amidst his reflections on the differences between the human and Yakai realms, Goyu revealed a particular fondness for the human race. He expressed admiration for humans and their ability to appreciate the simple pleasures of idleness and leisure. Goyu further emphasized the stark distinctions between the human world and the Yakai realm by pointing out the complete absence of what he considered useless forms of entertainment in the latter. He made it clear that in the Yakai realm, there was no room for comics, novels, or movies, which were such integral parts of human culture. In a moment of introspection, Goyu shared with Choi Siwu that despite the seeming lack of seriousness of comics, novels, movies, and other forms of entertainment, some Yakais preferred these useless pursuits over the grim alternative of devouring humans. As Goyu continued to express his perspective, Choi Siwu found himself contemplating the possibility of other Yakai who might share similar sentiments. He took note of Goyu's consistent use of we in his statements, hinting at a potential collective perspective among certain members of their kind. Choi Siwu acknowledged that he comprehended Goyu's point of view, but at the same time, he couldn't help but question the necessity of actively cheering for him. In a surprising revelation, Goyu confided in Choi Siwu that the prospect of being the Yakai King, despite its prestige, could be quite annoying and bothersome. This unexpected admission offered a unique perspective on the coveted title and hinted at the complexity and responsibilities that came with it. Goyu expanded on his earlier revelation by explaining to Choi Siwu that on the Korean peninsula, becoming the Yakai king might indeed be the highest probability, given their unique circumstances. However, he went on to clarify that, regardless of one's position as the Yakai king or not, there were other annoying and irritating issues that needed to be contended with. Choi Siwu, still grappling with the intricacies of the conversation, remained somewhat confused by these revelations. Goyu further elucidated the dynamics surrounding the quest for the Yakai throne by revealing that not only himself, but all the prominent candidates vying for the prestigious position hailed from ancient clans. Expanding upon the discussion, Goyu elaborated that while candidates from the ancient clans did possess innate talents, the key to their success in the race for the Yakai throne lay in the optimized utilization of ancestral magic, which had been meticulously passed down through generations. This insight emphasized the importance of not only heritage but also the preservation and mastery of the unique magical traditions that were a part of their ancestral lineage. Goyu continued to provide insight into the dynamics of power and influence within the Yakai realm. He emphasized that even if the unique magic possessed by various candidates had similar levels of inherent power, those who inherited thousands of years' worth of accumulated manuals and knowledge were inevitably stronger. Goyu offered a thoughtful explanation for his earlier statement by drawing a parallel with the common phrase born with a silver spoon. He clarified that his point was similar to the notion that individuals born into privilege and wealth often have a significant advantage in life. And in their case, those who inherited extensive ancestral knowledge and magical prowess were similarly positioned to excel. Choi Siwu, seeking further clarification, drew a parallel between being from an ancient clan and being born into an old money conglomerate, where family pressure, and expectations often played a significant role. His inquiry suggested an understanding of the potential challenges and responsibilities that came with such lineage. Goyu, with a touch of mocking humor, responded to Choi Siwu's comparison. He acknowledged that Choi Siwu's description was indeed a gentle one, but he went on to emphasize that the reality was more similar to feeling nearly crushed under the weight of expectations. He explained that when a moderately talented individual was born into such a clan, the entire family and clan members would immediately begin buzzing with the belief that this individual must strive to become the Yakai king. As their conversation delved into more profound territory, Choi Siu regarded Goyu with a newfound seriousness. Goyu continued to share insights, revealing that as a representative of their clan, he was bound by a solemn oath to safeguard and advance the interests of their ancient lineage. Goyu further clarified the stakes involved in upholding the oath as a representative. 
He explained that if a representative failed to fulfill their oath or betrayed the interests of the clan, the consequences could be severe. He provided a stark example, stating that the representative could be overthrown or even face the possibility of being killed. In such a situation, a new leader would be installed to take their place. As Goyu's words settled in, Choi Siwu couldn't help but feel a weight descend upon him. He internalized the harsh reality of the consequences Goyu had described, especially in a situation where an entire clan stood in opposition. This sentiment was particularly touching for Choi Siwu, who, as a non-human in a predominantly human world, was acutely aware of the unique challenges he faced. In the midst of Choi Siwu's contemplation, Goyu suddenly pointed directly at him. This unexpected gesture broke the flow of his thoughts and redirected his attention toward Goyu, prompting curiosity and anticipation about what Goyu had in mind or wanted to convey. As Goyu's aura brightened and seemed to spark with energy, he continued to point at Choi Siwu, his gaze focused on his fellow yakai. With a tone of sincerity, he conveyed to Choi Siwu that he recognized something unique and distinct about him. Goyu's revelation left Choi Siwu thoroughly surprised. Goyu pointed out that whatever set Choi Siwu apart was ingrained in his very blood, yet Choi Siwu didn't belong to a clan or a family like many others did. Furthermore, Goyu mentioned that Choi Siwu's motives for aspiring to become a yakai king remained enigmatic and unclear. This statement not only heightened Choi Siwu's curiosity, but also introduced a layer of complexity to his character. Goyu leaned in closer to Choi Siwu, his eyes locked onto his fellow yakai's face, and he spoke with a sense of conviction. He asserted that it was not only possible but also imperative for Choi Siwu to become the Yakai King. His emphasis on this point underscored the belief that Choi Siwu held a unique and vital role to play in the destiny of their realm. As the moon continued to cast its soft glow upon the two Yakai, their conversation persisted, and Choi Siwu remained ensnared in a web of confusion. Choi Siwu raised his hands in a gesture of both respect and a plea for understanding. He gently implored Goyu to allow him some time to process everything emphasizing that the revelations and implications were quite overwhelming and had taken him by surprise. It was a request for a moment of contemplation and clarity, a chance to carefully weigh the significance of the conversation they had just shared. Unbeknown to Goyu and Choi Siwu, a sudden and unexpected threat loomed in the shadows. As they continued their conversation, Sol Mai, lurking nearby, prepared to strike with deadly intent. Her sharp claws poised to attack, she moved with stealth and precision, her intentions shrouded in darkness. In a swift and aggressive move, Sol Mai lunged forward, her sharp claws finding their mark as she grabbed Goyu's head with a fierce grip. Her sudden attack was marked by a menacing determination, catching Goyu off guard and threatening to disrupt the tranquil moonlit moment. Sol Mai's eyes blazed with a fierce combination of rage and anger as she launched her attack on Goyu. Her intensity and determination were palpable, leaving no doubt about the depth of her animosity in that moment. The atmosphere around them crackled with the raw energy of her assault, creating a tense and dangerous situation for Goyu and Choi Siwu. Sol Mai's grip on Goyu's head tightened, her sharp claws digging into his flesh with unrelenting force. The intensity of her attack left Goyu in a precarious and vulnerable position. Choi Siwu, caught off guard by the sudden and intense attack on Goyu, found himself in a state of profound shock. His mouth hung open in astonishment and words escaped him as he struggled to process the unexpected violence unfolding before him. The scene before his eyes left him momentarily speechless, his mind racing to comprehend the swift turn of events and the danger that now gripped Goyu. With a burst of aggressive strength, Sol Mai swiftly and forcefully threw Goyu aside. Her motion was marked by both power and aggression, propelling Goyu through the air as he became a pawn in the midst of their intense confrontation. Goyu's body hit the ground with a powerful and resounding impact causing him to bounce off the surface upon landing. The force of Sol Mai's throw had sent him tumbling, his form ricocheting off the earth as he struggled to regain his footing. Sol Mai, having executed her aggressive throw on Goyu, eventually landed gracefully on the ground. As Sol Mai landed on the ground in her formidable yakai form, her anger and determination radiated from her being. Without hesitation, she unleashed a unique and powerful technique known as the wind kick. This specialized magical attack was a testament to her skill, and fury, and it bore the potential to be devastating. With a surge of urgency, Choi Siwu tried to shout and intervene, attempting to stop Sol Mai from charging at Goyu with her powerful and fast attack. His voice rang out in the moonlit night, filled with a desperate plea to prevent further violence and danger. Sol Mai, driven by anger and determination, wasted no time in charging toward Goyu with astonishing speed. Her relentless pace left little room for reaction as she closed the distance between them, preparing to unleash the formidable attack with deadly intent. The sheer force of the charged atmosphere, 
and the imminent clash of Yakai powers sent ripples through the tranquil lake. The once calm water now reacted to the intensity of the moment, its surface disrupted by the powerful air currents generated by Sol Mai's approach. Choi Siwu, like a spectator caught in a whirlwind of unexpected events, found himself thoroughly surprised by the rapid and dramatic turn of the situation. The tranquility of their previous conversation had given way to a chaotic and perilous showdown between Sol Mai and Goyu. In the midst of the tense confrontation, Sol Mai turned her attention briefly to Choi Siwu. With a hint of assurance in her voice, she conveyed to him that Goyu would not be able to get a single bite out of him. Her words were meant to reassure Choi Siwu and possibly signal her intent to protect him from harm. Sol Mai and Choi Siwu, their attention momentarily diverted from the confrontation, observed the aftermath of the broken trees and disrupted surroundings. Sol Mai remarked that from the looks of it, she was pretty sure that Goyu had managed to escape the immediate danger. In a surprising revelation, Sol Mai turned to Choi Siwu and disclosed that the Goyu he had met earlier was not the same as the one they had encountered during their confrontation. She suggested that the Goyu from their earlier conversation had a double personality. It left Choi Siwu pondering the complexities of their recent interactions and the implications of this startling revelation, all under the eerie moonlight that bathed the scene in an otherworldly glow. Sol Mai's reference to folklore, where a snake and a turtle pair up to become one, added an intriguing layer of symbolism and mysticism to the situation. Such folklore often carries deeper meanings, and in this context, it might symbolize the dual nature or transformational aspect of Goyu's character. Sol Mai's additional insight into the folklore of the snake and turtle pairing deepened the narrative's intrigue. She mentioned that, according to this folklore, if they were to trace their origins back to their roots, they would find that they originally stemmed from an ordinary turtle. This folklore not only added layers of mysticism, but also hinted at the idea of transformation and evolution. It suggested that even the most extraordinary yakai, like Goyu, might have humble beginnings. Sol Mai continued to share pieces of lore from their world, recounting a tale from the distant past when a genius had a profound realization about the power of yin and yang. Sol Mai's narrative took a fascinating turn as she delved deeper into the tale. According to her, the genius had made a monumental decision to separate the yin and yang energies from his own yogic power. In this bold act, he isolated only the purest yin energy. This account of the genius's actions showcased a profound understanding of the elemental forces that govern their world. Sol Mai's narrative took an even more mystical turn as she explained the consequences of the genius's actions. By separating the yin and yang energies and isolating the purest yin energy, the genius had achieved a profound transformation. This act had allowed him to break through the limitations of his birth and awaken to a divine power within. Sol Mai's tale continued, revealing that the descendants of the genius were born with varying degrees of his extraordinary powers. However, in order to fully embrace and embody the legacy of the first divine spirit, they had to undergo a rigorous and demanding discipline known as the Bone Sharpening Discipline. This discipline likely involved intense training and spiritual practices aimed at honing their abilities to their fullest potential. Sol Mai went on to explain that a side effect of the Bone Sharpening Discipline was the emergence of the snake personality which Choi Siwu had encountered in Goyu. This revelation shed light on the dual nature of Goyu's character, further deepening the understanding of his complex identity. Choi Siwu, reflecting on his earlier interactions with Goyu, shared that initially, he hadn't perceived him as a bad individual. Sol Mai offered insight into Goyu's character, explaining that he was not inherently malicious. Instead, she described him as impulsive and selfish, driven by a peculiar sense of mischief. This perspective provided a more nuanced understanding of Goyu's actions and motivations, portraying him as a complex individual with his own quirks and tendencies. Sol Mai delved further into her description of Goyu, characterizing him as essentially a snake with a concentrated negative energy. This insight shed light on the source of his calm and cool demeanor, suggesting that his nature was inherently influenced by this unique energy. Sol Mai continued her explanation, revealing that at Goyu's core, he was completely submissive to his true self, the turtle. This revelation offered a profound insight into the duality within Goyu. Despite the snake personality and its impulsive tendency, his true essence lay in the patient and steady nature of a turtle. Sol Mai's narrative continued to unveil the intricacies of Goyu's snake personality, which she referred to as Guiyu. She explained that Guiyu had exhibited a gluttonous personality from the beginning and possessed the unique ability to take over a body autonomously. This revelation shed light on the trouble and chaos that Guiyu had caused over an extended period. Sol Mai's concerns about the trouble caused by Guiyu's actions were palpable, and she went on to explain that because of Guiyu's history of mischief and disruption, there had been opposition to his selection as a representative. This opposition likely stemmed from a desire to maintain stability 
and order within the Yakai realm, given the potential risks associated with Kuiyu's impulsive behavior. With the story concluded, Sol Mai shifted her focus to practical matters and asked Choi Siwu if he had finished packing his things. Choi Siwu, likely eager to address the immediate concerns after their eventful conversation, responded affirmatively. As Sol Mai drew closer to Choi Siwu, she offered him reassurance, assuring him that he wouldn't be held responsible or penalized for being late. However, Choi Siwu worried more about the broken veranda. Choi Siwu was worried that he was going to be gone for a month, and he knows that if his mom sees the broken veranda, she will worry. Sol Mai and Choi Siwu, in the midst of their conversation and preparations, were taken by surprise when a sudden voice intervened. The sudden appearance of Grandpa Mangti brought a sense of relief and clarity to the situation. He informed Sol Mai and Choi Siwu that they would be back up and running tomorrow, with plans to fix the veranda. His presence and the assurance of impending repairs likely eased their concerns about the state of their surroundings. Grandpa Mang Ti's request for Sol Mai to return to the Yakai realm while he spoke with Choi Siwu introduced a sense of privacy and intimacy to their exchange. Sol Mai's protective instinct for Choi Siwu was evident, as she expressed her concern that Grandpa Mang Ti might penalize him. She defended Choi Siwu, asserting that he hadn't done anything wrong. In response, Grandpa Mang Ti reassured Sol Mai that he was already aware of the situation, suggesting an understanding of Choi Siwu's actions or circumstances. Sol Mai and Choi Siwu found themselves in a state of confusion when Grandpa Mang Ti insisted that Sol Mai didn't need to be present for their conversation, and that he needed to talk to Choi Siwu alone. This request left them both puzzled, as they wondered why Grandpa Mang Ti seemed to perceive the presence of a third individual when there were only two of them. Grandpa Mang Ti's revelation that there was another person out there for them to greet introduced an element of surprise and anticipation. Choi Siwu's reaction was one of astonishment and surprise as he laid eyes on Siolhua. Her sudden appearance likely caught him off guard. As Siolhua wandered through the room, her observations about the human living space hinted at a sense of curiosity and wonder. She commented that, despite being a bit cramped, it had a unique taste or charm to it. Choi Siwu's confusion and curiosity about Siolhua's presence in the human world led him to inquire if she had also received a ticket to venture out for a while, similar to his own experience. Siolwa's revelation shed light on the circumstances of her arrival in the human world. She explained to Choi Siwu that she hadn't intentionally sought to come here. Rather, she had been unexpectedly dragged into this realm. Grandpa Mang Ti's suggestion to first discuss the events of the night indicated a sense of urgency and importance attached to the recent occurrences. His desire to share the details of what had transpired likely held crucial information that would help Siolwa, Choi Siwu, and himself make sense of their current situation. Grandpa Mang Ti's account of the night's events painted a chilling picture. He explained that after sunset, a staggering 50 monsters had emerged in Seoul Siacho Gu district, all under the control of an unknown entity. These creatures had launched coordinated attacks on humans in the streets, plunging the area into chaos and danger. As Grandpa Mang Ti continued his account, Choi Siwu listened attentively to the details of the investigation. Grandpa Mang Ti noted that the monsters' methods were crude and lacked any attempt to cover up their actions. This led him to assume that the attacks were a deliberate ploy to draw out Sol Mai and target Choi Siwu. Sol Mai's surprise and her interpretation of Grandpa Mang Ti's words hinted at a deeper layer of complexity within the situation. She seemed to suspect that the monster's actions may not have been solely for their original purpose, and that there might be hidden motives or intricacies at play. Sial was attentive listening, and her subtle expression of concern demonstrated her understanding of the gravity of the situation. Grandpa Mang Ti's serious emphasis on the matter underscored the gravity of the situation. He revealed that a staggering number of humans, at least 200 had gone missing from Seoul and the entire metropolitan area. Choi Siwu and Sialhua were both taken aback by Grandpa Mang Ti's revelation. When he mentioned that the figure of 200 missing individuals was based solely on reports from the human police department, and that the actual number of people who had disappeared was likely closer to 500. Sol Mai's shock was palpable as she contemplated the situation. She speculated that at least five people must be working together in an organized fashion to orchestrate the events they were facing. Her analysis suggested that by making a concerted effort and narrowing down the dragon's line of suspects, they could potentially catch those responsible. Grandpa Mang Ti's response indicated that if the culprits behind the disappearances were Korean yakai, it would be relatively easier to apprehend them with some exceptions related to specific locations or events he had encountered that night. He revealed that a large yakai from regions beyond the Korean peninsula had crossed over and were involved in the disappearances. They had resorted to hunting humans on the peninsula, where they were harder to track. 
This added a new dimension to the threat they faced, as these outsiders operated in unfamiliar territory, making them more challenging to apprehend. Xiao was shock and terror were palpable upon hearing Grandpa Mang Ti's warning. He conveyed that if they didn't hunt down and track these dangerous yakai, they would continue to hunt humans unabated until the festival, which was six months away. In response to the dire situation and the urgent need to address the threat posed by the dangerous yakai, Grandpa Mang Ti made an unexpected offer. He suggested that they undertake the qualifying exam, which was originally scheduled for a month later. Choi Siwu and Xialhua were both taken aback by Grandpa Mang Ti's unexpected request. The proposition to undertake the qualifying exam sooner than originally planned likely caught them by surprise, given the urgency of the situation and the gravity of the task at hand. The altered nature of the qualifying exam, which would involve finding and eliminating the yakai who had invaded the Korean peninsula as soon as possible, added a sense of urgency and responsibility to the task at hand. If Choi Siwu and Xialhua chose to accept this challenge, they would be embarking on a mission of great significance to safeguard both the human and yakai realms. As the bright sun rose on that morning, a refreshing breeze swept through the air, carrying with it the promise of a new day. The gentle caress of the wind and the warm embrace of sunlight painted a picture of tranquility and renewal. As Yushin walked through the morning light on his way to school, it was evident that he had experienced a restless night. His weary eyes bore the marks of sleeplessness, and his thoughts seemed consumed by the events that had transpired between him and Choi Siwu. The dark circles under Yushin's eyes were a clear testament to the toll that overthinking and worry had taken on him. His concern for Choi Siwu's well-being, especially if Choi Siwu couldn't return to the human world, weighed heavily on his mind. As he continued his morning walk to school, Yushin contemplated the need to take proactive measures. The sudden appearance of Choi Siwu in front of Yushin was a surprising and unexpected turn of events. Yushin had been deep in thought about their situation and the responsibility he felt, so seeing Choi Siwu standing before him was a startling revelation. Yushin's surprise and disbelief were evident as he stood there, gazing at his friend who was right in front of him and engaging in conversation. The shock of seeing Choi Siwu after their recent encounter weighed heavily on him, leaving him momentarily speechless and overwhelmed by the unexpected turn of events. Choi Siwu's desire to have a conversation with Yushin prompted them to head to a nearby cafe. The prospect of this discussion added an air of seriousness and anticipation to their meeting as they sought a private and comfortable space to address the important matters that lay ahead. Yushin's surprised reaction to Choi Siwu's words created quite a commotion in the quiet cafe. The sudden outburst of noise drew the attention of both customers and staff, who couldn't help but turn their heads toward the source of the disturbance. Concerned looks were exchanged among the patrons as they wondered what might have transpired to elicit such a reaction. Choi Siwu, feeling embarrassed by Yushin's loud reaction, leaned in and asked him to lower his volume, emphasizing that speaking loudly in a public place was considered a nuisance. Recognizing the disruption they had caused, Choi Siwu promptly apologized to the people inside the cafe, acknowledging their responsibility for the commotion. Choi Siwu shared his perspective with Yushin explaining that staying in the human world to complete the task would have its advantages. This choice would keep him in the human world, which meant he wouldn't have to cause worry for Yushin and his mom by being absent or risking dangerous situations in the Yakai realm. Yushin's disbelief was palpable as he responded to Choi Siwu's statement. He asked his friend if he had ever considered the specific class or type of monster he belonged to. This question hinted at the unique and potentially perilous nature of Choi Siwu's identity suggesting that there might be factors beyond their control that would influence his role and responsibilities in the Yakai realm. Choi Siwu took a sip of his beverage and was genuinely surprised by the unique name that Yushin had shared regarding the class of monster he belonged to. Yushin's revelation that Choi Siwu belonged to the Shin Ryan Kai Gosu class of monster added a layer of complexity to their conversation. Choi Siwu's curiosity was piqued by the unique name of Yushin's monster class, which had sent chills down his spine. In response, Yushin clarified that the name wasn't just a single word. Rather, it consisted of five separate words, each symbolizing a different aspect of a monster's status. Yushin continued to explain the intricacies of the monster class system, starting with the lowest tier, Su. He elaborated that the term Su was derived from the Hanya character for beast, and its meaning was closely aligned with that interpretation. He went on to share that the majority of monsters fell into this particular class, indicating its prevalence within the Yakai realm. Yushin further explained that while beasts could be dangerous, they were considered relatively lower-tier beings. Their abilities and power levels were similar to those of wild animals, and their influence within the Yakai realm was more limited compared to higher-ranking classes. Despite their potential for danger, they were seen as somewhat simplistic in their motivations and capabilities. 
Yuxin continued to elaborate on the characteristics of wild beasts within the Yakai realm. He explained that these creatures primarily relied on their physical attributes, such as their weapons and sheer numbers, as their main sources of power. This reliance on brute force meant that even normal humans, who hadn't acquired magic or special abilities like Choi Siwu, could potentially stand a chance against them. However, despite this possibility, normal humans still harbored a sense of wariness and fear toward wild beasts due to their unpredictability and the potential danger they posed. Yushin's explanation continued as he emphasized that it was the classes above wild beasts where the power and capabilities of yakai reached a level that made them impervious to attacks from normal humans. As one ascended the hierarchy, the gap in strength and abilities widened, making it increasingly difficult for humans to confront them directly. Yushin delved deeper into the yakai hierarchy by introducing the concept of Go. He described Go as monsters with physical strength equivalent to that of 100 humans. This level of power meant that even if 100 people were to attack them simultaneously, the Go's sheer physical prowess alone would render such attempts futile. To emphasize the point, Yushin explained that even if a group of 1,000 people were to charge at a Go, it would still be a hopeless endeavor, as their combined might would be insufficient to overcome the formidable strength and abilities of this particular class of Yakai. Shoi Siwu's curiosity led him to inquire about the higher classes within the Yakai hierarchy. He sought to understand the extent of power and influence wielded by the top three classes, considering that he and Yushin had been discussing the lower tiers, such as Su and Go. Yushin shared valuable insights about the top three classes within the Yakai hierarchy. He explained that the highest classes were known as Calamity. When Choi Siwu inquired about the extent of their power, Yushin couldn't provide a definitive answer as he hadn't personally experienced it. However, Yushin did convey the immense risk associated with Kai-class monsters, emphasizing that their danger level was approximately 10 times greater than that of Go-class Yakai. As Yushin and Choi Siwu delved deeper into their discussion about the various classes of monsters, the students from nearby schools passed by them, their voices and footsteps blending with the ambient sounds of the bustling street. Despite the presence of the passing students, the two friends continued their conversation, engrossed in the fascinating and complex world of Yakai hierarchy. Yushin, glancing out at the world beyond, shared a piece of advice with Choi Siwu. He suggested that Choi Siwu shouldn't be overly concerned about encountering Shin and Ryan class monsters. Yushin explained that such powerful beings typically didn't bother with criminal activities or breaking the law, implying that they operated on a different level of existence and influence. Choi Siwu expressed his surprise at Yushin's advice, which essentially urged him not to get involved in the upcoming hunt, referred to as the festival scheduled to take place in six months. Yushin emphasized that Choi Siwu should refrain from meddling in this event, and he assured him that he could reach out to him for help or seek refuge at his house if needed. Yushin's response reflected a sense of preparedness and determination. He acknowledged the possibility of monsters from outside Korea having invaded and emphasized the need for them to be ready to confront such threats, whether in their homeland or against shamans like himself. Choi Siwu, still curious about the snake monster they had encountered earlier, asked Yushin for his assessment of its class within the Yakai hierarchy. Yushin shared his assessment of the snake monster's class within the Yakai hierarchy. He explained that the monster class, which controlled the snake's corpse, could be considered a mid-tier Go class, indicating its significant strength and abilities. What made it particularly intriguing was that Yushin had sensed twice the energy emanating from the creature compared to what would be expected from a typical Go. Yushin's explanation shed further light on the encounter with the snake monster. He revealed that he had sensed a powerful energy when the snake monster used another controlled monster as bait to draw their attention. Yushin recalled a past moment when Choi Siwu had been vulnerable to the snake monster's influence. He expressed his belief that had he not misread the situation, Choi Siwu might have come perilously close to being consumed by the monster. Yushin pointed out that, in terms of their current status within the Yakai hierarchy, Choi Siwu was below the snake monster. He explained that Choi Siwu fell into the middle of the lower tier of Go class Yakai. This revelation left Choi Siwu feeling perplexed, as it indicated a difference in power and status that he had not fully comprehended. Yushin, with a tone of stern concern, proceeded to scold Choi Siwu. He emphasized the importance of not meddling in situations beyond his capability and urged him to maintain an objective perspective about his position within the Yakai hierarchy. As Choi Siwu attempted to respond to Yushin's scolding, Yushin urged him to speak louder. This request likely arose from the ambient noise and commotion in the cafe, ensuring that their conversation could be heard clearly despite the bustling surrounding. Choi Siwu countered Yushin's concerns by expressing his belief that he could defeat the snake monster if they were to confront it. 
His confident and determined demeanor surprised Yushin, who noticed the positive aura radiating from his friend. Choi Siwoo's determination shone brightly as he asserted that things had changed, and he was confident that he could defeat the snake monster even without Yushin's assistance. This unwavering resolve marked a significant shift in his mindset, reflecting his evolving understanding of his own abilities and the challenges that lay ahead in the Yakai realm. While listening to Choi Siwoo's determined words, Yushin couldn't help but ponder in his mind that Choi Siwoo's way of thinking was completely unconventional or even flawed. Choi Siwoo's newfound confidence and assertiveness might have appeared risky or overconfident to Yushin, leading him to question his friend's perspective on their situation. Yushin's sudden decision to stand up prompted alarm from Choi Siwoo, who inquired if Yushin was preparing to leave for school. The abrupt change in Yushin's demeanor and actions seemed to catch Choi Siwoo off guard, leading to this moment of uncertainty and curiosity about Yushin's intentions. Yushin clarified that he wasn't planning to go to school but rather had a different purpose in mind. He expressed his intention to help Choi Siwoo get completely get it together to think deeply about the Yakai responsibilities and requested that Choi Siwoo follow him. Yushin and Choi Siwoo arrived at the Olympic Gymnastics Arena, a sports facility that had been constructed in 1986. The gymnastics arena had originally been built to host the 1988 Seoul Olympics, but had since been repurposed into a large-scale concert hall known as the KSPO Dome. This transformation from a sports venue to a concert hall highlighted the adaptability of such spaces and their importance in hosting various events over time. Choi Siwoo was clearly impressed and amazed by the facility, especially since he had no prior knowledge of its existence in the basement. The fact that the public was unaware of this alternative use for the facility added an element of secrecy and intrigue to their visit, emphasizing the hidden nature of their activities within the human realm. The Olympic Gymnastic Arena had a dual purpose as a special underground zone and a public benefit center. This multifaceted use highlighted its significance within the human realm, serving various functions to support the activity and needs of what they call the shamans. According to Yushin, the facility doesn't belong to their family, rather, it was established by the government. This implies that the government has played a significant role in the creation and ownership of the facility, emphasizing its public or official nature rather than being privately owned or operated by Yushin's family. When Choi Siwoo inquired whether the government is aware of the festival, Yushin responded by shedding light on a historical perspective. Yushin explained that throughout ancient history, ruling powers have consistently maintained a close association with influential shamans. It's plausible that strong shamans might have played a pivotal role in shaping the early concept of a state. In the distant past, the ability to combat supernatural or monstrous forces could have been perceived as the most potent form of power. Shamans, possessing unique spiritual ability, might have been the natural leaders and protectors of their communities. Yushin provided some historical context by mentioning that for the past 666 years, dating back to the early days of the Joseon dynasty, there hasn't been a significant threat from monsters. This period of relative peace and stability has allowed for the establishment of the Constellation Hall, an institution dedicated to training powerful shamans. Importantly, Yushin emphasized that it's his family's responsibility that has carried on this tradition of duty, highlighting their commitment to maintaining the lineage of strong shamans and ensuring the safety of their community from supernatural threats. As Yushin engaged in conversation with Choi Siwoo, he casually removed his school uniform coat. Continuing their conversation, Yushin leaned in and confided in Siwoo that the information they were discussing is a closely guarded secret, known only to those at the highest levels of authority. However, he expressed his concern that even among this select group, it doesn't appear that they are treating the situation with the seriousness it deserves. As Yushin shared this critical information, Choi Siwoo stood guard, his posture and demeanor reflecting his readiness and determination. Yushin's invitation for Siwoo to come at him with all his strength implied a need for trust and collaboration between them. Yushin rolled up his sleeves, a symbolic gesture signifying his readiness for a serious test of strength and skill. He made it clear to Choi Siwoo that there were no time constraints or rules in this challenge. Yushin's message was clear, that if Choi Siwoo could overpower him using any means at his disposal, Yushin would place his trust in Choi Siwoo's ability and not interfere with Choi Siwoo's actions regarding other monsters. Choi Siwoo, inquisitive and prepared, sought clarification from Yushin regarding the choice of weaponry for their impending challenge. He specifically inquired whether Yushin would opt for a sword or a dagger-like weapon, drawing from their previous encounter when Yushin had used such a weapon. Yushin's response carried a sense of significance. He conveyed to Choi Siwoo that he wouldn't be wielding any weapon for their upcoming confrontation. By relying solely on their physical and perhaps supernatural ability, 
they would engage in a fair and unadulterated fight, highlighting the true essence of their test of strength and skill. Yushin proceeded to provide some valuable insight, explaining that strong shamans often possess a significantly reduced set of skills when they are without their weapon, typically less than half of their full capability. This limitation underscores the importance of staying closely connected to their chosen weapon, almost as if it's an extension of themselves. The implication here is that the weapon enhances their ability and serves as a vital tool in their work. Yushin's advice emphasized the necessity of maintaining a strong bond between a shaman and their weapon, regardless of the circumstances, suggesting that it's an integral part of their identity and power. Yushin's unique prowess set him apart from the norm. He confidently stated that he could confront a Go-class monster without any difficulty, relying solely on his physical abilities and supernatural powers, and without the need for a weapon. As Yushin's aura began to surge and envelop him, it was a breathtaking and awe-inspiring sight. He made a bold declaration to Choi Siwoo, stating that if Siwoo could defeat him in their upcoming challenge, it would signify that Siwoo belonged to a class of power beyond what Yushin himself could overcome. Choi Siwoo's hesitation was palpable despite Yushin's explicit invitation to charge at him. Siwu's hesitation could also indicate a moment of self-reflection and internal preparation as he weighed the risks and potential outcomes of their confrontation. The trembling of Choi Siwu's hand was a physical manifestation of his inner turmoil and apprehension. It underscored the intensity of the moment and the immense pressure he felt. Choi Siwu's deliberate and deep breathing indicated his efforts to regain composure and control over his emotions. The trembling body symbolized the mix of fear, anticipation, and adrenaline coursing through Siwu's veins as he contemplated the challenge before him. Yushin's surprise was evident as Choi Siwu took him off guard by charging at him with remarkable speed. This unexpected burst of agility and determination from Siwu likely caught Yushin off balance, showcasing Siwu's commitment to the challenge. Choi Siwu's lightning-fast movement and the electric waves coursing through his body painted a vivid picture of his extraordinary agility and energy. His approach toward Yushin resembled a thunderbolt, crackling with intensity and determination. This action added a dynamic and electrifying element to the scene, underscoring Siwu's commitment and power as he closed the gap between himself and Yushin. Yushin's keen perception allowed him to discern Choi Siwu's imminent move as Siwu's hands poised to grasp him. This moment of heightened awareness showcased Yushin's formidable instincts and readiness to respond to Siwu's rapid and determined approach. Yushin's swift reaction was impressive. He deftly tapped Choi Siwu's hands, deflecting Siwu's attempt to grab him, and immediately shifted into a defensive posture, poised for a counterattack. Yushin unleashed a rapid and forceful series of punches, targeting Choi Siwu's body with precision and power. Each strike was executed with lightning speed, emphasizing Yushin's exceptional combat skills and strength. The flurry of punches created a visceral and intense moment in their confrontation, where Yushin's offensive onslaught tested Siwu's resilience and ability to withstand the assault. Choi Siwu's face being punched added a visceral and impactful dimension to the confrontation. It highlighted the intensity of Yushin's attack and the physical toll it was taking on Siwu. Yushin's decision to step back and prepare for another attack was a strategic move, demonstrating his tactical judgment in battle. With a burst of great force and power, Yushin launched an aggressive kick at Choi Siwu. This kick carried the weight of Yushin's strength and determination, making it a formidable attack. Choi Siwu being thrown over and unable to defend against Yushin's powerful kick painted a vivid picture of the force and impact of the attack. Siwu's helplessness in the face of Yushin's onslaught underscored the formidable nature of Yushin's combat abilities. Yushin's serious expression spoke volumes about the gravity of the situation. Despite their friendship, he had not hesitated to unleash a powerful and devastating attack on Choi Siwu. This intense gaze conveyed the weight of their confrontation and Yushin's unwavering commitment to the challenge they had undertaken. The presence of blood added a stark and dramatic element to the scene, underscoring the intensity and brutality of their fight. Choi Siwu's injury painted a vivid and visceral picture of the aftermath of Yushin's powerful attack. Despite the injuries he had sustained, Choi Siwu's praise for Yushin showcased his admiration and respect for his friend's incredible ability. Choi Siwu's swift recovery and his continuation of praise for Yushin demonstrated his resilience and graciousness in the face of adversity. As he stood up and wiped the blood from his nose, Siwu's actions portrayed him as someone who could quickly regain composure and maintain a positive spirit even after a challenging battle. Yushin's moment of contemplation, as he gazed at Choi Siwu, suggested that he was considering the possibility that he might be on the losing end of their confrontation. Yushin's firm grip on his fist and his reflection on the intensity of his attack revealed the immense power he had unleashed during their battle. 
He contemplated that if he had held back even slightly, the force of his blows could have resulted in shattered bones. The description of his fist feeling like it struck a brick wall emphasized the physical toll of their confrontation and the resilience of Choi Siwu. Choi Siwu's decision to pose for another attack despite his realization that Yushin might not be hurt even if he doesn't control his strength demonstrated his unwavering determination and commitment to the challenge. Yushin's realization that Choi Siwa was a more formidable opponent than he initially anticipated added an intriguing twist to their battle. It suggested that Yushin had underestimated Siwu's strength and resilience. Choi Siwa wasted no time and charged forward with determination toward Yushin. This bold move marked a continuation of their intense battle, as Siwu sought to press his advantage and test Yushin's defenses. Choi Siwu's bold and direct approach, closing in on Yushin and almost grabbing him, indicated his unwavering determination and speed. Yushin's observation of Choi Siwu's increased speed without a change in his attack manner was a perceptive insight. It indicated that Siwu had honed his physical abilities and agility, enhancing his overall combat effectiveness. However, the consistency in Siwu's attack style might have also offered Yushin an opportunity to anticipate and counter his moves. Yushin's swift action in grabbing Choi Siwu's hands demonstrated his sharp reflexes and keen awareness in the midst of their intense battle. Yushin's lightning-quick counterattack aimed at Siwu highlighted the fast-paced and intense nature of their battle. His rapid response indicated his determination to seize the advantage and keep Siwu on the defensive. Yushin's swift and forceful move to knee Choi Siwu in the face was a powerful and impactful attack. This action underscored the intensity of their confrontation and Yushin's determination to gain the upper hand. Yushin's surprise at Choi Siwu grabbing his hand added a twist to their battle. Choi Siwu's impressive feat of strength, lifting Yushin into the air while holding his hands, added a dramatic and awe-inspiring dimension to their confrontation. Choi Siwu's surprise and uncertainty regarding Yushin's next move added an element of suspense and tension to their battle. The unexpected turn of events had momentarily shifted the balance of power. Yushin's preparation to strike with his fist while having the advantage of being on top of Choi Siwu indicated his determination to press his advantage and potentially secure a decisive moment in their battle. Choi Siwu's unexpected decision to release Yushin's hands introduced a surprising twist to their confrontation. This sudden change in his approach left Yushin momentarily off balance and uncertain about Siwu's intentions. Choi Siwu's release of Yushin's hand, followed by a powerful and ground-shattering attack, showcased a sudden surge of energy and determination. This dramatic burst of power underscored Siwu's resolve to turn the tide of their battle and assert his strength. Yushin's quick movement to his feet after the intense confrontation was a display of his agility and adaptability in the midst of their battle. It showcased his ability to maintain his balance and composure even after a powerful and ground-shattering attack. Yushin's observation of what Choi Siwu was holding, coupled with his suspicion about its identity, added an intriguing layer of mystery to their confrontation. It hinted that Siwu might be in possession of something significant or unusual, which could potentially have a significant impact on the outcome of their battle. Choi Siwu's surprise and wonder at holding the goblin's club in his hands for the first time, drawn out by his own will, added a profound and mystical dimension to their confrontation. In the arena, there was a noticeable shift in the atmosphere as Choi Siwu made a dramatic move during the ongoing fight. As Siwu held the formidable goblin's club in hand, its presence exuding power and menace, the intensity of the battle escalated to a whole new level. As Choi Siwu tightly grasped the goblin's club in the arena, it became evident that his physical condition had deteriorated significantly. The strenuous battle had taken a toll on him, pushing him to the brink of exhaustion. His once vigorous movements had slowed, and his posture showed signs of fatigue. Indeed, when evaluating Choi Siwu's current condition, his physical stamina may still appear relatively good, considering the grueling nature of the ongoing battle. His body, though fatigued, manages to hold its own. However, the critical issue lies in his diminishing spiritual energy, which is causing growing concern. During his battle last night with Goyu, Choi Siwu found himself in a situation where he had to tap deep into his reserves of spiritual energy to confront the formidable opponent. In the heat of the intense combat, Siwu expended a staggering amount, depleting approximately 93% of his total spiritual energy capacity. Certainly, in the mortal realm and within the sparse environment, the process of recovering one's spiritual energy becomes an even more protracted and demanding ordeal. Under ordinary circumstances, after expending such a substantial portion of his spiritual energy, as Siwu did during his confrontation with Goyu, it would necessitate not just a mere day but a prolonged period of rest, possibly spanning more than a day, to completely replenish his depleted reserves. 
Ironically, the current state of near exhaustion of Choi Siwu's spiritual energy has unexpectedly proven to be advantageous, particularly in its ability to replicate the moment when Siwu initially drew upon the power of the Goblin's Club. This curious turn of events highlights the intricate interplay between his dwindling spiritual reserves and the manifestation of this potent weapon. It appears that as Siwu's spiritual energy nears depletion, a unique synergy occurs between his inner essence and the Goblin's Club. Choi Siwu's current predicament is one of remarkable contrast. While he finds himself struggling to maintain control over the physical aspects of his body, his consciousness and senses remain remarkably sharp and attuned to the unfolding events. In this precarious situation, it's as if his mind is a beacon of clarity amidst the chaos of his physical limitations. In the midst of the intense clash in the sparse mortal realm, this recollection acts as a beacon of inspiration and strength. The memory of the Yakai realm serves as a wellspring of determination, reminding Siwu of the trials he has overcome and the lessons he has learned. It fuels his resolve to prevail in the present, drawing from the wisdom and experiences of his past. As Yushin observed Choi Siwu summoning the formidable Goblin's Club, he couldn't help but express his feelings about the weapon. With a thoughtful look in his eyes, he turned to Siwu and remarked that he had come across references to this unique weapon in old, ancient documents. Yushin, in a tone tinged with curiosity, pondered aloud whether these historical accounts had exaggerated the club's power or if there was an issue on his own end, for he couldn't seem to find the weapon as impressive as the legends suggested. In response to Yushin's doubts about the Goblin's Club's impressive reputation, Choi Siwu calmly and confidently defended the weapon's legendary status. With a composed demeanor, he expressed his belief that the information Yushin had read in those ancient documents was, in fact, accurate. Yushin couldn't help but be taken aback by how swiftly Choi Siwu managed to shift his mood in response to their conversation. Siwu's ability to transition from the intensity of battle to a more composed and conversational demeanor surprised Yushin, revealing the depth of Siwu's emotional control and adaptability. With lightning speed and determination, Choi Siwu made his decisive move, swiftly closing the gap between him and Yushin. In a daring maneuver, Siwu found himself on top of Yushin positioning himself for the first strike with the formidable Goblin's Club firmly in his grasp. The Goblin's Club, now poised for action, crackled with the potential for devastating force, creating an electrifying atmosphere in the sparse mortal realm. With unwavering focus and determination, Choi Siwu, perched atop Yushin, readied himself to launch a potent attack. As he raised the Goblin's Club high, poised to strike, he couldn't help but remark that Yushin didn't appear any more remarkable than their previous encounter. With a powerful and fluid motion, Choi Siwu hurled the goblin's club toward Yushin. As it sailed through the air, a surge of energy emanated from the weapon, manifesting as a swirling vortex of vivid red and dark black hues. This formidable force, expansive and swirling with intensity, gave the impression of an impending violent impact. As Yushin defended against Choi Siwu's formidable attack, using his arms as a shield, it became evident that his once strong limbs bore the scars and injuries of previous battles. While Yushin valiantly defended against Choi Siwu's relentless assault with the Goblin's Club, a realization began to dawn upon him. He couldn't help but feel that the Goblin Club was something he could potentially defend against if he were in an enhanced state, a state that transcended his current capabilities. Just as Yushin was contemplating a defensive strategy, convinced that maintaining distance and waiting for Choi Siwu's exhaustion might be his best course of action, he was caught completely off guard by an unexpected move from Choi Siwu. This sudden maneuver grabbed his attention and shattered his momentary complacency. The weapon, seemingly an extension of Choi Siwu himself, struck with a force that resonated through the arena, leaving a powerful imprint on the unfolding battle. With the Goblin Club extended and firmly placed on the arena's roof, Choi Siwu took a moment to contemplate the audacious move he had just executed. As he surveyed the situation, a sense of cautious optimism washed over him. He couldn't help but entertain the possibility that what he had done might just work. Yushin, taken completely by surprise by Choi Siwu's unexpected action of extending the Goblin Club and placing it on the roof, couldn't contain his astonishment. He turned to Choi Siwu, his voice tinged with a mix of curiosity and bewilderment, and asked what he was doing. With a confident smile on his face, Choi Siwu responded to Yushin's question, explaining his rationale for the unconventional move. He conveyed that it seems like it would be difficult to win up close because he has a feeling that he can't keep blocking Yushin's giant fist-like attacks indefinitely. Choi Siwu's words revealed a keen awareness of the limitations of close combat in this particular battle. As Choi Siwu tightly gripped the goblin's club, a somber realization settled upon him. He knew, with a sense of certainty, that he couldn't replicate the same astonishing level of power and impact as he had during his previous encounter. 
With this awareness, Choi Siwoo faced the battle with a sense of humility, acknowledging that while he couldn't replicate the past, he would need to rely on his adaptability, creativity, and resourcefulness to navigate the ever-shifting dynamics of the ongoing confrontation. As Choi Siwoo wielded the Goblin Club in the sparse mortal realm, a poignant realization struck him like a thunderbolt. The once mighty weapon, whose sheer size and strength had left an indelible mark during its first, unconscious summoning in the Yakai realm, had now dwindled to a mere shadow of its former self. As it turns out, Siwu possesses the remarkable ability to freely change the weapon's form, allowing him to manipulate it to some extent, even if its size and strength have diminished in the mortal realm. Choi Siwu's control over the Goblin Club's form opens up a realm of possibility, where he can adapt the weapon to suit the specific needs and challenges of each moment in combat. Choi Siwu's cunning and strategic judgment shone through as he made resourceful use of the Goblin Club. His ability to adapt to the evolving circumstances of the battle, coupled with his mastery over the weapon's changing form, demonstrated a keen understanding of combat dynamic. As Choi Siwu launched a fierce attack, wielding the versatile Goblin Club with cunning and precision, Yushin's eyes widened with a mixture of awareness and terror. In that pivotal moment, he fully grasped the gravity of the situation and the imminent danger that Siwu's assault posed. As Choi Siwu hurled the Goblin Club, its form transformed into a formidable, rapidly charging sphere, hurtling with incredible speed toward Yushin. The sight of this menacing projectile, resembling a raging ball of energy, sent shivers down the spine of Yushin. In a daring display of courage and determination, Yushin attempted to stop the Goblin Club, now transformed into a formidable ball of energy, with his bare hands. The arena fell into a hushed awe as Yushin's hands made contact with the surging energy ball. With a determined grimace, Yushin gritted his teeth as he strained to stop the relentless force of the Goblin Club's energy ball. He blazed with fierce resolve as he braced himself against the onslaught, refusing to yield to the surging power that threatened to overwhelm him. Despite Yushin's valiant effort and unwavering determination, the overwhelming force of the Goblin Club proved to be too much to withstand. With an explosive burst of energy, Yushin was pushed backward and thrown off his feet, unable to hold his ground against the relentless power of the transformed weapon. Seizing the advantage as Yushin was still in the process of recovering from the devastating impact of the Goblin Club's attack, Choi Siwu moved with remarkable speed and precision. He closed the distance between them, wasting no time in capitalizing on the temporary vulnerability of his opponent. The arena crackled with tension as Siwu's agile and calculated maneuvers put him in a prime position to press his advantage. Yushin's eyes widened with a mixture of surprise and determination as he observed Choi Siwu charging toward him with remarkable speed. In that split second, the intensity of their confrontation reached a fever pitch as both of them locked onto each other with unwavering focus. In a rapid and agile response to Choi Siwu's charging attack, Yushin swiftly moved his feet, attempting to evade the impending strike. His quick footwork demonstrated his agility and the depth of his combat instincts as he sought to sidestep the oncoming assault. As Yushin successfully evaded Choi Siwu's charging attack, a massive explosion of vibrant red energy erupted in the arena. The sheer force of the impact created shockwaves that reverberated through the sparse mortal realm, shaking the very foundation of the battle arena. Amidst the chaos of the explosion and the ongoing battle, Yushin's mind raced with a perceptive thought. He couldn't help but reflect that, while there may not have been a noticeable difference in the aura surrounding Choi Siwu compared to earlier, it was the subtle change in the Goblin Club's form and Siwu's technique in wielding it that seemed to multiply its power almost exponentially. With a mixture of frustration and determination, Yushin looked up at Choi Siwu and shouted, accusing him of playing dirty. His voice carried a tone of discontent, as he questioned Siwu's tactics in the midst of their fierce battle. With the Goblin Club firmly gripped and its form connected to the arena's roof, Choi Siwu cast his gaze downward, locking eyes with Yushin. The intensity of their shared moment hung in the air, a silent exchange of determination, rivalry, and unspoken challenges. From his vantage point above, Siwu observed Yushin with unwavering focus, his eyes betraying a sense of purpose and resolve. Choi Siwu's confident smile remained unwavering as he responded to Yushin's accusation. He admitted that he's not exactly squeaky clean, but it was him, Yushin, who suggested that they fight first to see if he can handle battling against Yakai or not. Yushin, his earlier accusation silenced by the truth in Choi Siwu's words, stood there with a mixture of fear and realization. He couldn't find the words to counter Siwu's argument because, in fact, he was the one who had suggested the fight to test their capabilities against the Yakai. As he listened to Siwu's explanation that being more cunning was essential in a life-or-death battle, Yushin's fear began to give way to a begrudging acknowledgement. With a knowing smile, Choi Siwu looked at Yushin, recognizing the mix of fear, realization, 
and acknowledgement in his eyes. Amidst the intensity of their battle and the unusual circumstances of their confrontation in the sparse mortal realm, Choi Siwu couldn't help but reflect on the deeper connection that bound them together. Despite the fierce rivalry and the trials they faced, Siwu recognized that at their core, they were just two teenagers who shared a close friendship. With the Goblin Club in hand, Siwu's tone took on a more conciliatory note as he addressed Yusha. He suggested that admitting one's mistakes could be a way to move forward, a gesture of reconciliation and understanding. Yushin's silence hung in the air like a heavy shroud, as he took a moment to contemplate Choi Siwu's words and the implications they held. He reflected on Siwu's suggestion to admit his mistake, his thoughts swirled with conflicting emotions and considerations. As Yushin's body trembled with a potent mix of anger and frustration, he spoke to Choi Siwu with a tone of intensity. He questioned whether this was the path Siwu intended to continue on, clearly conflicted and deeply affected by their ongoing confrontation. Yushin's frustration reached its boiling point as he told Choi Siwu that he had reached his limit with what he perceived as nonsense. His voice held an undercurrent of exasperation, and he seemed resolute in his stance. In response, Choi Siwu acknowledged Yushin's words with a wry smile and remarked that he found Yushin's determination and resolve to be truly terrifying. With tensions running high and their emotions laid bare, Choi Siwu wasted no time and initiated the next attack, swinging the goblin club with force and determination. However, Yushin, driven by his resolve and honed instincts, managed to evade the incoming strike with swift agility. The arena crackled with energy as Yushin's evasion marked a renewed determination to defend his principles and stand his ground. With a surge of incredible speed and intensity, Choi Siwu moved, controlling the goblin club with fierce determination. His eyes blazed with a fiery resolve, fixated on his target with unwavering focus. As Siwu manipulated the Goblin Club with unparalleled precision, the arena became a blur of motion, and the energy crackled with electrifying tension. Choi Siwu, determined to gain the upper hand in their relentless battle, employed a barrage of attacks coming at Yushin from various angles and with astonishing speed. Each strike was executed with precision and purpose, showcasing his exceptional skill and agility. Yushin, acutely aware of the need to match Choi Siwu's increasing speed, found himself in a challenging predicament. Despite his best efforts to evade Choi Siwu's relentless attacks, it was becoming increasingly difficult for him to keep up with the blistering pace of their confrontation. Amidst the chaos of Choi Siwu's relentless attacks, Yushin found a glimmer of hope and resilience within himself. With each evasive maneuver and defense against Siwu's blinding speed, he realized that he was rapidly adapting to the martial arts and the increased pace of the battle. This realization fueled Yushin's determination and served as a beacon of progress in the midst of adversity. In a surprising twist, Choi Siwu wielded the Goblin Club in a completely new direction, catching Yushin off guard. The sudden change in the club's trajectory and Choi Siwu's unexpected maneuver left Yushin momentarily surprised and disoriented. As Choi Siwu executed his unexpected maneuver with the Goblin Club, Yushin's instincts kicked in and he couldn't help but suspect that it might be a misdirection. This puzzling turn of events left Yushin grappling with uncertainty as he tried to decipher Choi Siwu's true intention. The arena was filled with tension as Yushin's mind raced to anticipate Siwu's next move while remaining vigilant against potential feints and tricks. As Yushin struggled to defend against Choi Siwu's relentless assault with the Goblin Club, he found himself with limited options. With only one arm and shoulder providing cover, the strain on his defenses became increasingly evident. The sheer force and precision of Choi Siwu's strikes left Yushin with little room for respite. As Yushin was pushed back by the relentless force of the Goblin Club's strikes, the culmination of their battle reached a dramatic point. The Goblin Club crackled with a potent red and black aura, and with one final clash, it created a massive explosion that shook the arena to its core. In the midst of the explosion, Choi Siwu's concern for Yushin was palpable. Despite his tactical adjustments to minimize Yushin's power, and despite both of them likely being weaker than before, Choi Siwu couldn't help but notice that he still emitted a remarkably strong attack. The outcome of their extraordinary confrontation hung in the balance, waiting to be decided in the next pivotal moment. Surprisingly, as the dust settled and the aftermath of their explosive clash became clear, the Goblin Club exhibited an unusual behavior. It appeared as though the club was being pulled and stretched, its form morphing in a manner that defied conventional expectations. Choi Siwu's sharp eyes didn't miss the unusual behavior of the Goblin Club. As he observed the club being pulled and stretched in a way that defied explanation, he couldn't help but be on high alert. With a tight grip on the transformed Goblin Club, Yushin's face lit up with a determined grin directed towards Choi Siwu. This unexpected change in the club's form seemed to have emboldened him, sparking a glint of confidence in his eyes. 
With the transformed goblin club in hand and a determined glint in his eye, Yushin prepared to launch a unique attack. He assumed a poised stance, ready to unleash the power of the Leaf Era, a projectile reminiscent of the willow leaves used during the Joseon dynasty. This arrow, with its thorn-like piercing capability, was a symbol of precision and deadly accuracy. With the goblin club in one hand and the leaf arrow attack poised and ready, Yushin burst forward with a mighty surge of power. His attack generated a ferocious wind force that rippled through the arena, creating an intense vortex of energy. The sparse mortal realm's arena seemed to tremble under the weight of this incredible display of strength and skill. The sudden and powerful move by Yushin left Choi Siwu momentarily stunned and uncertain. He found himself caught off guard by the unexpected ferocity of Yushin's attack, unsure of how to react in the face of such overwhelming force. Choi Siwu's surprise deepened as he realized that Yushin was specifically targeting the Goblin Club, which remained firmly connected to the arena's roof. This tactical move by Yushin showed not only his keen awareness of the situation, but also his determination to neutralize Siwu's most potent weapon. In a stunning turn of events, Yushin's attack found its mark, slicing through the Goblin Club and severing it from its connection to the arena's roof. Choi Siwu's expression reflected his astonishment at the unexpected turn of events. With the Goblin Club severed and Choi Siwu momentarily stunned, Yushin wasted no time. He surged forward with remarkable speed, closing the distance between them in the blink of an eye. His agility and determination were on full display as he aimed to press his advantage and capitalize on the pivotal moment when he had disarmed Siwu. As Yushin closed in with remarkable speed, Choi Siwu's instincts kicked into overdrive. He hurriedly moved to wield the severed goblin club once more, a sense of urgency and determination driving his every motion. With a swift and determined motion, Choi Siwu hurled the goblin club, now transformed into a compact, ball-like shape. The club shot through the air with formidable speed, creating a powerful force that hurtled towards its target. Yushin's surprise quickly turned into alertness as he realized the gravity of Choi Siwu's attack. He swiftly shifted his gaze to the oncoming projectile, now a compact and formidable ball-like form, charging towards him with incredible speed. The arena crackled with tension as Yushin's instincts kicked into high gear. With lightning-fast reflexes, Yushin executed a swift evasion, narrowly avoiding the large ball-like form of the goblin club as it hurtled past him. His agility and quick thinking allowed him to dodge the powerful projectile, narrowly escaping what could have been a devastating impact. In the heat of their intense battle in the sparse mortal realm, Yushin found himself without a ritual implement that would aid the specific martial art he was employing. This absence highlighted the sheer reliance on his skill, adaptability, and raw physical ability to navigate the challenges presented by Choi Siwu and his formidable goblin club. The absence of a ritual implement tailored to a specific martial art came with its set of disadvantages. One of the most significant drawbacks was Yushin's limited ability to utilize the majority of the techniques he had acquired over time. Martial arts often rely on the synergistic relationship between the practitioner and their ritual implement, which enhances the effectiveness of various techniques. With a resolute grip, Choi Siwu clutched the goblin club tightly in his hands, ready to counter Yushin's next move. The arena crackled with tension as Siwu prepared to meet the oncoming assault with unwavering determination. As Yushin drew closer to Choi Siwu, he faced the challenge of wielding techniques that, while usable, were difficult to control in terms of their power. This added an element of unpredictability to his impending attack, as he grappled with the delicate balance between delivering a formidable strike and maintaining precision. In a breathtaking display of skill and power, Yushin harnessed his own energy to create weapons infused with divine power. Drawing from the depths of his martial prowess, he chose to employ one of the 18 of 24 martial arts forms, a type of swordsmanship performed with a katana, known as Heavenly Sword. As Yushin readied himself to unleash the power of the Heavenly Sword with his divine weapon, Choi Siwu, ever the formidable strategist, prepared for an equally potent counterattack. In a spectacular collision of powers, the energy unleashed by Choi Siwu and Yushin merged into a dazzling display of blue and red lightning-like force. The arena crackled with electricity, as these opposing energies clashed with incredible intensity. The intertwined forces of blue and red illuminated the sparse mortal realm's arena, casting a surreal, and dramatic light on their extraordinary confrontation. Choi Siwu's surprise deepened as he witnessed the unthinkable that his formidable goblin club, which had been his most reliable weapon throughout the battle, was cut. The sparse mortal realm's arena crackled with tension as the once mighty goblin club lay severed and powerless. Yushin looked determined, but he hesitated for a moment. He paused because the person in front of him, his friend Choi Siwu, made him think twice about fighting. Yushin's face showed determination, but he had a moment of hesitation. 
He paused because he realized that the person he was fighting against was his friend, Choi Siwu. This made the decision to continue the battle even harder for him. With a determined look on his face, Choi Siwu readied himself for an attack from a distance. He was prepared to throw a punch at Yushin, who remained in his sights, despite the inner conflict caused by their friendship. As Choi Siwu and Yushin drew closer to each other, the tension in the arena mounted. Siwu's clenched fist was now dangerously close to Yushin, poised for a punch. Yushin's eyes widened in surprise as Choi Siwu made a sudden and unexpected move. The abrupt action by Choi Siwu added a layer of complexity to their ongoing confrontation, keeping Yushin on his toes and challenging his ability to react swiftly and effectively. Yushin found himself in a moment of uncertainty, unsure of how to react to Choi Siwu's unexpected move. His body hesitated, caught off guard by the sudden change in their battle dynamics. With an aggressive burst of energy, Choi Siwu swiftly delivered a powerful punch to Yushin's face. The force behind the punch was palpable, and it landed with a resounding impact. The powerful punch from Choi Siwu sent Yushin reeling backward with tremendous force. The impact of the blow was undeniable, and it pushed Yushin several steps back in the arena. The aggression displayed by Siwu had momentarily shifted the balance of power in their ongoing battle. Choi Siwu, amidst the confusion and intensity of their battle, found himself surprised by Yushin's decision to spare him in the end. He couldn't quite fathom why Yushin had chosen not to finish him off when he had the opportunity. With a hint of frustration in his voice, Siwu remarked that even if Yushin had delivered the final blow, he believed he could have recovered quickly. As he lay on the arena floor, Yushin responded to Choi Siwu's confusion and explained that the reason he had spared him wasn't due to Siwu's potential recovery but rather because he had exhausted the full extent of his exorcism arts in that final decisive attack. Yushin further explained that the reason he had used the full power of his exorcism arts against Choi Siwu was because, in a battle against a yakai, even those at the Kai grade wouldn't have held up, no matter how strong they were. This was illustrated by what had happened to Choi Siwu's goblin club, which had been shattered in their intense clash. Choi Siwu's surprise grew as he processed Yushin's explanation. Yushin revealed that it wasn't merely the power of his exorcism arts, but the very nature of the technique itself that recognized beings other than him as not yakai. While lying on the arena floor, Yushin, surprisingly, found himself in tears as he called out to Choi Siwu. The sparse mortal realms arena was filled with a poignant silence as Yushin's tears and heartfelt call resonated with the complex emotions that had been at play between them. The sun is shining in a quiet city after Choi Siwu and Yushin sorted out their friendship. A look of sadness and silence envelops Yushin as they walk side by side after resolving their argument about whether Choi Siwu is prepared to confront the monsters. While they stroll together, Yushin urges Choi Siwu to say or do something, feeling uneasy about Choi Siwu's visible anxiety beside him. Choi Siwu spoke to him, saying that he had been silent because he was thinking about Yushin's nose, wondering if it hurt a great deal and feeling concerned that the injury might leave a lasting scar. Yushin reassured Choi Siwu by touching his nose and explaining that injuries like fractured bones and skin would heal quickly as he dedicated himself to physical training and hard work. He also acknowledged that he was aware Choi Siwu had reduced his force after hitting him. Yushin recalled the past and realized that the moment Choi Siwu understood that Yushin's attack had failed, he would probably have tried to unleash as much power as possible. Yushin responded to Choi Siwu, saying that if he wanted to go around fighting and capturing monsters, he could do so as he pleased. Yushin explained to Choi Siwu that even though Choi Siwu thanked him for understanding, he still didn't fully comprehend the situation and was only acting this way because of a promise he had made. Choi Siwu's curiosity grew as he noticed the thing that Yushin was recommending he should take. Yushin gave a special charm to Choi Siwu, and he told them to think of it like a gourd, just as if it were gourds. Yushin, with a thoughtful expression on his face, encouraged him to visualize the thing as if it were similar to a bomb-like gourd that can only be used once. Yushin explained to Choi Siwu how to utilize the gourd, instructing him that if he ever needed to use it urgently, he could simply smash it against the ground, as even a small amount of force could break it and activate the magic contained within. Yushin advised Choi Siwu to use the gourd in times of danger, but Choi Siwu wore a sad and concerned expression as he expressed gratitude, yet hesitated, unsure if it was truly okay to use it. Yushin was greatly surprised and taken aback when Choi Siwu not only realized that the gourd contained Yushin's stored energy, but also expressed concern that Yushin had put a lot of effort into creating it. Yushin asked Choi Siwu how he had come to know that the gourd held his stored energy. 
In response, Choi Siwoo told him that it wasn't quite what Yushin might be thinking. Choi Siwoo explained that as he held the gourd in his hands, he could feel Yushin's energy, which was why he had realized that it contained Yushin's energy. Choi Siwoo recalled the sensation of Yushin's energy during their previous fight and experienced that same energy as he held the gourd in his hands. The three-colored stream that Yushin had given him was an accumulation-type dharma tool primarily used by Yushin's family. Inside the gourd, which had been treated with a special glaze, Yushin's energy was poured in and stored whenever they found the time to do so. The gourd, being specially made, allowed one to use magic in any situation, making it possible to utilize spells that might have been challenging otherwise. Furthermore, even if it were someone else, anyone possessing the gourd could consume the Dharma tools within to access and use magic. Yushin, surprised by Choi Siwoo's knowledge of the energy inside the gourd, asked Choi Siwoo to show him his hands for a moment. Choi Siwoo extended his hand, feeling curious about Yushin's request and wondering if there was something wrong with his hands. Yushin examined Choi Siwoo's hand, as it was believed that one's fate could be discerned by simply looking at the length of their palm and its placement. Yushin was taken aback as he examined Choi Siwoo's hands and noticed that his palm resembled those of masters or gurus similar to shamans. He realized that it was simply a natural talent that Choi Siwoo possessed. Yushin gazed at Choi Siwoo with surprise, contemplating how, even if he wasn't entirely certain about the palm reading, Choi Siwoo's ability to sense the energy of the three-colored stream and the way he appeared during their battles were remarkable in their own right. Choi Siwoo cast a curious and concerned glance at Yushin, who appeared lost in thought and contemplation. Yushin's expression shifted to a more serious and contemplative one as he pondered whether it might not be too late for his clan and the shamans to accept Choi Siwoo. Yushin considered the members of their association and realized that they might not approve of Choi Siwoo. He feared that if he failed to obtain permission, there was a high likelihood that they might perceive it in a negative aspect. Yushin reflected on Choi Siwoo's unique identity as a goblin with shaman talents and admitted to himself that if it weren't for Choi Siwoo, he might not have regarded anyone else with such a favorable outlook. Yushin released Choi Siwoo's hand and confessed that he had been contemplating how his own life was also entangled and complex. While they continued their conversation, Choi Siwoo inquired if Yushin could genuinely tell someone's fate by examining their hands. In response, Yushin asked Choi Siwoo when he planned to return to school. Choi Siwoo explained that his initial concern was about his clothing, as he needed to acquire a new, properly fitting uniform since he basically didn't have anything besides his tracksuit. Choi Siwoo noticed that, after losing weight, even his feet had become slimmer, and he found it quite fascinating. Yushin smirked and remarked to Choi Siwoo that it would be worth witnessing everyone's reaction to his transformed appearance. Yushin added that not everyone would recognize him if he didn't mention that he was Choi Siwoo, given his significant change. Choi Siwoo felt rather irritated by the thought and believed that Yushin was enjoying this situation a bit too much. Yushin checked his phone and realized that it was already past lunchtime, which explained why he was feeling hungry. Choi Siwoo smiled and mentioned that Yushin's request to eat at their house might be a bit challenging to fulfill. Choi Siwoo explained to Yushin that going to Yushin's house for a meal wasn't feasible since they were guests staying there, and it was highly probable that everyone was in a deep sleep at that time. Yushin's reaction shifted, realizing that Choi Siwoo was making excuses, likely because he was currently with monsters and couldn't easily go home. Yushin informed Choi Siwoo that he understood the situation up to that point. Yushin reassured Choi Siwoo that there was no need to push himself to explain something difficult and that he was perfectly fine with whatever circumstances Choi Siwoo was dealing with involving the monsters. Choi Siwoo was likely surprised by Yushin's acceptance of the situation. He left and walked ahead, mentioning to Choi Siwoo that he seemed to have something to attend to and suggesting that Choi Siwoo treat him next time. Yushin turned to look at Choi Siwoo and added that he should be confident wherever he goes, advising him not to appear as if he had committed a crime or anything of the sort. As they parted ways, Choi Siwoo set out on his own to search for something, his journey taking him on a solo adventure. Choi Siwoo looked around and found the neighborhood quite strange, noticing that all the homes appeared to be empty. He began to wonder if he had truly arrived at the right place. Choi Siwoo eventually found what he had been searching for and saw that it was named the Rising Dark Moon Quarters. 
Choi Siwu gazed at the peculiar name, finding it quite strange, and couldn't help but be curious about its meaning and significance. As Choi Siwu examined the door, it suddenly swung open, revealing a man with an intimidating and frightening expression in his eyes, which took him by surprise. Choi Siwu's eyes widened in realization that the man before him was a monster, and he could feel the unexpected strength emanating from the creature. Choi Siwu observed the man curiously as he passed by, his curiosity piqued by the encounter. Choi Siwu turned his head as another person appeared and explained that he was a guest they had never met before, introducing himself to Choi Siwu. The woman introduced herself as Hong Ryan, the head of the Rising Dark Moon Quarters. Choi Siwu explained that he had come here based on the introduction he received from the cleanup post yesterday and suggested that he had been instructed to visit here first. The woman gestured for Choi Siwu to enter, mentioning that she had already heard about him from Elder Yumeng. Choi Siwu couldn't help but feel a sense of strangeness as he entered the place, noticing that the inside wasn't just dark, but seemed to be enveloped in a black fog, giving it an eerie atmosphere. As Choi Siwu continued to walk, a faint light gradually began to appear with each step he took. Choi Siwu was taken by surprise as the place appeared to be quite different from what he had initially expected. To his amazement, the place suddenly became brightly illuminated, and the overall atmosphere seemed to undergo a significant transformation as he gazed around, making his surroundings appear entirely different. The woman poured Choi Siwu a cup of tea, signifying the beginning of their conversation. The woman advised Choi Siwu to enjoy his tea and make himself comfortable. Gratefully, Choi Siwu thanked her for her hospitality. Choi Siwu mentioned to the woman that he had realized this place wasn't Seoul, judging by its appearance and characteristics. The woman confirmed Choi Siwu's observation, explaining that the quarters were indeed a space separate from the human world. She further elaborated that because it had been isolated from civilization for a hundred years, it retained the fresh air and energy of that bygone era. The woman clarified that the purpose of the headquarters was to provide various resources and opportunities for monsters to adapt to the human world. Choi Siwu recalled the advice of the old man who had suggested visiting the headquarters during daylight, realizing that it was now making more sense in this mysterious place. Suddenly, the woman produced a scroll, catching Choi Siwu's attention with this unexpected item. Choi Siwu showed the woman what he had received, and she explained that it was the currency used by monsters. She smiled warmly and informed him that they could assist with everything related to purchases and exchanges using this currency. The woman further clarified that monster coins could be utilized for purchases within the monster community, but some monsters also exchanged their monster currency for human money for various purposes. The woman added an interesting piece of information, mentioning that in terms of the current exchange rate in the nation, one yang of monster coins was approximately equivalent to about 3 million won. Choi Siwu was left speechless, surprised by the fact that the exchange rate for monster coins was exceptionally high. Choi Siwu was surprised and couldn't help but calculate in his mind the significant value that 40 monster coins would represent when converted into human currency. The woman smiled and inquired whether Choi Siwu would like to see what he could purchase with the monster coins. The woman instructed her servant to display the demon spirit pill to Choi Siwu. Inside the case, the demon spirit pill had a variety of colors, presenting a visually striking and intriguing sight. Choi Siwu looked at the pill with curiosity, as the woman explained that the spirit pill was what their guests most frequently sought after. She described it as a pill that accelerated the recovery of one's monster force. The woman continued, emphasizing that monster force barely exists in the natural environment of the human world. She explained that even in a monster world, the process of recovering monster force was a time-consuming endeavor. The woman elaborated, explaining that a single pill was composed of various medicinal ingredients from the monster world. These pills were crafted using a secret technique passed down within their rising dark moon quarters. Choi Siwu promptly expressed his desire to purchase the demon spirit pill and inquired whether the different colors of the containers signified varying efficacies of the pill. The woman clarified that the color of the container indicated each class of the demon spirit pill. The silver demon spirit pill was priced at 10 nyang, the gold demon spirit pill at 3 nyang, and the black demon spirit pill at 1 nyang. Choi Siwu carefully contemplated his choice, taking into account the woman's recommendation of the black demon spirit pill if he wanted to fasten his recovery at that moment. 
The woman informed Choi Siwoo that he could consume the pill right away, and if it worked swiftly, he would be able to observe its effects immediately. The woman gazed at Choi Siwoo with an eerie expression, suggesting that regardless of the color he chose, the outcome might ultimately be the same. It was explained that the size of the Neaton, which represented the total quantity of monster force, grew as a monster consumed other monsters. They handed the black demon spirit pill to Choi Siwoo. The woman smiled in a peculiar manner as she handed the black demon spirit pill to Choi Siwoo. She explained that for a high-ranking class like the black pill, it typically took about three to four hours for a complete digestion. However, with just a half-monster body like Choi Siwoo's, not even half of it would be digested after a few days. Choi Siwoo held the pill in his hand, preparing himself to consume it. Finally, Choi Siwoo swallowed the black demon spirit pill. Upon swallowing the pill, a peculiar and intense light suddenly manifested. The explosion that resulted from Choi Siwoo swallowing the pill was large, spreading throughout the headquarters. The aftermath of the explosion left the place in disarray, with the tables and cups scattered in the place. The woman was in a state of shock, finding it difficult to believe the unexpected and powerful effects that the pill had on Choi Siwoo. A thick fog enveloped the room and Choi Siwoo, as the effects of the pill took hold rapidly, leaving everyone in the place astonished by the sudden dramatic transformation. Choi Siwoo let out a sigh as he felt the effects of the pill taking hold rapidly within his body, likely experiencing some significant changes or sensations. Choi Siwoo examined his own body, pondering whether he had indeed consumed something of great potency, considering that the pill he had taken was classified as a low-level one. For the first time in his life, Choi Siwu experienced a surge of power, reaching a level of monster force that surpassed 100%. A few minutes elapsed in the headquarters annex as the aftermath of Choi Siwu's pill consumption and the subsequent surge of power settled in. A man brought out a bottle of liquor, offering it to someone as a gesture of hospitality. Dong Wu, the headquarters leader, informed Master Yusium that he had specifically prepared a special liquor in anticipation of his arrival, indicating that it was intended as a gesture of respect and consideration for his visit. Master Yusium remarked that the liquor wasn't bad at all. However, he did express some concern about serving such a decent liquor to a relative newcomer, suggesting that it might not be entirely appropriate. Master Yusium mentioned that he hadn't seen Hong Ryan for some time, especially after she had previously mentioned that she would come to visit him. He pondered whether this absence indicated that she might not consider him as a guest anymore. Dong Wu reassured Master Yusium that it wasn't a matter of her not considering him as a guest anymore. Instead, he explained that she was running late because she had important business to attend to. Yusium's attention was piqued when he heard about someone that Grandpa Yumang had recommended as a guest, indicating that this was of particular interest to him. Yusium inquired about the identity of the guest recommended by Grandpa Yumang, but Dong Wu was unable to provide detailed information. He mentioned that the guest was only a half monster. Upon hearing that the guest was a half monster, Yusium was able to identify the guest. Dong Wu fell silent after Yuzium expressed negative sentiments about Choi Siwu and didn't even consider him a monster or a participant in the festival. Yuzium changed the topic and observed that Dong Wu had become quiet. He asked if Dong Wu was getting bored serving him liquor. Dong Wu remained silent and lowered his head as Yuzium questioned if he, too, was offended by what he had said, considering that Dong Wu was also a half monster. Yusium went on to share what he had heard from his sister, mentioning that the Rising Dark Moon headquarters was essentially a gathering of halflings who had no other place to go. Yusium mocked them further that kinds like Dongwu were ambiguous, unable to fully become either human or monster, and consequently struggled to find acceptance in either realm. Dongwu's irritation grew as he clenched his fist tightly, clearly upset by Yusium's mocking tone and comments about the halflings. Yuzium continued to wear a smirk as he mocked Dongwu, expressing his belief that the halflings would never be regarded as true monsters. Dongwu struggled to respond quickly as he was asked by Yuzium if he also shared the same belief about the halflings not being considered true monsters. Dongwu changed the topic abruptly, surprising Yuzium with the shift in conversation. While holding the liquor, Yuzium admitted that there was no fun in teasing Dongwu. Yuzium inquired about when he would be able to go out, and Dongwu informed him that all the preparations were ready and most likely be completed by the end of the day. 
In the Rising Dark Moon headquarters, they had successfully exchanged all the monster coins that Yuzium had provided, and all of the things he had requested were taken care of. Dongwu encouraged Yuzium, emphasizing that he must do his best, considering that Yuzium was someone who had risked his life for the sake of the human world. Yuzium appeared pleased by the compliment, but downplayed it, explaining that his actions were motivated by his own desires and a sense of hatred. Yuzium contemplated that by making significant contributions and enhancing his reputation, he might eventually gain his father's acknowledgement and approval to participate in the festival. He even considered that he might not be far behind his siblings in terms of achievements or recognition. Yuzium tapped the table and inquired about Hong Ryan. Dongwu offered to try and contact Hong Ryan, but Yuzium declined, stating that it was unnecessary, and he needed something to entrust to Dongwu instead. Yuzium expressed his desire for Hong Ryan to serve him while he resided in the human world. Dongwu expressed fear and informed Yuzium that they didn't engage in such practices. He created a scary aura, insisted that Dongwu should simply comply with his request, emphasizing that he was merely a merchant. Dongwu swallowed nervously and was left speechless in the face of Yuzium's intimidating stance. An explosion broke out as they were conversing. Both Dong Wu and Yuzium were taken by surprise when a sudden explosion occurred, creating a moment of shock and uncertainty in their surroundings. A moment of silence fell within the headquarters following the explosion, creating an eerie atmosphere. They both looked outside and wondered what is happening. Like water, Kai is something that flows through all of creation. It's a fundamental concept in various Asian cultures and martial arts, representing the vital energy or life force that exists within everything. For living beings, the flow of Kai or vital energy can be likened to a puddle that gathers for a while. The use of this vital energy, like the water in a puddle, varies for each living being. Even if you increase the size of your container, you cannot hold more water Kai or vital energy than the volume of the container allows. As Hong Ryan appeared quite surprised by the unexpected events, Choi Siwoo inquired if she was alright and expressed concern that he might have unintentionally caused the mishap with the explosion. Hong Ryan's shock and surprise were evident as she looked at Choi Siwoo, likely trying to process the unexpected turn of events. Choi Siwoo experienced a sensation of incredibly strong power surging through his body, giving him a feeling of invincibility and the belief that he could accomplish anything. Hong Ryan was left speechless by the sudden and immense surge of power that Choi Siwoo had experienced. Yuzium appeared and questioned Choi Siwu about the recklessness of his energy scattering so freely in such a place, implying that Choi Siwu's actions were bold and perhaps unexpected given the circumstances. Hong Ryan took responsibility for the situation, stating that it was due to her actions and not Choi Siwu's. Yuzium told Hong Ryan to shut up as she was explaining. Hong Ryan was taken aback and frightened by Yuzium's sudden change in attitude and his stern command for her to be quiet. Yuzium was angered by the release of a monster force throughout the headquarters, and he seemed to believe that Choi Siwu didn't fully grasp the seriousness of the situation. Despite Yuzium's words and frustration, Choi Siwu remained silent and didn't respond or engage in the conversation. While Hong Ryan knelt and attempted to apologize, Choi Siwu suddenly spoke up and apologized to Yuzium. Choi Siwu explained that he was not yet used at controlling his monster force. His inherent nature made him kind even among humans. Choi Siwu continued to apologize, expressing regret for any disturbance he had caused. Choi Siwu smirked and responded to Yuzium, suggesting that he found Yuzium's words a bit too harsh for someone they had just met, implying that felt Yuzium was rude. Yuzium became angry in response to Choi Siwu's comment. Choi Siwu sarcastically apologized and told Yuzium not to speak so rudely. In his offense and anger, Yuzium utilized his powers against Choi Siwu. Yuzium used his strong power to forcefully push Choi Siwu, causing him to fly outside. Both of them saw Choi Siwu crashing outside. Hong Ryan's emotions swirled into a mix of fear and astonishment as she witnessed the unexpected and forceful actions taken by Yuzium, causing her heart to race and her eyes to widen in shock. Yuzium told Choi Siwu that he could easily nail his head, but he chose not to as it was not a fight and just a discipline. Choi Siwu's aura took on an intensely menacing and intimidating quality as he stood up following the crash. Yuzium once again extended his fingers, harnessing his formidable powers with determination, poised to take action once more. 
Choi Siwoo found himself once more taken aback by the abrupt and powerful display of force from Yusium. Choi Siwoo felt the power again and made his body move with the attack forcefully. Hong Ryan raised his voice, admonishing Yusium and firmly stating that regardless of the circumstances, violence was strictly forbidden within the confines of the Rising Dark Moon headquarters. She continued to address Yusium, emphasizing the potential consequences of their actions. Hong Ryan pointed out that if the higher authorities or were to discover what had transpired, they would likely need to intervene. Hong Ryan was surprised and trembled as Yusium used his powers on her. Yusium's frustration seemed to intensify as he interpreted Hong Ryan's words as a lecture. Hong Ryan trembled and appeared to be injured, bleeding from Yusium's actions. Yusium's harsh words continued as he expressed his perspective on her, making it clear that he ultimately regarded her as a halfling. Hong Ryan was taken aback and shocked by the sudden pain she felt. She found it surprising that Yusium had attacked her without her sensing any monster force. Yusium, after the attack on Hong Ryan, issued a stern command, ordering her to kneel immediately in front of him. Choi Siwu, having recovered from the earlier shock, spoke up to Yusium with a determined tone. He expressed his intention to instill the manners that he believed Yusium should have learned from Grandpa Yuneng. Choi Siwu, clearly angered by the situation and Yusium's behavior, took a bold step. Choi Siwu took a combat stance, readying himself for a confrontation. He challenged Yusium to continue their fight. Yusium, seemingly unfazed by Choi Siwu's challenge, agreed to continue the confrontation. He warned Choi Siwu to prepare for the consequences. He was determined and prepared as readied himself to launch an attack against Yusium. Choi Siwu then punched through the air and aims at the direction of Yusium. Both Hong Ryan and Yusium were taken by surprise by Choi Siwu's sudden and decisive action. Choi Siwu, after taking action, confronted Yusium and asserted that he understood what Yusium had been attempting to do to him earlier. Choi Siwu revealed that he had been aware of Yusium's earlier attempt to harm him through the tea. He described the impact as feeling like he had been hit by a car. A mysterious water-like substance, about the size of a fingernail, suddenly materialized seemingly out of thin air, which is the thing that attacked Choi Siwu. Choi Siwu, making an observation, noted that it appeared Yusium had the ability to manipulate or use the moisture in the grass to his advantage. With a smirk, Choi Siwu revealed that he had encountered a similar situation with someone else in the past, which allowed him to recognize Yusium's abilities. Yusium's surprise was evident as Choi Siwu commented that compared to the formidable opponent he had faced the previous night, Yusium seemed like a relatively minor threat. Choi Siwu then smirked as he sarcastically apologized to him if he hurt his feelings. Choi Siwu made a lightning fast move, swiftly closing the distance between himself and Yusium. Choi Siwu closed in on Yusium, evidently preparing for close combat. A transformation occurred as Choi Siwu's eyes took on a different appearance, and he moved in a manner that resembled a true monster. Yusium, not to be outdone, prepared himself for a counterattack and assumed a defensive posture. He carefully assessed Choi Siwu's actions, attempting to anticipate and counter whatever move Choi Siwu might make. Yuzium launched a punch at Choi Siwu, but Choi Siwu managed to narrowly dodge the attack. Yuzium's eyes widened in surprise as he witnessed Choi Siwu's impressive dodge. As Choi Siwu dodged, he surprised Yuzium with a surprise attack and aimed to punch his stomach. Hong Ryan, who had been observing the confrontation between Choi Siwu and Yuzium, was evidently taken aback by the unexpected turn of events unfolding in front of her. Choi Siwu, sensing Yusium's vulnerability, continued to taunt and mock him as he trembled on the ground. When Choi Siwu bravely confronted the mysterious Yakai, Hong Ryon found herself utterly astonished and struggling to come to terms with what she was witnessing. During Choi Siwu's initial encounter with magic and his very first confrontation with supernatural forces, he displayed an almost casual and remarkable ability to perceive and counteract these mystical elements as if he was dealing with everyday occurrences. As he sprinted toward his enemy, he prepared himself by bracing his body and channeled an immense power into his clenched fist. As he ran toward the person he was fighting, he realized something important. He figured out that the energy he gave off could be seen by his opponent, so he decided to make his energy stronger like a secret power hidden inside him. This made it hard for his enemy to guess where he'd attack. Because of this clever move, he managed to dodge the attack that was coming at him. At the same time, his opponent was left in a state of complete surprise. 
Just as the opponent anticipated Siwu's attack in one direction, Siwu ingeniously shifted the flow of his energy, and with remarkable precision, he seized the opportunity created by his opponent's confusion. Siwu struck with great accuracy, landing a hit in the opening that had unexpectedly emerged. Choi Siwu stood tall in front of his now kneeling opponent, who was writhing in pain on the floor. To this formidable yakai, who belonged to the category of the strong and mighty, what Siwu had just done seemed like a fundamental skill. Hong Ryon gazed in amazement at Choi Siwu. Just three days ago, descendants of goblins had made their first appearance, and until that moment, she had believed he was just an everyday, ordinary human. Choi Siwu now appeared nearly indistinguishable from a full-fledged yakai, a transformation that left Hong Ryon both intrigued and puzzled. She couldn't help but wonder how, in the mere span of three days since the descendants of goblins had emerged, Siwu had acquired such an impressive level of skill and mastery. As Choi Siwu looked down at his defeated opponent on the floor, he couldn't help but acknowledge that this was the concluding moment of their battle. However, what lay ahead didn't seem to matter much to him. Observing his trembling enemy on the ground, Siwu decided to take a moment to address the situation. He told the defeated yakai that if this was to be the end of their conflict, the least the yakai could do was offer an apology and move forward. Siwu pointed towards Hong Ryon, indicating that he was referring to her. He questioned what she had done to deserve any harm in her attempt to intervene and prevent the fight. The man, racked with pain and clenching his teeth, could do nothing but tremble as Siwu persistently urged him to kneel down and sincerely apologize. While Choi Siwu was in the midst of speaking, he sensed an unusual presence approaching him, which immediately captured his attention. Suddenly, a crystalline, water-like object struck him in the arms, creating a forceful impact that caused him injury. In the next moment, the yokai swiftly began to charge at Siwu. However, Choi Siwu had a keen awareness of the yakai's movements and saw the attack coming, allowing him to skillfully evade the oncoming assault. Siwu harnessed his inner strength, channeling it into a powerful kick aimed at the yakai. Choi Siwu's kick was so incredibly powerful that it sent the yakai flying with great force, propelling him through the air. The impact of Siwu's kick was so intense that it caused a significant disturbance, resulting in a crash and the sudden emergence of a thick cloud of smoke in the area. To his astonishment, Siwu suddenly began to bleed, a sight that caught him off guard. The yakai belonged to the he -Ti clan, which possessed the unique magic of controlling and manipulating the surrounding water, particularly the clear autumn water. A sly smile formed on the yakai's face as he observed that the attacks he had initiated earlier were beginning to take effect, capitalizing on his clan's distinctive water-based powers. Choi Siwu's distress became even more apparent as he began bleeding from his eyes. The yakai's special ability to amplify water pressure to an extreme degree was taking a heavy toll on Siwu, causing him significant harm. In a previous encounter, the yakai had utilized water as a weapon, transforming it into razor-sharp crystals. These crystals had a remarkable ability to infiltrate even the smallest traces of water on Choi Siwu's body, turning the very element that sustains life into a potentially lethal weapon against him. Furthermore, the water manipulated by the yakai possessed a sinister quality. It could be weaponized as a living venom. This venom had the frightening capability to disrupt internal organs, including blood vessels and nerves, and it was already present within Choi Siwu's body, posing a grave threat to his well-being. With the venom already coursing through his body, Choi Siwu experienced a disconcerting sensation, and he was soon overwhelmed, causing him to fall to the ground. The Yakai, looming over the fallen Siwu, decided to communicate a grim message. He explained that, for a yakai, losing an arm or a leg was a relatively minor concern as long as there was an ample reserve of yakai energy. However, when it came to dealing with poisons or infections, recovery took significantly more time than Siwu might have initially imagined. As Choi Siwu remained on his knees, his condition deteriorating with each passing moment, the yakai leaned in and remarked that he probably didn't fully comprehend or had never personally endured such a fate as a human. The yokai went on to admit that Siwu had proven to be quite a formidable opponent, especially considering the fact that Siwu was only half yokai. The yokai then speculated that Siwu's remarkable strength might be attributed to the exceptional lineage he had inherited, suggesting that even as a half-blood, Siwu possessed extraordinary potential. Hong Ryon, who had been a witness to the unfolding events, was left utterly stunned by the sudden turn of circumstances. 
The yokai, bracing himself, prepared to unleash a devastating blow, aiming to make it abundantly clear that Choi Siwu was no match for a genuine, full-fledged yokai. To the yokai's astonishment, Choi Siwu managed to move and even speak despite his dire condition. Despite his injuries, Choi Siwu's anger flared, and he made it clear to the yokai that there was one thing he was absolutely certain of that the yokai was truly getting on his nerves. Astonishingly, Siwu exhibited a rapid healing ability, much to the yokai's surprise. The yokai couldn't hide his astonishment. Even as he had wreaked havoc on Choi Siwu's veins and organs, it seemed that Siwu had managed to heal himself in a remarkably short span of time. Frustration and anger welled up within the yokai as he grappled with the fact that Choi Siwu could recover so swiftly, defying the expectations of their battle. In a fit of rage and determination, the yokai channeled all his might and unleashed a formidable surge of power, directing it fiercely toward Choi Siwu. The yokai employed a technique known as reservoir, which allowed him to extract vast torrents of water from various sources, such as rivers, lakes, seas, or underground aquifers. This technique enabled him to wield tremendous aquatic power. Choi Siwu, resolute and undeterred, tightly gripped a piece of cloth, preparing himself to mount a counterattack. This remarkable ability had the capability to compress to such an extent that it defied the laws of physics. The actual weight of the compressed object was several hundred times more than it appeared to be, making it an incredibly potent and deceptive weapon. Choi Siwu positioned himself for a defensive stance, gripping the goblin's club firmly in preparation for what lay ahead. With focused intent, Siwu began to infuse energy into his hands, shaping it into the form of the goblin's club. In addition to shaping the goblin's club with energy, Choi Siwu underwent a transformation himself, adapting to the impending showdown. In the moment, a memory flashed through Siwu's mind, reminding him of a crucial lesson he had learned. He realized that simply by assuming the right form that suited the situation, the power of the goblin's club could be significantly enhanced. With a newfound determination, Siwu was confident that he could replicate the success he had experienced before, drawing strength from his past encounters and experiences. With the goblin club firmly in his grasp, Siwu braced himself, preparing to strike with the full force of his determined attack. As the impending clash with the yokai's powerful attack drew near, the atmosphere grew increasingly intense, and the tension in the situation reached its peak. Siwu steeled himself, ready to counter the approaching attack with every ounce of force and determination he could muster. In the midst of this intense moment, a memory flooded back into Siwu's thoughts a recollection of the time he had met Yushin. The memory deepened as Siwu recalled not just the meeting with Yushin, but also a significant moment when Yushin had engaged in a fierce battle against a yokai. With unwavering determination, Choi Siwu channeled every ounce of his strength into an attack characterized by sheer sharpness. He harnessed the entirety of his power, focusing it on this counterattack with a fierce resolve. Furthermore, infused with an excess of energy, Siwu's inner elixir surged and unleashed a formidable output of power, intensifying his counterattack. The yokai's attack was significantly diminished as it met the sheer power of Choi Siwu's goblin club, the impact of which greatly reduced the force of the yokai's strike. Upon seeing his attack thwarted, the yokai swiftly attempted to conjure a protective barrier made of water to shield himself from any potential retaliation. Curious and cautious, the yokai briefly parted his protective water barrier to assess the current situation and determine if any opportunities or threats had arisen. To his astonishment, the yokai discovered that Choi Siwu had vanished, leaving behind an empty space where he once stood. Baffled by Siwu's sudden disappearance, the yokai began to contemplate where Choi Siwu might have gone, puzzled by the unexpected turn of events. To the yokai's great surprise, Choi Siwu swiftly maneuvered behind him, catching him off guard with his agile and strategic movement. As soon as he sensed Choi Siwu's presence landing behind him, the yokai swiftly turned around. Choi Siwu then recited the very quote the yokai had spoken earlier, repeating his own words to emphasize the irony and importance of the situation. To the yokai's absolute astonishment, his arms were abruptly severed, leaving him in a moment of shock and disbelief as Siwu's counterattack had taken a devastating toll. Choi Siwu, brandishing the goblin club, pointed it toward the injured yokai and calmly informed him that he could easily dispel his severed arms without any hesitation. Overwhelmed by fear and in excruciating pain, the yokai trembled as he gazed upon his severed arms lying on the ground. 
He collapsed to his knees, unleashing a pained scream that echoed through the moment. Choi Siwu cast an unrelenting and merciless gaze upon the yakai, showing no hint of compassion in this intense confrontation. Choi Siwu, his tone unwavering, inquired if having his arm severed was truly unbearable as he had never experienced such a thing. As the yakai said that if he were a genuine yakai, he should be accustomed to pain as a part of their existence. Trembling with fear, the yokai gazed up at Choi Siwu, who loomed over him with an unwavering presence. With a surge of aggression, Choi Siwu delivered a powerful kick to the yakai, further establishing his dominance in this confrontation. Yusomi, the yakai, was trembling not solely due to the excruciating pain of losing both arms, but also because of the overwhelming fear and the intense pressure of the situation. It became unmistakably clear that their clan held a position of utmost significance, ranking among the divine beasts and exercising authority over numerous other yakai. Among the members of their clan, Yusomi, the youngest, had been a treasured and nurtured figure, receiving special attention and care. Choi Siwu continued to tower over Yusomi, firmly asserting that he should have already offered an apology at this point. Just as Choi Siwu appeared to be on the verge of taking further action, Yusomi, driven by fear and the anticipation of more pain, began to apologize, hoping to avoid another blow. Choi Siwu acknowledged that Yusomi had wronged him as well and expressed his belief that the situation had now reached a point where they had settled their debt to each other. Choi Siwu then directed his attention toward Hong Ryon, who stood nearby, and indicated to Yusomi that there was someone else present whom he should offer a sincere apology to. Even as Choi Siwu continued to urge him to apologize, Yu Somi remained hesitant. Choi Siwu, growing impatient, questioned whether Yu Somi intended to continue hesitating and making excuses as he had done before. Yu Somi trembled with the knowledge that Choi Siwu was prepared to take further action if he didn't offer a sincere apology soon. The fear of the consequences weighed heavily on him. He then hurried to walk towards Hong Ryon. Hong Ryon looks at him while he knelt down. Finally, he knelt down and apologized to her as well. Meanwhile, in the apartment of Choi Siwu, Siolhua just woke up from his sleep and were calling for Siwu. She told Siwu to get her a cup of water and ask if he can't hear her. Siolhua came out on the room yawning and noticed that Choi Siwu was not at home. Siolhua pondered where Siwu might be wandering, leaving her behind. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment for the next part. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss a new video. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.